Hey guys, before you start watching, I want to share something with you. If I don't upload the next part of any story, it doesn't mean I'm not interested or not listening to you. It simply means there aren't enough chapters available for me to continue. So please be patient. I'm currently working on the next part of Azura Dragon, which will be coming tomorrow. Until then, enjoy this. It was much later when Belorkin opened his eyes again. His body was heavy. His condition was a mess. His ribs ached as if they were piercing his lungs, and his body temperature felt low enough to snuff out his consciousness. Moreover, his clothes, soaked with swamp water, felt as heavy as lead. The thick clothing he'd worn against the cold now seemed to be his undoing. I'm alive, then. He must have barely moved in time, narrowly avoiding the thousand-faced demon's attack. Of course, he hadn't completely escaped and had lost consciousness after being caught in the wave caused by the demon's blow. After some time, he realized someone had slung his arm over their shoulder and was making their way through the swamp. Barely lifting his heavy eyelids, he noticed the person's shoulder was very small. Almost childlike. Not long thereafter, he recognized who the owner of that shoulder was. K.R., Crouch? At the mention of the name, the boy's head turned his way. There was Crouch. Looking relieved with his hair soaking wet in the pouring rain, matching Belorkin's disheveled state. With thoughts of the thousand-faced demon and Charlotte crowding his mind, Belorkin belatedly realized that Crouch had accompanied him. Brother, have you awakened? How are you, no, how are you still alive? Yes, I was always watching from a distance because it was dangerous. Had that been the case? It seemed that unlike the knights, he had not been exposed to the curse, thanks to being away from the fray. But somewhere inside, Belorkin felt dissatisfied with the situation. The fact Crouch was supporting him and walking was gnawing at him internally. Belorkin's self-esteem had already been crushed during his earlier flight. Now, the thought of receiving help from Crouch, who he had always considered beneath him, seemed to trample on the last shred of his pride. That's enough. I will walk on my own. Peeling his arm from Crouch's shoulder, Belorkin struggled to catch his breath. His breathing was unsteady, possibly having been injured internally during the impact, and his aura wasn't responding appropriately either. However, he wasn't so incapacitated that he couldn't walk at all. Even if he had been, he had no intention of depending on Crouch for help. Brother, you are not in normal condition. Please do not do this. I said, enough. Belorkin snapped, shouting back at Crouch, who moved to support him again. Lashing out in anger, asserting that even someone like Crouch had no right to assist him, he pushed the boy away. Crouch, appearing resigned, withdrew his hand. Belorkin watched him and panted to regain his breath. Yes, that is just your place. In this situation, there was nothing you could do, so just feel your powerlessness. Belorkin thought as much as he attempted to move forward again. Thump! A sound reverberated through the entire swamp. Upon hearing the noise, Belorkin instinctively hunched over. Because the owner of that sound was none other than the thousand-faced demon. K.R., Crouch, how far have we made it out from there? Belorkin asked, attempting to understand their current situation. But Crouch, with a serious expression, surveyed the surroundings and responded. I'm not sure. We've walked quite a bit, but since the outside isn't visible yet, maybe the world erosion is enclosed. Belorkin's face turned pale upon hearing Crouch's words. If that was true, then they couldn't leave until the thousand-faced demon was killed. Thump! Once more, the sound of the thousand-faced demon's step echoed from afar. Damn, damn. Brother. It was then Crouch called out to the panicking Belorkin. I have one idea. An idea? Belorkin's head lifted at the notion that someone like Crouch could have a plan. He didn't like the idea, but suppressed his disapproval for the sake of survival. Yes, I suppose you've heard about my fight with Annex. Of course, he remembered. Belorkin was still skeptical, but the rumor that Crouch had fought Annex to a draw certainly existed. The reason I could do it was that I learned a secret technique from my sister. Belorkin's body jolted at that revelation. He immediately realized sister referred to Charlotte. From Charlotte? 
Crosh nodded once again. Was Charlotte someone who would teach another? That thought crossed his mind, but Charlotte and Crouch were siblings of the same blood. Perhaps unbeknownst to him, she had held Crouch in special regard. And if his draw with Annex was due to Charlotte's secret technique, it began to make sense. Bellarkin had experienced Charlotte's genius far too well. So, you're saying with this secret technique, we can defeat that thing? I can't be certain, but it's worth trying compared to dying here from exhaustion. Bellarkin bit his lip momentarily. Whatever the technique, Crouch had seen the thousand-faced demon firsthand. Yet he dared suggest it was worth trying, which must mean it was a technique of significant potency. You're telling me this because you need something from me, right? Brother Zygna's skill can ignite flames out of anything, can it not? Yes, but what about it? I would like you to ignite my aura with those flames. Belorkin belatedly realized what Crouch had in mind. He intended to combine his skill of flames with the secret technique to attempt defeating the thousand-faced demon. I know you don't trust me. Seeing Belorkin hesitate, Crouch spoke once more. But brother, you do trust our sister's abilities, don't you? And the words that followed were enough to put an end to Belorkin's hesitation. If it was Charlotte's secret technique, maybe a thought that kept surfacing. However, something gnawed at him from deep within his heart. Thump! Another sound of the thousand-faced demon's footsteps didn't give him any more time to ponder. If we fail, it's the end for both of us. Yes, that's why I need you to attract its attention until I'm ready. Damn it! In the end, Belorkin decided to take a gamble on Crouch. Forgetting everything else, he focused solely on surviving. Thump! At intervals that seemed to shorten, the sound of footsteps approached. Now, the thousand-faced demon was almost upon them. I'm getting ready. At that moment, Crouch withdrew his sword. His eyes closed, and after a brief pause, a glow of aura began to rise from Crouch's entire body. Crouch's mind fused with his sword, reaching a state of unity known as Shinjiometry Hapael. Seeing this, Belorkin's pupils quaked fiercely. Despite the downpour, the swamp risen to their waists, and the oppressive presence of the thousand-faced demon. Crouch managed to enter a focused state in the midst of countless distractions. What concentration? How can it be this intense? Belorkin suddenly felt the pounding of his own heart rough and rapid. It was a bad premonition creeping up from his stomach. And shortly after, his gut feelings proved correct. A blue aura began to shimmer on top of Crush's sword. Initially, there was just a palmful of aura. But as the aura blanketed the sword, it drove Belorkin to amazement. The quantity of aura wasn't significantly large. It was merely at the lower expert level. Ads by Pub Future. Yet, its quality was on a completely different plane. An aura of such translucent quality, seemingly unachievable to him even after decades of training, was now contained entirely in Crush's single sword. This realm was so exalted it could almost blow away Belorkin's mind altogether, confounding him even further. Even if Crush learned a secret technique from Charlotte, how could this be possible? His heart began to beat violently again. No, this can't be. This cannot be happening. Brother. As he felt his limbs grow numb and his face drained of blood, Crush's voice reached him. Only calmness filled Crush's open blue eyes. Please. Upon belatedly understanding his request, Belorkin raised his hand. All right. The moment Belorkin infused his Ignis into Crush's aura, a blue flame roared to life in stark contrast to Belorkin's own flame. The burning blade of the sword seemed like it could scorch anything it touched, making Belorkin feel incredibly small before it. Thump. Thump. Meanwhile, the thousand-faced demon began to take shape through the wall of pouring rain. Even a glance confirmed that the demon had swelled to an absurd size, its mere approach stirring enough fear to chill the bones. Could he really buy any time? It was at this moment. Brother, it's okay. Crush's voice reached the tensed Belarkin. It seems we have more time than expected, so you don't need to distract it. Hearing the following words, Belarkin felt something inside him drop heavily. Crouch must have spoken out of concern, 
but his words felt as though they meant Belorkin was completely unnecessary. All Belorkin had done was to bestow a divine skill upon Crouch. Even that power wasn't truly Belorkin's, it was divine. Then what was he doing here now? That thought filled Belorkin's mind. Crouch's sword slowly lifted above him. Belorkin looked up following the sword. Even amidst the torrential downpour, the sword, infused with Ignis, did not lose its brilliance and blazed spectacularly. The flames that burned more fiercely than when Belorkin wielded them made the drenched Belorkin seem all the more pitiful in contrast. That sword would undoubtedly cleave the thousand-faced demon. Such mighty power was definitely enclosed within it. But at the moment the sword cut through the thousand-faced demon, what would become of him? Belorkin hadn't managed to do anything to confront the demon. Instead, he was pitifully tumbling and running away. But here, Crouch was cleaving the thousand-faced demon with his own power. That meant. That meant. I am inferior to Crouch, aren't I? The halfpenny youngest, trapped in the Chonsong one. If he was beneath even that youngest, then what was his significance in Valheim? Ah, ah. Belorkin's lips, turned blue from the rain, trembled faintly. Rather, rather don't make the cut. Don't defeat the thousand-faced demon. Forsaking even the thought of wanting to live, Belorkin wished desperately. In a moment that seemed destined to crush his last hope, despair fell from the heavens. One sword. For a split second, as Crush's sword slashed down, the rain paused. Tick, whoosh. And then the rain began pouring down again, belatedly. Rumble. A clear sound of something ripping apart echoed around them. As Belorkin's view stretched out in front of him, he saw the thousand-faced demon split diagonally. With no sign of resistance, trapped in the flames that began at the slash, it crumbled away. The moment he witnessed it, Belorkin's heart crumbled simultaneously. Thud! Belorkin slumped down unconsciously. It was because the whole world seemed to point out that he was beneath Crouch. Brother, it's safe now. Right then, Crouch's voice rang clearly in his ears. As if recognizing the death of its master, the rain began to taper off gradually, and the swamp size started to shrink. Soon after, the sunlight peeking through the clouds shone upon Crouch's face, revealing his radiant expression. This was no longer the face of a lowly halfpenny, it was the bright face of someone who was moving forward. And in contrast to such Crouch, Belorkin's face was hidden beneath his own small shadow. Ha, ha, ha. A hollow laugh escaped his lips for a moment. Before long, Belorkin started to slowly lift himself up. His mind was a tangled mess of thoughts. But he could recognize one fact. Crouch had surpassed him. And in Balheim, the true rubbish was himself. Realizing that, Belorkin grasped his sword. Crouch was exhausted from the strike he had just delivered. It was a full-powered strike, and even Belorkin could easily tell. Die. Therefore, with no hesitation, Belorkin swung his sword towards Crouch's neck. His twisted face, eager to slay the younger brother who had brought him to ruin, was awash with a maddened smile. Clang. However, what his sword felt was not the sensation of cutting through his brother's neck but the sound of steel clashing against steel. Ha ha, coo. At that moment, Belorkin heard a laughter that sounded forcibly repressed. As his eyes belatedly turned toward Crouch's face, Crouch was looking back at him with a tragic smile. Belorkin, thank you for not changing at all. Although Belorkin couldn't comprehend those words, he realized something. A black energy was rising from Crouch's body. What? Startled, Belorkin attempted to retract his sword and trigger his Ignis too late. No flames arose from his blade. As one of Belorkin's eyes widened in realization, Crouch looked at him with a sneering smile. Looking for this? In that instant, a dark flame surged along the black energy from Crouch's sword. Recognizing it as Ignis, one of Belorkin's eyes bulged in shock. What, you, what have you done? As Belorkin cried out in confusion, Crouch shook his drenched hair and then casually swung his sword toward Belorkin. Whoosh! Startled by the fact that Crouch had used Ignis, Belorkin failed to anticipate the attack. A a cack. Having his chest slashed, Belorkin writhed on the ground amidst the dark flames. 
Bell Orkin, do you know? I really wanted to get along with my brothers when I was incredibly young. As he screamed in pain, Crouch started to walk somewhere sluggishly. He was heading towards where the thousand-faced demon lay. But no matter how much I tried to get along, you hated me viciously just because of that petty pride. Then, Crouch sliced off one of the fingers from the thousand-faced demon's cursed hand and stabbed it through with his sword before starting to make his way back. I always had a little hope since we shared blood, that maybe you would eventually come to acknowledge and embrace your younger brother. Even amidst searing pain, Belorkin clearly heard Crouch's voice. But, thankfully, when Crouch finally arrived right in front of him, he looked at Belorkin and smiled as he did at the beginning. You never chose to do that. And as Belorkin opened his mouth to scream something, a finger from the thousand-faced demon was thrust into it. Ugh, Gurk! As the finger was forced into his mouth, Belorkin let out a scream. However, Crouch looked down on him coldly. Shortly thereafter, Belorkin realized the last of his sight was disappearing. As he became aware, he flailed even more desperately, but it was too late. His eyes, and soon his nose and mouth, were completely gone. G-U-H, Kirk. A choking sound vibrated through his throat. Desperate for air, he started to roll on the ground. Does it hurt? Crouch said this to the suffering Belorkin, now without even a hint of smile. When you burnt my face, I rolled around just like you. On that day when Belorkin burned his arm, and eventually his face, Crouch couldn't even open his eyes until the saintess healed him. That's why Crouch didn't offer any help to Belorkin. As Belorkin's breathing sounds faded with a gurgling noise, and the last of it stopped. Crouch exhaled lightly and looked up at the sky. Regrettably, even if the clouds cleared, his own heart was unlikely to ever see such blue again. The news that a whole team of mid-level knights was wiped out and that Belorkin had died spread in no time throughout the main Balheim estate. This instance of world erosion had manifested anomalous symptoms, escalating the difficulty to five stars, and as a result, the only survivor was Krausch Balheim. Where was Krausch now? He was right at the main estate. Who would have thought I'd be back here for such a reason? Krausch had been assigned one of the vacant rooms at the estate and was currently resting. He was found in a pathetic state, completely drained of his strength by the purifiers and additional knights who arrived subsequently, resembling a drowned rat. Thus, he was first transferred to the main estate since it was closer than the Green Pine Mansion. Thanks to that, he was resting at the main estate for the first time in a long while. How is this possible? How could Belorkin have passed away, yet the worthless halfpenny of Balheim is the one to survive? Watch your language, no matter what, Krausch is still a direct descendant of Balheim. Do you want to get into serious trouble? At that moment, voices were heard from outside. The voice's owner was none other than Belorkin's personal butler. Apparently, he couldn't accept the fact that Belorkin had died and had shouted without thinking. Some people are even extolling Belorkin as noble. Revealed by the purifiers, this world erosion was graded at five stars, an increase of two levels from the original. Five-star world erosion implies that only an expert of the highest caliber can take down the master. In such a situation, Belorkin, merely at the superior rank, struggled with all his might and was able to wound the thousand-faced demon with Ignis and topple it over. It was truly a noble sacrifice. Of course, labeled as a sacrifice, he couldn't avoid death. He suffered from the curse of the thousand-faced demon's final attack. Belorkin had tried to pierce his face with the sword containing Ignis to breathe, but in his injured and suffocating state, he cut through his body instead, and died from the struggle to breathe. And who was the one to narrate his heroic sacrifice? None other than Crouch. It seems they believe the testimony, so I needn't bother anymore. Even though they were half-brothers, Crouch felt no significant guilt for having killed Belorkin himself. Belorkin had consistently hated him to the very end. After all, it was Belorkin's fate to die by his family's hands. Nothing new there. The way he was beaten to death by Charlotte is still vivid in his memory. Ads by Pub Future. Speaking of which, why did Charlotte kill Belorkin? Because of the successive curses and injuries caused by Belorkin, Crush's memories of that time were foggy. He had heard that Belorkin ended up doing something to Charlotte, just like he had to Crouch. By now. 
He would be out on a world erosion expedition with one of Balhame's five upper-level night squads. Nothing to be concerned about. In any case, Balheim was deep into preparing for Balorkin's funeral while actively investigating the abnormal incident as a result of this world erosion. And Crouch knew all too well that he couldn't return to the Green Pine Mansion until the investigation was completely underway. Come to think of it, I told that someone I'd be back soon. Crouch thought of Bianca and scratched his head momentarily. She'll manage fine on her own. She might even have forgotten him by now, busy immersing herself in books. Let's set that aside. Crouch sat on his bed and raised his hand. And then, similar to when he wore the black hood, he channeled strength into his hand, and a flame burst forth in his grip. It was none other than the Ignis he had stolen from Belorkin. Watching the flame, Crouch let out a sardonic laugh. The fact that he had finally stolen another skill he had longed for felt undeniably real. Is this the second time after Arthur's return? The conditions for triggering the dial when he stole the skill from Belorkin were threefold. First was the collapse of self-esteem. This had already slowly accumulated from the evening and collapsed finally with Crush's last awakening. Second was for the subject to willingly pass on part of Ignis to him. Crush directly received the flames from Belorkin to confront the thousand-faced demon. With that, the second condition was fulfilled. Lastly, the third. The subject must recognize that I can use Ignis better than himself. That I referred to in the third condition was, of course, Crouch. At the last condition, Belorkin, seeing Crouch's single slash, acknowledged that even Ignis was much better handled by Crouch. The moment all the numbers on the dial matched, Crouch's black hood was activated. Ignis from Belorkin was snatched in an instant into Crouch's hand, and as a result, a flame sprouted from him. This was the full account of how Crouch was able to steal Ignis from the incident. Crouch, who had meticulously guided the situation to fulfill all the conditions and successfully did so, was truly a hard-headed individual. He had not only managed to make Balorkin's death appear as a noble sacrifice but also concealed the fact that he had filched the skill. It's still too early for anyone to find out. The fact that he can steal skills shouldn't be disclosed to anyone for the time being. Though the curse is tolerable, the moment others learn he can steal skills too, they will all keep at a distance. There's still so much more that I need to steal. Ignis was merely a starting point. That's why Crouch reframed Belorkin's death as self-destructive, shifting all the credit for the world erosion contributions to Belorkin. Having verified Ignis, Crouch then extinguished the flame. This incident had harvested quite a number of accomplishments. Starting with the gain of Ignis and becoming able to use extreme blood poisoning, he had also confirmed a temporary measure for the extreme blood poisoning. But what intrigued Crouch most among these was that Ignis was able to ignite even the power of world erosion. Whoosh! The moment Crouch reignited Ignis, what soared from his hand was a jet black flame. Black flame. It was the force of world erosion, settled within Crouch's body, burning bright through Ignis as fueled by extreme blood poisoning. The black flame was significantly more perilous than the usual aura of flame. The burning flames showcased considerable firepower that matched their fierce intensity. Inadvertently, he had acquired a secret weapon. It could all be credited to Belorkin. However, there still remained one truly important matter. The real issue that kept Crouch tied to the main estate. The strange symptom of world erosion stages rising. The incident had warranted the deployment of specialized personnel just to investigate world erosions. It was quite a significant event after all. And they haven't found the reason yet. Crouch, well aware of the reason, laid down his sword and sank into thought. The cause behind this abnormal symptom was actually straightforward. Immortals. It was their breeds that had stirred. World eroders. Born within world erosion, they bear a striking resemblance to humans while being erosion species. These beings carry world erosion within their bodies, each and every one composed of monstrous individuals surpassing even the masters in dreadfulness. And among them, there exists an immortal. He is the one who manipulates the most species within the world eroders like extensions of his own hand. Was it from that time? That guy started to deliberately raise the stages of world erosion. 
The immortal was engaged in the strange business of intentionally raising the stages of nearby world erosions by at least two levels. The public was still unaware of such immortals. Well, of course, it would be. After all, it was Arthur who informed us about it. Arthur provided information about the immortal through his memories of regression. The deeds of the immortal, raising the stages of world erosion, repeatedly induced great dangers. Thus, it was Arthur who informed about the immortal and ended up killing him. Ironically, though, Crouch found himself using such powers of the immortal. However, Crouch couldn't just overlook the immortal. Mr. Crouch. Crouch swiftly extinguished the black flame upon hearing the sound of knocking at the door. Come in. At Crush's invitation, a female figure opened the door and entered. Her appearance differed from that of an ordinary maidservant. Covered with a headdress marked with the Balheim crest, she wore a blue cloak over a body-fitting dress. She was none other than a member of the Valkyrie, the direct knight serving under Balheim's matriarch. The appearance of Valkyrie, individuals of expert upper-class capabilities, prompted Crouch to show a trace of curiosity. Why would the Valkyrie have business with me? Madame Arya Balheim requests your presence. Mother? Arya Balheim. She was the woman who married into the Balheim family after the previous matriarch passed away and the mother of Charlotte and Crouch. Due to Charlotte, who was a star of her own, she was effectively the most influential woman in Balheim, second only to the patriarch. Hearing her summons, Crouch felt an unwelcome feeling. I would have thought Sapphira, the World Erosion Investigation Team, would have called me first, not that mother would be the first to call. Crouch roughly guessed why Arya had called him, as he knew his mother's personality better than anyone. All right, lead the way. Yes, understood. The Valkyrie escorted Crouch with due respect. Following her through an unfamiliar corridor revealed hallways evidently etched with traces of Balheim. The feeling that this place was indeed the Balheim main estate was palpable. And this realization made Crouch feel somewhat intimidated. No one else was as disconnected from this place as Crouch was. Tap tap. Madame Aria, Mr. Crouch has arrived. Shortly after, the Valkyrie stopped in front of a room and knocked. The doorway, seemingly for entertaining guests, echoed with footsteps before a voice from inside beckoning entry. Creak. The door opened, and a waft of cosmetics filled the air. Simultaneously, there stood a woman, her inherent brilliance not overshadowed by her thick makeup. Despite her age, she retained a glamorous appearance and upon seeing Crouch, her eyes widened in astonishment. Crouch! She hurriedly rushed forward and embraced Crouch. My son, you've been through such an ordeal, do you know how worried your mother has been? Watching her make a fuss, Crouch responded with a clicking of his tongue, as expected. She was Arya Balheim, the matriarch of Balheim and Crouch's mother. Mother, let's go inside first. Oh, that's right, how silly of me. Come on in. Cheerfully, Arya ushered Crouch into the room, treating the guest reception room as if it were her own. Watching her, Crouch remained indifferent. Perhaps in his childhood, when he was chased out to the Green Pine Mansion and later met his mother, he would have cried his eyes out. But unfortunately, Crouch had seen and endured far too much. And he knew very well who the woman named Arya standing before him was. With the door closed, Arya hummed a little tune while preparing some tea. Crouch, without settling into a chair, asked. What business do you have with me, mother? Eh? Well, my son, I called to see you after you nearly died. At her response, Crouch couldn't help but snort. If a son had narrowly escaped death, a mother would rush to see him first before anyone. Yet, she had summoned Crouch only afterward, and with a completely unconcerned expression at that. Just speak plainly. Thus, Crouch met Arya's gaze with an equally direct expression. Is it because the son you thought a discarded piece suddenly brings news of worth, you now wish to claim him as a card in play? Arya stopped pouring tea from the glass teapot and looked at Crouch with a questioning expression. What do you mean by that? Mother, do you wish to carry on with such a posture even in front of your own son? The child she bore was treated as less than nothing and sent away to the Green Pine Mansion. A standard mother would not accept that fact and would have visited the Green Pine Mansion continually. 
But Arya had not showed her face even once to Crouch during his time at the Green Pine Mansion. And that would be the case all the way until Crouch entered the Rahalan Academy. Hmm. Seeing Crouch like this, Arya softly leaned her posterior on the table and then wrapped her hands around her cheek, tilting her head. Our son seems to have changed quite a bit, hasn't he? So much that a mother might not recognize him. Isn't it only natural for a child to grow quickly? That I can see from Charlotte. No matter how much a child grows, they remain a child to their mother. Arya chuckled softly. However, it seems my son is quite different. Talking to you makes me feel like I'm conversing with someone of nearly my own age. Is that something you say to your son? I wouldn't have said it to an ordinary 13-year-old son. Ordinary. At that word, Crouch burst into sardonic laughter. Would an ordinary son ever catch your eye, mother? The matriarch of Balheim. It's a position one could never reach through beauty alone. Balheim, with the highest martial might in the world, having surpassed the ten great warriors to the realm of the four great celestials, is also the place of Balrock Balheim, called the strongest patriarch in history. In some ways, a seat more difficult to attain than that of a queen. Thus, Arya had been through many secret battles and emerged victorious in the political sphere. She was twenty when she became the matriarch of Balheim. And now, fifteen years have passed. Ads by Pub Future. She has staunchly maintained her position as the matriarch amidst all that transpires within Balheim. However, that is where the problem arose. The path she took to get here was too treacherous. As a result, she had lost many common emotions. The first and foremost emotion she lost was maternal love. To her, her children were simply beings that existed to maintain her own status. She would play the part of a mother, but if ever it became an inconvenience to her position, she could easily set it aside. After all, she had her daughter, Charlotte, to secure her status for a lifetime. Therefore, Arya was infinitely tender towards Charlotte. Whereas for Crouch, she only acted the part of a mother, devoid of any true maternal emotion. The reason she had called for Crouch today aligned with his words. The recent rumors about Crouch were vastly different from his usual actions. So she had summoned him to see if he still held value as her child. In her mind, she was hearing a ringing bingo. Son, mother loves you no matter how you've changed. Saying so, she slowly sipped the tea she had poured. The fact that you are my son will never change, no matter what happens. Blood is much thicker than the red tea she was currently sipping, almost to the point of being a curse. Arya knew this and thus smiled with her eyes. Our son will be as stubborn as his mother. There may come a time when he reaches this state. And that was a fact that could not be denied. Krasha's stubbornness was reminiscent of Arya, something he had deeply felt for a long time. So if you have resolved to be strong, strive to be the strongest. That's the only way to survive in Balheim. Even if it was from the mother he resented, the tie of blood did not change. And the real reason I called for you today lies elsewhere. Arya said as she picked up a letter that was on the table. The crest of Balheim was clearly stamped on the letter. It's from the Patriarch. This news caused even Crouch to harden. What does it say? He will be returning from the Forbidden Region soon. The Forbidden Region, a land where world erosion has proliferated so irretrievably that it is no longer recoverable. This was a place that could not even be raided and was the most troublesome spot for each country. Balrock Balheim was in one such forbidden region, all by himself. And he wishes to see you once he gets back. A hint of confusion flitted across Krasha's eyes. Whatever he had done could barely be considered child's play, surely not enough to catch Balrock's ear. Perhaps. Had his father seen something? Balrock Balheim was a being who had entered the realm of demigods. If that were the case, he might see something close to foreseeing through the stars, perhaps even something in him. Stay here in the main house until then. Upon hearing that he should wait until his father returned, Crouch raised his head. Mother had the expression of someone simply delivering an order. Was that written in the letter? Eh? Well, it wasn't written as such but. Then I shall return to the Green Pine Mansion. With Crouch's declaration to return immediately, 
Arya showed a sign of confusion for the first time. Ah, uh, son? The Green Pine Mansion is where I was originally assigned, isn't it? Even Mother and the Patriarch agreed on that point. With those words, Crouch flashed a smile that closely resembled Arya's. I will come when the Patriarch calls for me. Or perhaps. Arya then realized that Crouch had become an even greater hardhead than herself. The Patriarch should come to me personally. Crouch, nonchalantly spouting words others would hardly dare, opened the door. I will give my testimony about the recent strange symptoms of world erosion and then take my leave. Unable to stop Crouch, who was now exiting the room, Arya had been shocked by his earlier statement. Crouch, having left his mother behind, sighed as he stood outside the door. This was why he had been reluctant to meet with his mother. Her presence was just as prickly to him as well. I wish all this was over soon. He found it ironic that he longed to return to the Green Pine Mansion, the very place he had so loathed. Perhaps because of this, the face of the expressionless chick suddenly came to mind. She's probably reading a book again. That was the thought on Crush's mind when he happened to come face to face with someone walking in his direction. He was the maid in charge of Crush's room, and she'd bowed her head the moment she faced Crouch. Mr. Crouch, the World Erosion Investigation Team Sapphira has requested your assistance. Good timing. Might as well give them something thrilling to document. World Erosion Investigation Team Sapphira. Experts on world erosion and a group composed of talented individuals sent from various parts of the world. Supported cooperatively by the four great kingdoms, each small country, and even the empire. That's why Sapphira has the highest authority when it comes to researching world erosion. That's why even Balheim had to comply with Sapphira's investigations without question. If they did not want to turn all states into enemies, that is. You've arrived. As Crouch opened the door to enter, there stood a stern-looking woman. She was dressed in the inflated front uniform specific to Sapphira, holding a file envelope in her hand. The number etched on her chest was level 4. Considering the ranks within Sapphira go from 9 to 1, she had a considerably high rank. It made sense, given the gravity of the matter at hand. Mr. Crouch Balheim, correct? Yes, that's me. As the other party was all business, so too did Crouch respond professionally as he sat down. Sapphira would continue to be a necessary group. Their knowledge related to world erosion was unparalleled after all so he had no intention to be on their bad side. Only, that would be until the one who would wreck all of Sapphira would appear. For now, it should still be fine. That person won't be active until a bit later on. So, Crouch decided to focus on the woman in front of him. Just then, Crouch noticed a small black star mark on her neck, peeking through her hair. As Crouch stared blankly at the black star, for some reason, he felt an urge to laugh. When Crouch suddenly started laughing, the Sapphira investigator turned her head. She gazed at Crouch suspiciously, while he relaxed further into his chair. So this is where the offspring of the immortal was hiding. I would have never guessed they'd be so close. Immortal. As Crouch uttered that name, the woman's body froze. I would like to propose a deal with you. The small black star mark etched on the woman's neck. It was none other than proof of being an immortal's offspring. Ordinarily, it wouldn't have been visible, but Crouch absorbed the world erosion within his body. As a result, he began to see who the offspring of the immortals were. Bold of you. To think an immortal would plant its offspring even within Sapphira. Mr. Crouch, I'm not sure what you're talking about. The investigator looked at Crouch with a deadly glare. However, such a menacing look didn't intimidate Crouch in the slightest. Let's not beat around the bush, I'm the only one who can erase your immortality. And as soon as those words followed, the investigator's expression began to change slowly. With that, her features started to transform entirely. Her hair, previously black as night, turned into a fiery red, and her eyes glowed a deep crimson, burning brightly. Her pupils resembled those of a reptile. Several more black star marks appeared on her neck as she exhaled a heavy breath. Phew! Just that was enough for Crouch to feel an altered presence emanating from her, a different sort of pressure filling the air. 
Beads of cold sweat formed on Krush's back. Even if he wasn't overwhelmed by the feeling, his body reflexively reacted, indeed, an ephemeral mind-body of the immortal had merely transferred for a moment. She radiated such an overwhelmingly dominant aura. My child. The words she uttered were enough to solidify even the easygoing Krausch momentarily. Are you a regressor? Regressor. As soon as he heard the term, Krausch's thoughts came to a halt. Krausch certainly counted himself among regressors. But the real regressor was someone else. Arthur Graham 8. He was the true regressor. Does this being know about Arthur? No, that couldn't be the case. If she did, she wouldn't have asked him if he was a regressor. It was more likely she knew of the existence of regressors in some way and was guessing at it. At the same time, Krausch realized why Arthur, in the past, sought to kill the immortal. The immortal knows about regressors. How it came to know this must have been a secret Arthur could never let out, for he was a regressor. I don't know if I'm a regressor or what, but if I were, do you think I'd admit it? At the moment a human child boldly asks me for a deal, there is no other explanation but that of a regressor. The immortal said, chuckling as if she had figured it all out. I was after something else. I came to find out who was tampering with the world erosions I cultivated, but I seem to have caught an unexpected fish. The madness of elevating the levels of world erosion. It seemed her reason to do so had nothing to do with regressors. Whatever it was she was searching for, the immortal wore a look of supreme arrogance. To erase my immortality, you say, regressor? How ridiculously funny. A creature trapped in the cycle of time dares to put on airs before me, who transcended time? And it seemed that she ultimately mistook him entirely for a regressor. I'm only half a regressor. He wasn't the true regressor. The real regressor was Arthur. Arthur, who went through the same turns as Crouch, no longer exists in this world. But Arthur exists in this world. The disappearance of the regression I stole is proof. The regression that Crouch possessed was gone. After all, a skill is a unique power that only one person in the world can possess. In Crouch's black hood was Ignis, but there was no regression. Because this Arthur possessed regression, Crouch's was erased. Thus, the true regressor was indeed Arthur. How many turns Arthur has taken, I still can't say. But it was clear that he did not know that Crouch had regressed. Did you enjoy the worlds you've seen? Feeling like the whole world is yours just because you've experienced regression? How laughable. What remains for you is just emptiness. Considering the mocking laughter of the immortal, Crouch remained silent for a while. Then after a moment, Crouch lifted his hand. In that instant, a pen that had been atop her document somehow ended up in Crouch's possession. Noticing this, the immortal flinched. She was very well aware that what Crouch just did was neither magic nor an aura. It's a skill. Crouch blatantly made it clear that it was a skill. He casually twirled the pen in his hand and looked at her stony form. And it's a skill that could even steal your immortality. Upon hearing this, for the first time, the immortal's eyes shook with apparent distress. Shall we have a conversation now? Crimson Garden. The immortal yearning to erase its immortality. You're facing the only person capable of erasing it. The one standing before her was the world erosion bearer. Crimson Garden August. The immortal. Crimson Garden August. In fact, Crouch once attempted to steal her immortality a long time ago. However, that was not his intention. Arthur. He had instructed Crouch to do so to Crimson Garden before him. But Crouch failed. It was because of a single dial created to steal her immortality. The condition was simple. Be stronger than Crimson Garden August. And Crouch could not fulfill that one condition. Crouch at that time was merely a lump of curse with a resilient life essence. Arthur, without saying much, even if Crouch failed to steal it, chopped up Crimson Garden and submerged her directly into a lava cave. Adding that she would eternally melt and regenerate there, living an eternal life. That Arthur, the bastard, must have wanted to use me as a tool to absorb the curse of immortality. 
That would have been why he could show such an attitude. Crouch looked at the current crimson garden before his eyes. After he exhibited his skill, she still remained hardened, unable to speak a single word. It was a natural reaction. The skill was the only method that could erase the curse-like immortality for her. Thus, after a considerable time of silence, Crimson Garden opened her mouth again. The terms of the deal are? And for the first time, her eyes sincerely changed. Without a single trace of mockery left, sincerity could be felt from the eyes of Crimson Garden, who was now looking at him directly. She wanted to erase her immortality no matter what. Assist me in getting stronger. Crouch immediately brought out the content of the deal he had thought of right from the start. Crouch had definitely become stronger. And he would continue to become stronger in the future. Ads by Pub Future. He would eventually become a formidable being by stealing more skills, mastering secretive arts, and refining them. But that would only be within the realm of a genius. Crouch knew all too well how powerless a genius could be faced with destruction. Geniuses can change the world. However, geniuses cannot protect the world. The world needed someone beyond a genius. So Crouch didn't care about the means to become stronger. Even if the person before him was a world erosion bearer, Crouch planned to devour anything and everything that came his way. Crimson Garden, a strong being comparable to Arthur with the species she commanded alone. With her help, he could certainly become much stronger than now. I have no intention to perish alongside the world. To Crouch, in fact, the world had been nothing short of shitty. Born a halfpenny, after going through all sorts of hardship, not only did he fail to receive recognition, but he was also betrayed by a comrade. There was a part of him that just thought the world should just perish. But even so, this is the world where he lives. Without the world, he doesn't exist. This is not a consideration for others. It's solely to survive that he tries to prevent the world from perishing. So Crouch was determined to hold out with all his might, once again attempting to prevent the world from sinking into destruction. That is Crouch Balheim. A stubborn half-wit through and through. This is akin to the conditions for erasing your immortality. To unlock Crimson Garden's dial, there was a need to become stronger than her. Whether that strength was something visible or based on her perception, he still did not know. But the dial had laid out those conditions. So, in some way, Crouch and Crimson Garden's goals were aligned. If Crouch grew stronger, he could fulfill the dial's conditions and steal Crimson Garden's immortality. Thus, it was necessary for Crimson Garden too to make Crouch powerful. The conditions granted by the skill? Yes, without meeting those conditions, even I cannot steal your immortality. Upon hearing Crouch's words, Crimson Garden looked at him with her arms folded. It's not a lie. There's no way a regressor would propose such a deal to her mindlessly. Make me stronger, he had said. Somehow, a snicker escaped her. Did this young one even understand what that meant? To become a disciple of the Dragon King tribe, that's what it signified. Indeed, nurturing something definite right in front of me seems better than blindly raising the ranks of world erosion in pursuit of something meaningless. A being capable of killing her. She had purposely investigated while elevating the ranks of the world erosion in search of such a person. But, Crouch suddenly appeared before her. If it would lead to erasing her immortality, she'd sell her soul if necessary. What did it matter to take on a disciple? A provocative smile drew across her face for the first time in ages. All right. If that's the condition, I'll nurture you. I'll raise you to become the strongest in this world. Seeing the confident Crimson Garden, Crouch internally let out a sigh of relief. Then he stood up and reached out his hand. Then I'm counting on you. C-R-I-M. Yes, I too. But at that instant, Crimson Garden's face crumpled. What, child? What did you just call me? Crimson Garden is too long to say. While Crimson Garden showed a baffled expression, Crouch remained nonchalant. Only that man dared to call me Crim before. She hadn't expected someone else in this world to ever call her Crim, and after letting out a huff, she clenched her fist. Call me master. 
Then she struck Crouch on the head, as a master would. Crouch, who had never expected to be hit with a knuckle wrap, finished the investigation with Crimson Garden's servant, reverted back to her investigator role. Still feeling a tingling sensation in his head, Crouch was touching his head when a bird tapped the carriage window with its beak where he was seated. The exceedingly crimson bird had a black star spot on its neck. When Crouch opened the window, the bird hopped onto his shoulder. Crim, isn't your color a bit too conspicuous? As soon as he addressed it as Crim, the bird tried to peck at his cheek with its beak. This bird was none other than another servant sent by Crimson Garden. Don't worry. The color can be changed freely. Saying that, Crimson Garden changed her feathers color to black. What do you think? I matched it with the hair color of my unfortunate disciple. A crow truly resembles you. Thanks for the compliment. Crows are smart, you know. I said it because your inside is as dark as a crow's. Should I consider grilling this bird soon? Crouch seriously pondered this. So, where is the main body? Sending a servant meant that her main body was elsewhere. Thus, upon Crouch's query, she preened her feathers. Don't you have a rough idea? That damned regressor status. As her words suggested, Crouch knew the status of her main body. She was an immortal. Specifically, an immortal in eternal slumber. Her main body lay somewhere in this world with its eyes shut. And the only way to wake from that sleep was to erase the immortality. Thus, she desired to remove her immortality. Eternal sleep, in a way, was even more accursed than death itself. That was why Crimson Garden commanded the most number of species among those who erode the world. Through their eyes, she could see the real world, not a dream. Yet with those beings, she displayed a combat power equal to that of Arthur. Of course, in the process, those beings had all died, but that was beside the point. If only that were to be considered, maybe Crimson Garden's main body was stronger than Arthur's. Ended up chopped to pieces and dropped into lava, but who knows for sure. During these thoughts, Crouch felt the carriage lurch into motion. It was finally starting to leave. A farewell to the detested family estate. One shouldn't return there for quite a while. Eventually, when father returns, I'll have to visit at least once. But until then, goodbye. After about four hours into the carriage ride, Crouch finally arrived at Green Pine Mansion. It had been just a few days since he left but he felt like he was coming home as he saw something white hurrying towards the carriage. That white figure reminded him, for a moment, of a white chick. The identity of this chick was none other than Bianca. She approached Crouch as he got out of the carriage and said, You're back. Was she here to welcome her fiancé? Seeing her clutching a book, it seemed she rushed here after hearing the carriage, probably interrupting her reading. The ever-expressionless Bianca lightly circled Crouch once. Watching her curious behavior, Bianca nodded. You don't seem to be hurt. Were you hoping I'd come back injured? I had heard it was dangerous. Was that her way of showing concern? You said you'd come back quickly, and yet it took days. I did my best to come back as fast as I could. Bianca seemed to acknowledge this, nodding as though she was not unaware of it. Crouch thought that she appeared even more stoic today than usual. Welcome back. At that moment, Elliot greeted Crouch. Yeah, did anything happen at Green Pine Mansion? Except for a letter that arrived for Mr. Crouch, no. A letter? As Crouch showed surprise, Elliot produced the letter as if he had it prepared. Upon seeing the letter, Crouch immediately recognized the sender. There was only one woman who would send a letter with a lipstick mark like this. Darling. It was from Darling Danphelion, the future Grand Alchemist. It hadn't been that long since his trip to the Star Sanctuary. There was no reason for her to contact him so soon. Crouch opened the letter and scanned its contents. After a moment, he was taken aback. Is crazy always going to be crazy? The letter was an announcement that she had developed a cure for discoloration disease and that she would visit soon. Creating a cure for discoloration disease in such a short amount of time, that was something. Crouch looked at Aeliad. This must be good news for you. 
Excuse me? Elliot had a daughter who was suffering from the discoloration disease, so Crash said as much and then carefully folded the letter and put it in his pocket. There will be a guest arriving soon. Let darling Danphelion in when she comes. Yes, sir. Despite his confusion, Elliot bowed professionally and made the arrangement, which was precisely why Crash kept him around. Then, Crash's gaze fell upon Bianca who was still standing there, staring at him in bewilderment. Mr. Crouch, Miss Bianca was quite worried about you. During this time, Elliot had discreetly conveyed his message to Crouch. Bianca worried? About him? After his return to the past, he had managed to become somewhat close to Bianca. But the idea of her being worried about him was hard to believe. When they said Mr. Crouch was involved in world erosion, she wanted to go to the main house. Hearing that she had considered going to the main house to find him, Crouch realized it was sincere concern. She may not have emotions, but she was capable of worry. Well, worry was more a matter of thought than of emotion. Considering recent times, Crouch hadn't checked her dial in a while. Maybe by now, he had become at least a friend to her. Crouch activated his black hood right away. In an instant, a dial appeared before him. As he weakly opened his eyes to look at the dial, Crouch then widened them in shock. The first dial has been unlocked. The first dial that had been stuck on Bianca all this time was now open. Crouch faced the expressionless Bianca who was looking at him. This means that, one way or another, he had probably become a friend to Bianca by now. He felt a sense of accomplishment for having taken care of her this whole time. Only one dial remained. Soon, Bianca would regain her emotions. Feeling inexplicably better, Crouch raised his hand and stroked Bianca's head. Bianca looked at Crouch, not understanding why but apparently not minding the gesture as she stayed still. Bianca, have you eaten? Not yet. Too young to starve on this day. Aeliad, prepare something tasty. Yes, sir. As Aeliad went to get the food ready, the crow-shaped crimson garden hopped off from the carriage and landed on Crouch's shoulder. Noticing this, Bianca's eyes widened slightly. Oh, I forgot to introduce you. This is our new friend. Seeing the glimmer in Bianca's eyes, Crouch crouched down to give her a closer look at Crimson Garden. Bianca carefully lifted a small hand and stroked the feathers of Crimson Garden. It's soft. It seemed Bianca was not curious about why he had brought a crow, nor did she dislike the touch, as Crimson Garden allowed her to stroke without moving. What's its name? Did Bianca like animals? Upon hearing her question, a mischievous smile spread across Crush's face. C-R-I-M. What happened between Crimson Garden and him after that would remain a secret? The curse afflicting Bianca. The snowman. The curse that stole emotions from Bianca had plagued her since birth. Crush needed her curse to kill the madness caused by world erosion. He had been tirelessly working to unlock her dials up until now. Just a few days ago, he finally managed to unlock the first dial of Bianca. It was a tremendous achievement, but the problem was the second dial. What is this? The second dial that Crouch confirmed on Bianca made him feel helpless. Become the most important person to Bianca. The most important person. For some, it could be a parent, a child, a friend, or a lover. It was a rather complicated phrase to define. However, the reason for Crush's feeling of helplessness was different. It was thinkable to be called a friend. But for Bianca, who lacked emotions, becoming the most important person was exceedingly troublesome. A challenging condition made even more so specifically because it was Bianca. I can't be a parent or a child. He couldn't easily claim the two titles that could make one the most important person. That left the possibility of being a lover. Ironically, Crouch had already somewhat achieved that aspect. He and Bianca were fiancés arranged by their families. However, being engaged and being lovers were separate things. Above all, being lovers presupposed the emotion of love. For Bianca, who lacked emotions, love was impossible. Moreover, Crouch felt somewhat upset. It was too much to have to woo a 12-year-old child just to unlock a dial. It's become quite the headache. 
He didn't remember such conditions when he had stolen Bianca's curse before. Ads by Pub Future. Well, considering the conditions of the dial reflect one's life, it made sense. Bianca from that time and the current Bianca were different. It's fine now since he had his sixth sense, but someday he would desperately need her curse. The worry wasn't just a little. Flap, flap. At that moment, Crouch heard the sound of wings from outside the window. As if accustomed to it, Crouch opened the window, and a crow flew in. It was none other than Crimson Garden August, her species. The child seems to really like me. She won't let go easily. Her reason for staying until now was because of Bianca. He had only realized this time that Bianca quite liked animals. She had cautiously followed him when he brought Crimson Garden, and after realizing that Crimson Garden didn't shy away from her, Bianca grew exceptionally fond of her. Thanks to this, Crouch recently thought Bianca was following Crimson Garden more than himself. It might be easier for you, Crim, rather than me. Becoming Bianca's most important person might be easier for Crimson Garden. While he was contemplating disguising himself as a crow, Crimson Garden looked at Crouch discontentedly. I told you not to call me C-R-I-M. But Bianca calls you that all the time. That child knows no other name, does she? Indeed, that's true. Besides that, I heard a carriage outside. Following that remark, Crouch nodded his head. It seemed like Darling had arrived. Elliot must be thrilled. Although he was his exclusive steward, Crouch felt proud as he left the room with Crimson Garden perched on his shoulder. Just then, the sound of urgent footsteps began echoing from the stairs. The owner of the footsteps was none other than Aeliad. Crush thought he must have already heard about the cure. Aelio. Mr. Crouch. Unusually interrupting himself, Aeliad shouted urgently. Seeing his pale face, Crouch tilted his head. Something about his reaction was off. What is it? What happened? Isn't Darling the one who came? Aeliad violently shook his head from side to side. Who else would be here to see him besides Darling? Just as Crouch noticed the unusually plentiful sweat beads on Aeliad's forehead. The words that followed made Crouch's body freeze up as well. The, the Lord has arrived. What? The Lord has come to Green Pine Mansion. And then a thunderbolt-like announcement burst forth. Crouch felt as though he had been struck by lightning, freezing on the spot. The Lord, who could that be? There was only one person in the world whom Aeliad would address as the Lord. The Sky High Four Emperors. The Martial Emperor. Balrock Balheim. Balheim himself had appeared at Green Pine Mansion. As Crouch began to lift his head to the realization slowly, he saw Aeliad's face, now gone beyond pale to outright ashen. Why would father come? Why had he come to Green Pine Mansion? The answer was simple. Crazy. A swear word that he had been trying to reduce in use inadvertently slipped from his lips. Because. It was Crouch who had told him to come. Could my mother have really passed that story on to my father? As Crouch felt a mild headache coming on, the crimson garden that had been perched on his shoulder fluttered down. Waddling off somewhere, it looked exactly like it was trying to escape. Well, it was a natural reaction, considering his father might see right through Crimson Garden's true identity. Where is the Lord? He has been led to the drawing room for now. Crouch adjusted his tie properly. He then made sure his attire was impeccable. There was nothing amiss to be caught on. After checking, Crouch looked at Aeliad. And Aeliad's head nodded in response. The tea and refreshments are done. There's no need for the Lord, he doesn't partake. Tell the maid not to bother going to the drawing room. Yes, understood. Leaving Aeliad behind, who faithfully followed his orders, Crouch proceeded. Naturally, the destination he was heading toward was the drawing room where Balrock would be. With every step, tension filled the air. Had it been in the past, Crouch might have already run away at this point, but now he stood in front of the drawing room. Somehow, the drawing room seemed much larger today. Knock, knock. Lord, it is Crouch Balheim. Enter. 
The moment Krash spoke, an immediate response came from inside. He must have sensed Krash's arrival long ago. Carefully grasping the doorknob, Krash pushed the door open. Then, underneath the lit drawing room, he saw a head of black hair identical to Krash's. Between the bangs that fell just above the forehead were a pair of eyes that seemed to swirl with the blue glint of stars, quietly staring at the table. Those eyes slowly lifted, and that alone caused a prickling sensation on Krash's skin. There were mountains there. Insurmountably distant mountains that could never be reached no matter how high one raised their head. In this moment, Krausch profoundly felt the meaning of the word overwhelming. An entity that surpassed the limits of a human to reach the realm of a demigod. Balrock Balheim. Krausch realized what it meant to be in front of him. And also how far his own trifling strength had yet to go. He's a monster, even on second glance. Krausch swallowed hard and composed himself. I greet the head of the Balheim family. This was the first time he had met him since returning to the past. Realizing his mouth was dry, Balrock spoke. Sit. At his word, Krausch promptly adjusted his posture and took a seat on the chair in front of him. Being able to sit directly across from the head of the family was a unique privilege of the direct descendants. But for Krausch, the least accustomed to this privilege, he struggled to maintain his gaze on Balrock as he began to speak. I heard it was your first time dealing with world erosion. How did Balrock, who was supposed to be in the Forbidden Zone, hear about his own presence in the world erosion? Whether it was his mother or someone else, Krausch immediately answered. Yes, I have recently returned from there. How was it? How was it, indeed? Krausch reassessed the vile nature of Berlokin, seized the opportunity to become an immortal, and for the first time ever, even stole a skill. From Krausch's perspective, it was a situation worthy of a victor's announcement. But what if he told this to Balrock? That he had lured his brother into a trap, exposing his true face before killing him, and then presenting the death as if it was a noble sacrifice. Additionally, he had stolen his skill and even allied himself with a world eroder. Krausch marveled at how a single act could be seen in such polarizing light depending on the beholder. To what extent Balrock could see through him was unknown to Krausch. After all, Balrock had ascended to demigod status and even opened his divine eye. So Krausch decided to speak his emotions honestly. It wasn't as frightening as I thought. Facing Berlokin's death, Krausch now thought it was really no big deal in retrospect. Berlokin, who had tormented him so terribly and been a symbol of fear, turned out to be nothing more than a felon crushed by the star called Charlotte. That's why when he saw him again, he wasn't particularly scared, if at all pitiful. Even deciding to kill him was not a hard choice to make. I see. Balrock replied very briefly. It is said that upon becoming a demigod, one distances oneself considerably from the emotions that entangle humans. Thus, he possessed an incredibly rigid expression despite not bearing a curse like Bianca's. That will do. And Balrock suddenly stood up. Seeing this, Krausch hurriedly rose to follow. Did you come to talk about this? Yes, that's all. I understand enough now. What exactly had he understood from their brief conversation? Krausch was baffled, but Balrock seemed to have already made his decision. I'm returning to the Forbidden Zone. He spoke of returning to the Forbidden Zone as casually as one might speak of going for a stroll. But Krausch couldn't very well obstruct the path of the head of the family. He could only bow as Balrock left. And then Balrock truly departed for the Forbidden Zone. It said he didn't even stop by the main house. Krausch wondered if this was really okay, but within the Balheim, no one dared to defy the Lord's will. With the feeling of a storm having passed, Krausch brushed back his bangs. Goodness, it feels as if my lifespan has suddenly shortened. As he stood there feeling perplexed about the purpose of this visit, a different carriage came into view from the window. Seeing the Danphelian crest on it, Krausch sighed belatedly. You should have arrived earlier. Despite himself, he found himself inwardly taking his frustrations out on the soon-to-arrive darling. Hello, hello. Darling, did you wait for me? Since when was I your darling? Darling made a big fuss upon arrival, to which Krausch responded with a slightly nauseated expression. 
Having just been through an encounter with Balrog, he was drained and lacked the energy to entertain Darling's jokes. You seem a bit out of it. Something happened? Darling noticed Krosh's state and inquired. Krosh saw no point in hiding it and exhaled deeply. The Lord has just been here. The Lord, the Lord? You don't mean the Martial Emperor, Balrock Balheim? You shouldn't just casually drop someone else's father's name. Yes, that's my father. Wow, that's amazing. I really wanted to meet him. I should have come earlier. She jumped up and down on the spot, feigning disappointment. Every jump made her hair and earrings sway, stealing his attention, but Crush simply shook his head. It's better not to meet. It would only cause heartache. And honestly, even Darling would struggle to maintain such an attitude in front of Balrock. The Empire may have two of the four great celestials, but in Starlon, there was only one, and that was Balrock, who was the idol to all and unreachable by anyone. Only Charlotte might one day be expected to match his status as a new star. So, kid, did you come here wondering if I might set you up to be the future lord of the Balheim family? As if. You know my sister Charlotte well, don't you? Because she's such a Charlotte fanatic. I know, but I don't think you're lacking either, kid. At the same time, Darling's eyes curved playfully. I'm just too curious to see how a fierce kid like you will stand up to Charlotte. Darling's bad habit was beginning to show. As her eyes, brimming with curiosity, sparkled, Crouch poked her in the ribs with his finger. Eek! Darling twisted her body more than expected, so Crouch remarked. Ads by Pub Future. Cut the nonsense. I never intended to be the Lord in the first place. If the world ends, being the Lord or anything else won't have any meaning. With that, Darling, clutching her side in a hunched posture, spoke. I didn't expect you to play so weak in that regard. But kid, you shouldn't poke people in the ribs so carelessly. There are many who are sensitive. As if I care. As Crouch snorted, Darling managed to catch her breath and straightened her posture. So about the thing I asked you for. As Crouch spoke, Darling grinned widely. She opened the bag she had brought with her and took out a small bottle. Inside was a medicinal pill, no bigger than a fingernail. Finished it. How about it? I'm kind of a genius, right? You've always been a genius. Darling made a playful remark, and Crush responded as if it were obvious. Caught off guard by his unexpected reaction, Darling hesitated, and Crush took the medicine from her hand. Meanwhile, Darling opened and closed her hand and then looked a little embarrassed. Hmm, I didn't expect to be openly called a genius like that. It's right to call a genius a genius. It suits you the best. Geniuses are familiar by name because they achieve the greatest results in their respective fields and make their names widely known. One might carelessly think they are many, but in reality, they are few. And Crouch had spent his time among the Skyborn generation filled with geniuses. Denying a genius would only diminish oneself. So Crouch acknowledged geniuses. Though now, he was in a position where he had to trample over those geniuses. It's quite charming to see this side of you. The more I get to know you, kid, the more attractive you become. Don't flirt with a child. A child wouldn't understand this kind of thing. As Darling cackled, Crouch made to leave and find Aeliad. But her next words stopped Crouch in his tracks. I've heard some news that Annex has changed recently. Crouch's head turned back. After his defeat by Charlotte, Annex reduced the intensity of his training. To be exact, he had lost the meaning behind his training. Having judged himself to be forever out of reach from Charlotte, no matter how hard he tried. However, Annex's perspective shifted somewhere within him after he saw Crouch, once overshadowed by Charlotte, spreading his wings at the Star Sanctuary. Nobody knew exactly what had changed. But the recent rumor was that Annex had increased the intensity of his training again. What a pointless move! Crouch showed his displeasure at such pointless actions by Annex. It was a natural response. After all, to Crouch, Annex was nothing but a traitor. It was contemptible. I don't know if he was influenced by me or not. Crouch was displeased with the idea. 
Got it. Now go. That's too much. I come all this way and you just send me off? You don't have much to do here anyway. I beg to differ. Crush frowned at the smiling darling. If she stayed, her playfulness would likely grow worse with each passing day. Should he warn her in advance? Such an interesting child. At that moment, Crouch was startled by a voice that resonated directly in his mind. This unfamiliar sensation occurred whenever Crimson Garden spoke in his head. Looking around, Crouch noticed Crimson Garden had perched near the window at some point. Earlier, when his father appeared, she had hastily fled, only to reappear now. She's born with the talent of an alchemical star. I thought Starlon had nothing interesting other than the Balheim, but it turns out they have some useful talent after all. Crouch saw Crimson Garden's crow eyes shimmering red, evidently seeing through Darling's talent. Fortuitously, this works out well. A satisfied expression crossed Crimson Garden's face. Ask that child to make an elixir. An elixir is a special medicine that can enhance physical abilities and aura when consumed. It was naturally a costly commodity, and only certain families had the secret of craftsmanship passed down through generations to create such a thing. To suddenly ask for something like that to be made. Even for Darling, an elixir wasn't something you could whip up easily like a breeze. I've fully grasped the formula, so don't worry. You just need a skilled alchemist. In that case, Crouch had no reason to object. In his life, elixirs were far beyond his reach. They were useless to a commoner like him, they weren't efficient and hence, were devoured by the desperate, leaving nothing behind. You're a mess, aren't you, child? Shouldn't we be pouring elixirs into you? Crouch could not disagree. On the first day he returned with Crimson Garden, Crouch had received his initial training from her. And during that training, Crimson Garden had something very simple to say to him. You're born with virtually nothing. Your swordsmanship's path is limited, your talent for aura is weak, and your body is slow. She had been incredulous, deeming it a miracle to be this untalented. With such a condition, you desperately tried to fill in the void with stubborn experience and secret techniques. But when geniuses amass their own experiences in another five years, you wouldn't be able to follow them. A returner who doesn't have anything couldn't possibly be this empty. Crouch wasn't a returner, but the rest rang true. Even Annex, who was easily subdued by Crouch at the Sanctuary of Stars, will surpass Crouch once he is over the age of 20. But that is... Ultimately. It's just a story about the innate talent you possess. Crimson Garden wouldn't have taken Crouch as a disciple if she only looked at his talent. If I am here, such talent means nothing. With your greedy skills, you can just steal away any talent you want. Crimson Garden slowly ascended to the sky. The crow flapping its wings seemed as though it could soar endlessly into the heavens. Having spent your life crawling on the ground, it is I who will make you fly. Just flap your wings fiercely. And place everything that flies above under you. At the very end. Crimson Garden spread its wings as if to hide even the moon above. Swallow even my immortality. That was what Crimson Garden said on the first day. Crouch realized it was something akin to a pledge from Crimson Garden. A pledge to take him as a disciple. It was such an elixir that Crimson Garden wanted to be made. Naturally, it would be of great help. Crouch had no reason to hesitate. Darling, then let's ask for something else. You ask for a lot, you know. I'm an expensive woman. I don't just serve anyone. I'd like you to make an elixir. Crouch said without batting an eye, even to Darling's joke. Hearing the word elixir, Darling tilted her head, then soon smiled faintly. Do you want to become stronger by taking an elixir? Did Annex training motivate you somehow? Annex is irrelevant. I have too many other things to worry about to be concerned about him. Crush's sights were set on a much more distant future. It's only what I need to at least get to the starting line. Darling looked at Crouch for a moment. She didn't know much about him. He appeared suddenly, offering to help with her research, and asked for a cure for an incurable disease. 
While she could understand such a request, as the news of her being a prodigy in alchemy had already spread far and wide, the title of prodigy was only applicable because she was still in her teens. As time passed, there might come a moment when she would become distanced from the term genius. And truthfully, most people thought that way. They had expectations but no belief in her. After all, they had seen too many so-called geniuses ultimately become ordinary in the course of their lives. But Crouch had never once doubted her genius. As if her genius were a given. How could he be so certain? Especially when he was soon to be 14 years old, a little kid. It's as if he has experienced the whole world, that's for certain. And this piqued Darling's peculiar interest. Initially, her interest was merely in the Balheim family's stubbornness that was the opposite of Charlotte's. But she began to be essentially curious about the person that was Crouch. Making an elixir can cost an exorbitant amount depending on the ingredients. Kid, are you sure you can afford it? What do you take the Balheim for? The Balheim may be impressive, but I've heard plenty about the kid's situation. It was doubtful to Darling whether the Balheim would support Crouch, known as the halfpenny of the Balheim, with such funds. Don't worry. I have a plan for that. Getting hold of money wasn't difficult. Even if he had blocked out rumors from outside, he couldn't ignore those that spread inside. Crouch was well aware of a few major incidents that had occurred within the Balheim. And he knew that those incidents would attract great sums of money. You're so confident, I'll trust you. So, what elixir do you want to make? That is. Crouch glanced at the window, and Crimson Garden began to speak. Convey exactly as I tell you. And Crouch relayed to Darling everything Crimson Garden said. Darling, who had been quietly listening, slowly started to look more serious. Because the elixir formula Crouch mentioned was something she had never considered. Ah, so, this could work? She puzzled over the formula in her head with a dumbfounded expression. Seeing her confused expression, Crouch, who was ignorant in alchemy, turned to Crimson Garden, wondering what he had relayed, but she merely shrugged her wings. Wow, how do you even know something like this, kid? It's a combination passed down in the Balheim. Crouch vaguely made an excuse. The Balheim truly has all kinds of stars. She believed it. Fortunately, Darling seemed convinced and Crouch looked at her, asking if it was possible. Her eyes sparkled in response. Okay. I'm bubbling with the desire to take on challenges. I want to make it. However, there are a few ingredients here that even I can't acquire. In particular, the white snow hot yang spore and golden dragon grass are beyond my reach. The white snow hot yang spore grows in the hardened hearts region, right? Yes, over there the mountains are treacherous, and world erosion is frequent, so distribution is poor, having few herb collectors. I can source that. After hearing that, Darling belatedly remembered his fiance. Ah, that's right. That should definitely be possible. But she soon hesitated, caught on another point. But you know about the golden dragon grass. It's an imperial item. Yeah, it's directly managed by the Empire. There are none for sale within the country. You might find some through a black market dealer, but getting caught by the Empire would be troublesome. It's not like there are other options. Crouch, who had considered searching through the black market, was poked in the cheek by Darling, who raised her finger. Turning to her with a what-are-you-doing look, she beamed back at him. I'll teach the kid an easy way to get some golden dragon grass. There's a way? The Empire will soon host two martial arts tournaments. One is for adults, and the other is for boys under 15. And the real objective of the Empire is the second tournament. The rewards there are better. Crouch understood what she meant immediately. You're saying to go and fight? If you make it into the top three, you can get golden dragon grass. How about it? Sounds doable, right? Doable my foot. Crouch knew why the Empire was hosting the tournament. The reason was simple. The Empire wanted to use this tournament to increase the pool of candidates for admittance into the Rahelm Academy. The Rahelm Academy, in name, is a place of harmony between the kingdoms and the Empire. 
but in reality, political power struggles always come first. Building a larger influence in the Rahel Academy by inserting more of their own graduates only amplifies their power. It's clear they're scheming to become patrons of the youth and secure influence in the Rahel Academy through the tournament. The kingdoms must be preparing something similar. But the empire isn't called an empire for nothing. They are promoting the tournament on such an enormous scale that even neighboring countries have heard the buzz. Have you forgotten? I am a Balheim. Participating in the imperial tournament will cause a ruckus. I remember that very well. But the empire has made it clear that participation is open to anyone regardless of who they are. Idiot. That's just for formality. Wine. You just called me a genius. Crouch sighed deeply, his head in his hands. Thinking about it, originally Darling was just responding to Crush's need for the elixir by suggesting a method to gather the ingredients. Knowing it was wrong to be angry with her, Crush turned to look at Darling. You suggest this, which means you have a method, right? Her eyes sparkled immediately. He he he, as expected, kid, I like how quick you catch on. Crush felt uneasy at Darling's sinister laughter. Yet, seeing no other way to obtain the golden dragon grass, he turned to her, and Darling quickly pulled out a potion from her bosom. It's called becoming a lady. Crash. Crouch immediately swung his fist and shattered the potion. He had no intention of humoring her tastes. So, what's the next step? As Crouch wore a chilling smile, Darling hurriedly wiped up the broken potion with a handkerchief. After clearing away the shattered pieces of the potion for becoming a woman, Darling presented another bottle to Crouch. This one is a different version of the transformation potion. The effect lasts for a week, and it's a special custom-made product that won't be detected by magic or doping tests. Considering what had been destroyed just moments ago, Crouch assumed this wouldn't be the same kind of potion. He examined the contents of the bottle he received. Is this for disguising my identity? You can just register as a commoner from the kingdom. It should have been this way from the start. By the way, I imagined this appearance when I thought of what your character would look like as a kid. Though Darling was spouting nonsense, Crouch took it in stride. It seemed the potion could be useful for the martial arts tournament. This works out well. He needed to absorb more of the power of world erosion to use his extreme blood poisoning technique. The lawless area between the kingdom and the empire, where world erosion was frequent, would be a good place to visit and absorb this power when time permitted. Above all, are you confident you can rank within the top three? Darling asked this with a subtle smile. Until recently, Crouch had been known as the halfpenny of the Balheim. Asking someone like him to place within the top three in a grand martial arts tournament held by the empire seemed preposterous. Of course, that was if Crouch had remained his former self. The participants in the martial arts tournament are all guys who haven't yet secured a spot at the Rahel Academy. Those who had already confirmed a place at Rahel Academy wouldn't need to participate, as they were preparing for the exams put forth by the academy. It was unfortunate that this meant there would be almost no one who had made a contract with a god among the contestants. After all, there aren't that many who have contracted with gods. It's just that the Balheim is exceptionally outstanding, in normal families, only about one in five have a contract with a god. Therefore, Crouch had even more reason to aim for the academy. Because that's where all the kids with skills are gathered. And most importantly, I'll be 14 years old when the tournament is held. The martial arts tournament in which Crouch would participate was for boys under 15 years of age. Crouch was still only 14. I won't lose to kids. Ads by Pub Future. No matter how talented they are, they can still be overcome by a gap in experience. After all, even Annex had been overpowered by Crouch. Apart from someone of Charlotte's talents, Crouch was confident he could beat anyone in the Skyborn generation. Well, I'm still technically a kid too, of course. But I'll soon turn 16. I'm not a child anymore. Lately, Darling had started applying slightly heavier eye makeup, asserting her adulthood with a twinkle in her eye. Crouch simply pitted the gesture. Only children like to think of themselves as grown-ups. In that sense, Darling was still a child. 
That's enough. Time for you to go. Ah, I was hoping to hang out more since I'm already here. You're almost an adult, shouldn't be mixing with kids. Are you taking advantage of that now? While Darling resisted leaving and Crouch urged her out, they argued back and forth. In the midst of their exchange, the door to the room crept open. As Crouch turned his head at the sound, Bianca stood there. She appeared to have just woken up, with one side of her hair slightly pressed down, and after a brief look at the two, she muttered to herself. An affair? Where had she learned such a term? Crouch quietly resolved to have a word with the chatty maidservant who had been by Bianca's side. On the Ballheim training grounds. Crouch stood still, sword in hand, opposite Crimson Garden. Though his eyes were closed, Crouch was sensing far more information through his body than through his eyes alone. The sixth sense he had honed through secret techniques. While still rudimentary in attainment, the quantity of information perceived was overwhelmingly more than before. Suddenly, Crouch felt a presence to his left. Shing. Without warning, his sword swiftly intercepted something at that spot. What appeared there was a blade of wind. Astoundingly, Crouch's sword had preemptively secured the spot even before the wind blade was formed. If the sword hadn't moved before the wind blade's appearance, it would have been unable to block it in the first place. Simultaneously, a sense of impending threat reached him from his waist. Crouch's sword once again preemptively filled the gap, nullifying the wind blade. The movement was almost akin to precognition. Ching, 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 ching and it continued in succession. Crush's sword repeatedly occupied the space faster than the wind blades could manifest. However, Crush was enduring a state worse than when he would have been struck by the attack. His breathing was erratic, and his arms were shaking more violently than ever before. The sweat dripping from his entire body seemed to be leading him swiftly toward exhaustion. That's enough. Crimson Garden's voice rang out just as the wind blades ceased. Cough. Crush gasped for air and tumbled to the ground. Gasp, gasp, gasp. Desperately trying to supply his lungs with oxygen, Crush opened his mouth as wide as he could. Watching him struggle, Crimson Garden let out a faint chuckle. Is this the sixth sense you spoke of? Interesting. The experiences you've accumulated thus far have combined with your swordsmanship to create something quite fascinating. What Crouch had just demonstrated was elevating his sixth sense to its limits to read his opponent's intent in advance and counter with the realm of blunt swordsmanship. Originally a sword technique even geniuses would find difficult to wield, Crimson Garden had noticed that Crouch, through the course of his training, was surprisingly well suited to the blunt sword. The prerequisites for the blunt sword are twofold, first, have no fear, and second, perfectly grasp the opponent's intent. Those two things are even more crucial than the sword technique itself. And that's the domain that can only be built upon with experience, not talent. Crimson Garden chuckled and casually poked Crush's head with her foot. You are remarkably exceptional in that regard. Your innate intuition for understanding your opponent's intentions, when combined with the sixth sense, is producing something akin to precognition. The only thing Crouch was born with was his sharp intuition. The endless experience of grappling with world erosion alongside the Skyborne generation. Plus the sixth sense he had recently mastered. It was the merging of these three elements that allowed Crouch to barely enter the threshold of blunt swordsmanship. It was indeed a tremendous skill, but Crouch faced one glaring problem. But my body is in terrible shape. What's the use of being able to foresee every attack? My physique simply can't keep up. The essence of blunt swordsmanship is to anticipate and control the opponent's moves, to the point of achieving spatial domination. To the opponent, it might seem slow, but the blunt sword systematically overtakes all the opponent's intentions. In the end, the opponent can only watch powerlessly as the sword tightens its approach. That is blunt swordsmanship. However, all of this is meaningless if you cannot actually block the attacks. As proof, Crouch found himself in this pitiful state from using excessive muscle to block the wind blades. His foresight wasn't matched by his body's capability. This must be the gap that talent creates. Crouch was born with little to no physical prowess. 
At least the Balheim bloodline granted him a sturdier body and slightly better recovery capabilities than average. But even that was on a common level, something geniuses would naturally already possess. Disastrous. Crimson Garden briefly commented, and Crouch, trembling arms and all, raised his head. One more time. You just don't know when to quit, do you? Crouch's fierce blue eyes sparkled vividly. With his experience, secret techniques, skills, and even the addition of world erosion, this was all he could achieve. If it were others, they would likely recognize their limits at this point and break down, but Crouch's will remain unyielding. Watching this, Crimson Garden couldn't help but let slip an impressed laugh. That's why I took you on as my disciple. She may have begun as a contract teacher, promising to grant him immortality. But increasingly, Crimson Garden was growing fond of Crouch. To her, talent was entirely meaningless. All she needed was a fierce heart capable of enduring her training. With that alone, she could make Crouch the strongest. But that's enough for today. What? Didn't you say so yourself? You have to leave today for the martial arts tournament to keep on schedule. Upon hearing that the training would be concluding, Crouch, whose face had sourly contorted, quickly snapped back to reality. Indeed, today was the departure day, just as she had said. Training is important, but to me, an elixir comes first for you. There's nothing like it for transforming your pathetic body into something human. Hearing that, Crouch had no choice but to rise from his spot. His legs and arms were still shaking, but he toughed it out. Damn, I need to get ready quickly. Realizing he had spent too much time in training, Crouch hastened his pace. He quickly got dressed and washed up, then went to the prepared carriage. Lord Crouch. At that moment, Crouch found himself facing Alloyd, who was waiting in front of the carriage. The day darling brought the color changing potion. Crouch immediately passed it on to Alloyd. Initially puzzled, Alloyd realized it was the cure for his daughter's color changing disease and took leave to visit her. And the next day, Alloyd came to find Crouch, knelt before him, and with tears streaming down, expressed his gratitude. He who had cherished his daughter so dearly that he contemplated betraying his master to save her was now so fulfilled by her recovery that he could die without regrets. Don't die. And to him, Crouch had said, I saved your daughter's life. Alloyd, you are not to die until I allow it. That much I can demand as payment, right? Once he heard what followed, Alloyd bowed his head before Crouch. He deeply engraved in his heart who must be his master for the rest of his life. That settles it. Crouch felt that he could now forget the day from his past when Alloyd died by poison. He had cured Alloyd's daughter not just for the man's sake, but also because he wanted to erase a scene from his own memories. Just the disappearance of his life's first betrayal made Crouch feel much more at ease. While I'm gone, take good care of the Green Pine Pavilion. Yes, I will ensure that no one enters, even if it is the Lord himself. Hearing his firm promise, Crouch allowed himself a wry smile. That was enough in terms of loyalty. Leaving Alloyd behind, Crouch approached the carriage. There, in front of the carriage, Crouch faced a familiar figure. The white-haired girl. Bianca Hardenhearts. She stood primly, holding a single bag in her hand. Lord Crouch. As always, she called his name in a regulated tone. The reason she held a bag today was simple. She was returning to Hardenhearts. Her return to Hardenhearts was at the behest of Crouch. She was to procure one of the two ingredients Darling had mentioned, the white snow hot yang spore. Given her status, she would likely be able to acquire it without much trouble. You rarely go home, so feel free to take a good rest there if you want. After all, his own return wouldn't happen anytime soon. Yet Bianca shook her head. I'll be back soon. Back soon. To her, the Green Pine Pavilion had also become her home. Noticing the meaning behind her words, Crouch couldn't help but let out a wry laugh. Her treatment in hardened hearts wasn't very good. Being cursed lowered her value as a noble. And then there was himself, a Balheim, worth the least due to lacking talent. In a way, Green Pine Pavilion might be the one place where Bianca could truly relax, just as much as Crouch could. 
Crouch raised his hand and stroked Bianca's head once. Her pure white hair followed the movement of his hand, feeling gratifying to the touch. I'll also come back soon. Unaware that he had recently become soft only towards Bianca, Crouch made that remark. In the meantime, Bianca opened her bag. Out came a lunchbox. Wandering around yesterday, and you prepared this? Who said to make it? Eli did. That figured. It seemed Bianca's personal maid, Eli, had been chattering to her about something. He had told her to be tight-lipped, to no avail it seemed. I'll enjoy it. Despite the circumstances, Crouch accepted it because it was made by Bianca. And it was timely, given his hunger from training. Have a safe trip. Bianca's departure was scheduled after Crouch's. Looking at her seeing him off, Crouch said he would return and boarded the carriage. As the carriage started to rumble and move, Crouch peered through the window at Bianca standing quietly. I suppose I won't be seeing that face every day for a while. Looking so forlorn. You like that child that much, do you? At that moment, Crimson Garden appeared by the window and quipped. It's like having a sibling I never had. I guess that's why I'm just uneasy. It wasn't the same as before, the relationship with Bianca had gotten better. And there was quite a bit of personal guilt. Tisk, TSK, to call your fiancé a little sister just to see how you would address her after having a child of your own. If you spout nonsense, I'll pluck every feather you have. Giggle, as if you could catch me. Crimson Garden preened, deliberately looking defenseless, and Crouch could only click his tongue in response. Instead, he opened the lunchbox. Inside were sandwiches and a colorful salad. Typical of Bianca, it felt efficiently packed with practical items. How nice! After taking a bite of the sandwich, Crouch remembered Bianca's fondness for sweets. On the way back from the Empire, he should buy some Imperial-style chocolate for her. In the border wall village of the Starlon Kingdom. Stepping out of the carriage, Crouch faced a situation that was a bit irksome. Scram, kid. Don't get in the way and bring bad luck. The issue at hand was an argument he was having with someone who was supposed to guide him stealthily over the ramparts. No, I'm telling you I'll pay you? The situation was absurd for Crouch too. The person who was supposed to introduce him to a broker was refusing to guide him just because he was a kid, even though Crouch was offering money. Ah, kid. Do you have any idea what lies beyond the ramparts? The man now looked at Crouch as if he were fed up. The official road between the Empire and the Starlon Kingdom is safe because it's regularly cleared of world erosion. That much was common knowledge. Official roads are what most travelers and merchants use. In contrast, those using back paths like this are mostly people needing to hide their identity or criminals. But on the unofficial paths, world erosion grows wild. Brokers guide people through paths that avoid it as much as possible. He said so while glaring at Crouch. Thing is, world erosion can terrify even the most courageous people, you know? World erosion naturally elicits a sense of rejection in people. It was akin to a survival instinct. Our bodies are deeply engraved with a warning not to venture into dangerous places. Even grown adults can get scared in such a situation. What do you think will happen if a kid like you panics? The brokers guiding you would be risking their lives too. Crouch listened and couldn't deny what was being said. No matter how much money was offered, it wasn't worth the risk for them. So it comes down to my appearance. It's great being young again. He was trained well, and there was no curse. But this appearance caused inconvenient situations time after time. It seems you want to participate in the Empire's martial arts tournament. Whatever the reason, you should use the official road. Don't you see? I came here because I can't use the official road. So what? I have no plans to guide you, so you do whatever you have to. With those words, the man turned sharply and walked away. Ads by Pub Future. Crouch watched him go, barely restraining himself from punching the man. Damn it, me, who has been to the Forbidden Regions, is getting this treatment. He had not expected his regression to have such drawbacks. What are you going to do? 
Crimson Garden, who had just watched without offering help, asked. Apparently, she found the situation amusing. Crimson Garden, don't you have some sort of spell? Maybe something that could instantly turn me into an adult? Do you think such things exist? Though it might be possible if you pulled a human skin over your own. She casually mentioned a horrific idea. Sensing anew that she was a being of world erosion, Crouch held his forehead with his hand. Hey, kid. While Crouch was pondering what to do, a voice called out to him. Turning his head towards the voice, he saw a woman in her mid-twenties with short hair standing there. She looked at Crouch and gave a broad smile. Do you want to get outside the ramparts? Yes. Crouch replied tersely, and the woman crouched down. Despite it being winter, she wore just a thin t-shirt under her coat, revealing her front cleavage obviously. If that's the case, maybe I can help you out a little? Are you a broker? Not a broker, but a merchant selling goods. Crouch listened, and soon after, realized what she meant. You're planning to conceal me among the goods. Right, the brokers won't check the goods. Most things transported from here fall under that category. It wasn't a bad proposition. What's your price? Ten times what you would pay a broker. She immediately proposed an outrageous fee. Truly a merchant's response. She had likely thrown out a high price, expecting Crouch to haggle. But Crouch had a different idea. I'll just give you the amount that goes to a broker. Cheeky, if I don't take you, you won't be able to get out beyond the ramparts. I'll take on the role of your escort instead. Hearing that, she blinked in surprise. Then, covering her mouth, she burst into laughter. Do you think too highly of your own skills, kid? Crouch rummaged through his pocket. He didn't want to use it, given the hassle, but the situation called for it. In a moment, the woman's eyes were drawn to Crush's hand. In his hand was a badge embossed with Valheim's emblem. The emblem of Balheim, known to all living in Starlon. Proof of which was how the woman's body stiffened. But the true reason for her reaction was not the emblem itself but the faint blue light emanating from it. It was a light heard of by all inhabitants of Starlon at least once. Especially by those criminals upon whom the Balheim's blade might fall at any moment, who knew it even more precisely. The blue light that appeared only when wielded by a direct Balheim descendant. That was the special identification of Balheim. W.H. Watt? As she uttered her confusion, Crouch had already covered her mouth with his hand. While pressing down her mouth and filling her view with Balheim's emblem, Crouch slightly pulled back his hood and revealed his blue eyes. The blue eyes and black hair characteristic of the Balheim bloodline even further convinced the woman. You've caught on now, haven't you? Her face turned pale as she nodded vigorously. From the moment Crouch covered her mouth, she was overwhelmed by his presence and couldn't move a muscle. Feel free to tell others if you want. But it won't benefit you. They won't believe you anyway. There's no reason for a Balheim to use unofficial roads instead of official ones. Crouch removed his hand from her mouth, and she quickly turned around, her expression anxious. Lou, let's go. From the moment she saw Crouch's Balheim emblem, his prowess was presumed. Specifically, she wasn't even hoping for his role as an escort. She must have thought it was safer to just get paid and transport Crouch than to risk getting involved in something dangerous. I like how businesslike she is. She was sharp-witted, leading to easy communication. Following the woman, Crouch soon arrived at a large carriage. The carriage was covered with a black cloth and had bars on it. And inside were beings known as erosion species. She seemed to be a merchant who illegally captured and sold erosion species. If hidden among the erosion species, the brokers wouldn't see him. The creatures were all asleep due to a sleeping spell, so there would be no danger. Once the broker's guidance is complete, let me know. Crouch fished out some money and flicked it over to her for the broker. The woman quickly took the money and opened the barred door. Go on in. Crouch walked into the interior, and the woman locked the barred door behind him before covering it again. In the meantime, Crouch settled down and plunked himself onto a seat. Crimson Garden landed on the carriage floor. 
There are some rare ones here. They have to be to fetch a price. Crouch looked at the erosion creatures with a distaste. The ones here were all capable of inducing hallucinations and auditory illusions, commonly known as drug-related erosion species. Senseless creatures. Looking at those who sought pleasure using drug-related erosion species, Crouch thought with a lack of understanding and leaned against the wall. In the meanwhile, the carriage began to rumble and move. From the feeling of his body shifting towards the interior, it seemed they were descending underground probably taking a back route beneath the ramparts. As Crouch silently waited, several hours passed by. Sounds of talking came from outside, and shortly after, footsteps approached. Clank. Soon after, the sound of an iron door opening resonated. As Crouch stepped out, the merchant woman from before was standing there. Where's the broker? He's gone back. His guidance only goes up to here a way of saying it was now up to Crouch to manage on his own. Crouch lightly descended from the carriage and soon, the emerald-tinted sky came into view. Unlike Starlon, the sky was transformed due to the influence of world erosion. For Crouch, this strangely altered sky was not new. And that sky was proof that they were now outside the national border. As long as it's not red, there's nothing to worry about. Crouch averted his gaze from the sky and turned to look at the merchant woman. Well then, where are you headed? By the way, I'm going to the Empire. Crouch said so with a smile. Catching the implication of his smile, the woman replied with a tentative expression. I, I am also headed to the Empire. It wasn't Crouch's concern where her destination was. Once Crouch stated he was heading to the Empire, her destination had to be the Empire too. Good. Let's get going. With that, Crouch walked towards the front of the carriage. The woman, left with little choice, hesitantly took her seat beside him. As she started to drive the carriage, Crouch surveyed the surroundings. Besides the erosion species, it seemed they were the only ones present. Aren't you going to hire some other escorts? Ah, no, I do a bit of erosion hunting myself. I have quite some skill, you know. I can handle up to two-star world erosion. Indeed, she appeared to be skilled. From a simple perspective of expertise, she might even be comparable to him. Actually, beyond three stars, it's easier to just run away, and hiring people costs more. So I travel alone. The problem is, the madmen living outside the ramparts, the bandits, are not a rare sight, you know? Understanding her point, Crouch accepted it as such. By the way, what's your name, Lord Balheim? Suddenly, as if to alleviate boredom, she threw out the question. Crouch chuckled at the woman's curiosity. What good does sharing names do at this point? All right. Let's not introduce ourselves then. Off we go. She was clearly not keen on attracting any unnecessary attention and urged the carriage forward. Thanks to that, Crouch enjoyed a comfortable journey and leaned back in his seat. I hope we encounter some world erosion on the way. Ironically, the merchant woman was hoping for the exact opposite. Clop clop, clop clop. It had been eleven days since their journey outside the border began. The merchant woman, seasoned in this kind of work, skillfully chose paths free of world erosion. As a result, Crouch, with advice from Crimson Garden, spent his time solely focusing on honing his aura. Although he had allocated plenty of time to reach the Empire, there wasn't enough leeway to go out of his way to seek world erosion unless it occurred naturally on the way. I'll just handle it on the return trip. With that thought, Crouch trained leisurely, not minding the schedule. Meanwhile, night had fallen without them noticing. While Crouch was wrapping himself with a blanket the merchant woman offered, she attached a bell to the end of the carriage. A bell that would ring immediately if something approached. How much further do we have? About five days left if things continue this smoothly. It's been quiet without any world erosion. Maybe it's all thanks to having Lord Balheim here? The merchant woman teased him with a playful twinkle in her eye. For the past ten days, she had been somewhat wary of Crouch. But having sensed his character, she realized he was much more generous than she expected. Lucky you, being born in Balheim. It's like you own the world. 
So, she started conversations like this. Is the world that small? I wasn't aware it was so confined. Maybe you're just too young to feel it now? Ordinary citizens worry about making ends meet every day. You don't have such concerns, being from Balheim. That was surely true. But there is a clear difference between nobility and common citizens. Yes, nobles don't have those anxieties. But just like you don't know about us, you don't really understand the nobles either. Krosh gazed across the lawless expanse outside. The state born out of facing and overcoming world erosion, and what has been established there was a nation. And it was the nobility that maintained it. Many people forget this fact. Including the nobles themselves. This is because there are quite a few nobles who neglect their duties and engage in trashy behavior. Peace makes power struggles possible, I guess. At the breaking point of peace, the first to die are those who pursued power alone. He he, really? Wish I could be noble too. Maybe I'll book a reservation for marriage with Lord Balheim in advance? What a thing for a mid-twenty-something woman to say. I have a fiancé. Really? Your fiancé must be incredibly cute. Cute? Krosh thought of Bianca for a moment. He knew she would grow up to be a stunningly attractive woman. In fact, he had been ensnared in bothersome situations before due to men bewitched by her appearance, just because he was her fiancé. Her looks were superior to most, indeed. If you mean cute, then. Perhaps her clingy ways, reminiscent of a chick, could be considered cute. Maybe so. Phew, contrary to your appearance, you seem mature, yet you also have a childish side. You haven't experienced love, have you? Sorry to disappoint, but I have. With those words, Krausch stood up, setting the blanket aside. It was a love that ended the moment it tried to begin. Krausch's gaze wandered outside. Just as the merchant woman began to wonder about his words, overhead, Crimson Garden let out a shrill caw. It seems it's time to work. Oh no. ting a -ling. Simultaneously, the bell the woman had set up began to ring. Realizing something was approaching, the merchant woman drew her weapon and stood up. Beyond the pitch-black forest, shapes like black fluid turned into humans crept closer. The problem was that there wasn't just one or two of them. Typical for a lawless area. One of the consequences of killing the owners of world erosion without properly cleansing it was the blackened humans. Ignis. From Krush's sword, which he harshly struck against the floor of the carriage, sprang forth bluish flames. Given that Ignis was the flame of a higher deity, it also possessed the power of purification. Which means. Swish. The sliced black humans were engulfed in flames and melted away instantaneously. It means they're extremely vulnerable to it. Without hesitation, Krosh began to move deftly through the black humans. The merchant woman quickly grabbed a staff and began smashing the black humans, seemingly handling herself just fine. Crimson Garden. However, with this number of black humans around, there must have been an unpurified source of world erosion nearby. It's 300 meters in a straight line. That wasn't too far away. Hey, I'm going to irradiate the source of world erosion creating the black humans. Hold them off till then. Okay. Please take care of it. Krausch immediately drew Aura under his feet. Then he kicked off the ground with explosive force. As Krausch ran, the number of black humans increased. But against Krausch's Ignis, they could do little. He swiftly reached the heart of the forest, and his eyes caught sight of a clump of world erosion. The sight of the black liquid, intermingled with the trees, spurting gas intermittently was obviously that of unpurified world erosion. Shall we absorb it? Crimson Garden, following behind, perched on a tree branch and asked. Yes, good timing for it to appear. Without any hesitation, Krausch extended his hand towards the world erosion. Then, a black energy began to flow up into Krausch's hand. Inside Krush's body was already present a world erosion attributed to the extreme blood poisoning technique. Since there was no particular resistance to the absorption, Krush let out a breath of air. Thankfully, due to his sixth sense, no madness ensued. 
With this, no more black humans would be created. That was how Crouch made his return. Crouch. Crouch halted his steps at the call of Crimson Garden. Between the trees, a few people were seen accompanying the merchant woman. They were surrounding her, and she was brandishing her staff threateningly. Get lost before I mess up my carriage by laying your filthy hands on it. We're all friends passing through the lawless zone, aren't we? Helping each other out. Yeah, and while you're at it, how about playing the part of my woman beneath the sheets too? He he. They were clearly bandits. Ads by Pub Future. But not average ones. For them to roam freely in the lawless zone meant there must have been at least one skilled fighter among them. This'll work out well. Meanwhile, Crimson Garden let out a chilly laugh. As an exercise for the blunt sword technique, they're just perfect. Crouch, thinking he had chosen a good master, cracked his neck, preparing himself. I agree. Let's get a proper warm-up before heading to the martial arts tournament. The band of outlaws that typically preyed on carriages passing through the lawless zone numbered a total of eight. Among them, the leader oral eyed the merchant woman and swallowed his salivation. Women were a rarity in the lawless zone, and he had been starved of female company for a while. This one seemed like a delectable meal. Hey, I'm up first, guys. Typical, boss. Always so greedy. Don't go hogging her. As if it's any of your concern, you fools. He swung a huge axe with ease, demonstrating his formidable strength. The merchant woman, noticing this, seemed tense. The bell warning approached, distracted by the black humans, had been her mistake. Now the band had approached this close while they were unprepared. She could have dealt with the other bandits, but with the leader Oral there as well, it would be too much for her to handle alone. Thud. It was at that moment that echoing footsteps resounded. The merchant woman recognized the identity of those steps and her face brightened. The bandits, noticing her reaction, belatedly looked behind. Ha! Huh? A kid? There stood a boy on his own. In the moment one bandit registered his confusion. Thunk! A sword flying in a straight line impaled his head. Instant silence surrounded them as none had expected the young boy to throw a sword and kill a bandit. Damn it, an enemy! Kill him! Oral reacted quickly, befitting a leader. He realized the boy was no ordinary person. Opportunely, the boy had thrown his sword and was unarmed. Seizing the chance, two bandits charged at him. But the boy showed no sign of fear, merely lifting his hands. In an instant, the sword he had thrown earlier was back in his grasp. Thought I was weaponless? The sudden presence of the sword startled the bandit. And in that moment of confusion, the boy's sword stabbed precisely into the bandit's neck. The efficiency of his movements was too much for an average bandit to handle. Immediately after, the boy swung his sword at the jaw of another bandit charging from the side. The bandit, struck by the blow, convulsed as his brain rattled, sticking out his tongue before collapsing to the ground. The boy mercilessly drove his sword through the bandit's head. Swoosh! The trees swayed gently with the blowing wind. An unpleasant tension spread among the remaining bandits. Suddenly appearing out of nowhere, three men were slain in an instant by the boy. The mood had turned on its head solely due to that. I'll take the front. You guys, secure the woman properly. In the end, the leader Oral slowly stepped forward. His muscular build was so great compared to the boy, the outcome of the fight seemed predictably clear. But Oral did not underestimate the boy. His instincts were telling him that the boy was not to be trifled with. You think you can handle it? Crouch looked at him, casting off the blood from his sword, nonchalantly. It's gonna be tough for you alone. Ha ha. Oral let out a boisterous laugh. I could crush a runt like you with my head. Great, let's see whose head gets crushed first. The moment Crouch said that, Oral was first to stomp the ground. Thud thud thud. The rumble of his large frame reverberated across the entire field. Charging like a wild buffalo, Oral coated his axe with a red aura. The smoky aura undulating around the axe showcased that he was an expert-level fighter. 
utilizing the momentum of his charge, Oral swung the axe at Crush's waist. Shing! In that moment, Crush's sword filled the space and thwarted the axe's course. But Oral had greater physical strength due to his size, so Crush's body was pushed aside, slightly lifted off the ground. Oral's eyes glinted. Based on Crush's previous show of strength against the other bandits, his prowess seemed not so formidable. Moreover, his aura seemed a tad weaker than Oral's. The guys earlier were caught off guard by his appearance. They wouldn't have been defeated so easily otherwise. Oral's axe split the air, clashing repeatedly with Crouch. Bang, bang. Amidst the consecutive attacks, Oral was certain. He was the stronger one. Moreover, the boy's sword was slow. So slow, in fact, Oral wondered how it managed to block his axe. Where did all that big talk go from before? Oral spewed out threats as he swung his axe wildly. Crouch seemed to have no time to respond and just continued to block the axe. Hoof. Oral thought he needed to finish this quickly. He didn't particularly enjoy tormenting the weak unless it was a woman. His plan was to end this fast so he could enjoy his delicious prize. His axe began to swing even more ferociously. The noise produced as the sword and axe met was enough to deafen. And so, one minute passed. Five minutes. Ten minutes. Huff, who? Oral's heavy breathing resounded. He was still swinging his axe. It had been his intention to finish it with the next strike for what felt like the hundredth time. Yet Crouch remained unscathed, while Oral grew increasingly exhausted. What's going on? Crouch's sword movements were so obviously slow to the eye. It indicated a lack of force and aura behind them. Indeed, each time Crouch clashed with the axe, his figure wobbled. Nonetheless, whenever Oral swung again, Crouch's sword was suddenly there in position. At this rate, it was almost as though Oral was intentionally swinging his axe towards Crouch's sword. No, could that actually be the case? Was he truly swinging at the sword all along? Confusion began to mix within his mind. Are you done? Startled. Beneath the dark night sky, Crush's blue eyes shone chillingly. His tone wasn't any different from the start. Oral swallowed his breath, then gripped his axe till his hand nearly burst. Ha, ha, whatever tricks you're playing, they're over now. He forced a semblance of ease as he shouted. Seeing this, Crouch lightly flashed a smile. Fortunately, thanks to you, I seem to be getting the hang of it, even without my sixth sense. Twitch. The leader's thick eyebrows moved. It was as if Crouch was toying with him. Feeling a major blow to his pride, Oral took a deep breath. He hadn't intended to use that technique against a kid, but if he kept falling for the boy's strange swordsmanship, he felt he might go insane first. Thump! Without signaling, Oral stomped the ground once again. Crouch, with his sword hanging loosely, waited yet again for his attack. Although it felt like willingly putting his head into a snake's mouth, Oral suppressed his growing fear. Instead, he gathered his aura more fiercely than ever on his axe. But once more, Crouch's languid sword was there to meet his swinging axe. Got you! Oral's eyes flashed. At that moment, his axe made a peculiar move. The axe, that was previously aiming for Crush's sword, left behind only traces of aura and veered toward Crush's side. Welcoming Hammer Axe It was his ultimate secret technique. He would surely split Crouch in two halves right then. Oral smiled, anticipating the blood spray that would soon burst. Shying a harsh metallic clang echoed across the plains as metal clashed with metal. Blink. Oral's eyes shut and opened again. He couldn't comprehend what had just happened. He felt metal, not flesh, against his axe. Hey. Crush's voice resonated lowly. Where did you learn that? Across from the axe and sword, a glint poured out from his blue eyes. Guck. Upon seeing that, Oral's body shriveled up. He felt like a small animal cornered by a fearsome predator. Crouch was frowning because he recognized the dishonorable technique used, it was one from a certain kind of person. Was it around this time that he escaped the empire? Not long ago, 
the empire was shaken by a mass murder. The incident occurred because of a man who had massacred an entire village on his own. Because of him, the empire had dispatched a night order, but the slaughterer had crossed the empire's border and eventually escaped. Krosh wouldn't normally concern himself with such matters, assuming the empire would have handled it. But the real issue lay elsewhere. He had become a servant under the influence of world erosion. Just like Bianca during her possession, this man had become a servant of world erosion too. Berserker Berkman What he typically utilized was precisely this welcoming hammer axe. Are you one of Berserker Berkman's underlings? Oral's face hardened. It barely mattered whether this man was an underling of Berserker Berkman. The real issue was that Berkman would eventually go into hiding in the Starlon Kingdom. And then, he was caught by Charlotte. The only reason why Crouch, who didn't care about the outside information, remembered this was because of Charlotte. Berkman's death was a pivotal moment for Charlotte, as it was when she became known across the Empire. At the age of 16, her solitary overpowering and defeat of a world erosion being servant were enough for her tale to be discussed as a heroic saga. That's enough. The flow has been disrupted. In that moment, Krush's sword moved. Ha! Huh? As Oro registered confusion, his large frame slowly collapsed. Looking down at his decapitated form rolling on the ground, Krush moved on with heavy steps. After all, Berkman was destined to be slain by Charlotte. There was no need to worry about his underlings. Bob Alhaim. The merchant woman, who had been locked in struggle with the remaining four bandits, tearfully called out to Crouch. Seeing this, Crouch clicked his tongue and flared up Ignis on his sword. Time to finish this quickly and catch some sleep. Rattle, rattle. Five days later. Crouch, too, today, as always, looked up from the diligently trotting horses. And that's when the walls of the empire began to loom into view. We're almost there. Indeed. Reacting to the merchant woman's comment, Crouch raised his hand to shield his eyes from the blinding sunshine. The capital of the empire was located at a latitude similar to Starlin's Hayden Hearts. As a result, the closer they got to the imperial capital, the colder the air became. Even so, we still have quite a distance before reaching the capital of the empire itself. But it was important to acknowledge they had at least entered the empire. Phew, tomorrow's the end of this year already. Luckily, I'll be spending New Year's with some company. Guess that means you'll be with drug addicts. Did you know? They say sex under the influence of drug species is out of this world. I'll be 14 years old tomorrow. It's sexual harassment of a minor. Ah, but you know, nobles are debauched, so they do it all young. What on earth goes on inside her head? True to the rough life she's led, she would often make bold and unruly remarks. Ah, perhaps you're not familiar with this sort of thing, Lord Balheim. What do you say? Should your sister enlighten you as a New Year's treat? Since it's your first time, we can do it without protection. I think slicing that mouth of yours might also be a fine option. Ah, are you worried that I might end up taking a Balheim Lord's baby with me in the future? Hee <laughs> hee, just give me one manner, and I'll overlook everything. Krosh decided it was best to keep silent. I think I'll report you for sexual harassment before drug dealing. Kakak, come to think of it, I haven't tried that route yet. Shall we go soon? Perhaps because she could see the end of their journey, the merchant woman was driving the carriage with excitement. Thanks to her, they quickly approached the walls of the empire. Stay inside for now. There was nothing good about being caught by an imperial broker while bringing a kid. So, Crouch opened the barred door and flopped down among the sleeping drug erosion creatures. Ads by Pub Future After a short while, the sound of the merchant woman gabbing with someone could be heard, and the cart jolted as it moved again. Several hours passed like this. As Crouch waited quietly, the carriage eventually came to a halt. The blackout curtain was drawn open shortly after, and the sound of the barred door opening reached his ears. Tada, we're here. She announced with a sense of pride. As Crouch walked out, his eyes fell upon the inns and streets of the Empire. Judging by the proximity to the walls, it seemed to be a city near the border wall. 
Looks like he had entered safely. Thanks for your efforts. Heh, you even saved us from that band of thieves on the way. It was nothing. Are you leaving right away? That's the plan. He intended to find another carriage and head straight for the capital. Witnessing Crouch prepared to depart, the merchant woman wore a look of regret. Nevertheless, it seemed she had grown somewhat attached after their 15-day journey together. My name is Crouch Balheim. So, Crouch revealed his own name to her. At the sound of his name, the merchant woman's eyes widened, then shortly after, she beamed with a bright smile. I'm Lara. Farewell. If you ever feel lonely when you're all grown up, come and find me. Crouch sir will always be welcome. Indulging in such remarks till the end. Still, there might come a day when fate would bring them back together. Crouch waved to her and moved on. It's been a long time, Empire. Meanwhile, Crimson Garden perched upon Crush's shoulder. Didn't you plant quite a few seeds in the Empire? One is prepping for the Academy, and another is in the Royal Palace. I'm not too familiar with these border areas, though. Did this creature have seeds in the Academy too? H-U-H-U, by the time you arrive, she'll be your senior. After all, if one were to enroll now, they'd be a year ahead of him. So who is it? Wouldn't searching for them be part of the fun later on? With that, she soared up into the sky. Really, she's a being with a penchant for amusement. I have one year ahead. Crouch lifted his gaze towards the sky. Maybe because it was winter, the sky felt incredibly high. It's not far now. Feeling the impending confrontation with the Sky Age, Crouch set out to inquire about a carriage. Fortunately, it wasn't hard to find one bound for the capital. The empire was vast, and perhaps owing to that, Crouch had to endure nearly a month-long grueling carriage journey. This isn't exactly easy. Maybe it was because during the Sky Age, he primarily used spatial magic. He was simply not adjusting to the carriage. Oh, Crad, practicing your swordsmanship again today? Yes, daily practice is a must. Haha, <laughs> hope you come out on top in the martial arts tournament. Thanks to the extended journey, Crouch had become pretty close with the coachman. By the pseudonym he was temporarily using, the coachman chuckled heartily. We'll arrive by evening. Just in time for the martial arts tournament. Upon hearing the coachman's words, Crouch lightly dabbed at his brow to wipe the sweat. The end of the carriage trip was a relief, although the thought of the return journey was already giving him a headache. Maybe I just won't go back? For a moment, the carriage trip was so tiresome that he seriously considered that option. But he had promised that chick he would return, so not returning wasn't an option. And so, as the carriage set off once more. That evening, Crouch arrived in Shiran, the capital of the empire. Regarded as potentially the wealthiest and most advanced city in the world. Having reached his destination, Crouch gave his back a light stretch. Unlucky. Perhaps due to a lack of fond memories associated with the empire. Crouch started with a gruff remark. Then he immediately set off walking. Even though it was the evening, the martial arts tournament registration was presumably still open. Since the deadline to enter was tomorrow, Crouch intended to get registered ahead of time today. But before that, Crouch fumbled in his pocket and pulled out the transformation potion he had received from Darling. He didn't know what form it would take, but anything other than his present appearance would suffice. I need to find somewhere secluded first. Finding a suitable spot to hide, Crouch opened the lid of the medicine bottle. The unique scent of the potion stung his nose, but Crouch swallowed it effortlessly. After a short while, his face twisted and contorted with the sensation. It must be the effect of the medicine. He waited a moment, and finally, the feeling from his face vanished. C-R-I-M. As he called to Crimson Garden, a crow alighted before him. Can you see in front of you? Crimson Garden tilted her head and asked inquisitively. Can I see in front of me? Kraus showed a look of puzzlement. What's with that reaction? What do I look like? Just as I said. You really do look quite suspicious. 
Crouch, not understanding what was being said, stepped outside. And the moment he turned to look at a window nearby, Crouch froze. What is this? I so squinted they were almost invisible. Fuzzy hair, like a black dog's fur. There stood a boy who, for some reason, reminded one of a scheming villain. And when the crow-shaped crimson garden perched upon his shoulder, the image was complete. Seems like you can still see. Eyes are still eyes. With an air of exasperation, Crouch looked at his transformed self. For some reason, it felt as though Darling's cackling laughter was ringing in his ears. She said she imagined my personality. Was it something like this she had imagined? Crouch let out a long sigh. It didn't matter what form his appearance had changed into. Though his face looked somewhat suspicious, it wasn't something to be overly concerned about. Now you really do look like a crow. Crimson Garden chuckled. That's her, laughing when it's not her own problem. You better hurry and get yourself registered. Taking her suggestion, Crouch began walking toward the registration before it closed. Ifania Empire's Martial Arts Tournament Registration Hall. A building managed by the Royal Palace, which hosted the event, served as the registration hall, and it was quite crowded with people. As it was a martial arts tournament organized by the Empire, it drew various contenders from all over the world. Thanks to that, the tournament was more successful than ever. Ahem, truly a lot have gathered. There are plenty of interesting folks. Just then, a voice as clear as crystal beads rang out. There was a doll-like girl with hair as blue as the sea. She was dressed in clothes made from expensive fabric. Nevertheless, she was practically glued to the second-floor balcony, observing the registration hall on the first floor. There are many intriguing children gathered. How utterly fascinating. Sizalry Princess, please, mind your demeanor. If His Imperial Majesty sees you like this, he'll foam at the mouth. Eek, do not speak of father. It's as if I can already hear him shouting in my ear. Berating her attendant, her true identity was none other than Sizal Riafania, the Empire's fourth princess. The youngest in the Empire, she was fourteen this year. Although young, the intelligence and spirit in her eyes were extraordinary. After all, there was an obvious reason for that. Despite her young age, she possessed a mind that rivaled the most brilliant in the empire. The story of her solving a mathematical conundrum at the age of seven, which made empire's mathematicians tear their hair out, was rather famous. But there was one flaw in her. Just like her age, she was incredibly mischievous. Curious about everything and using her brilliant mind to dodge her attendants, she even managed to escape the imperial palace. Because of this, those who esteemed her sharp intellect also shook their heads, deeming her unfit to be a candidate for the throne. But that was what those without knowledge of her would think. One of her attendants, who had been at her side since birth, Sarah Betella, knew her inner thoughts well. She's performing mischief on purpose, wanting to avoid becoming a candidate for the throne. She had a brilliant mind but was naturally frail in body. If such a person were enmeshed in the empire's most vicious power struggles, her frail body would inevitably break down first. Thus, she purposely behaved even more like a tomboy. Employing her keen intellect in other areas to make sure no one could nominate her for the imperial candidacy. Sarah felt both pity for her and relief that she was clever. She suited a life of freedom far more than being an empress. Hoo hoo hoo, these delectable things. I shall pick each one myself and send them all to the Rahelan Academy to become my prey. The issue was that her tomboyish tendencies seemed to get stronger with each passing day. Princess, where did you learn to laugh like that? You'll ruin that pretty face of yours. Sarah, a face is an effective tool to reveal one's emotions. I must say, I handle that tool quite excellently. If anything, I deserve praise, don't I? I feel the urge to scold you. How dare you, a mere attendant, scold me, the fourth princess? Fourteen years have been too soon for that. Truly, she was a princess with a peculiar personality. Eh? Oh, look over there. Suddenly, Sizel pointed to something between the railings, having spotted something amusing. Reluctantly approaching, Sarah saw a boy. With half-closed eyes and a gloomy face. 
and a crow in tow that evoked images of a warlock. However, the sword at his hip made him seem like a swordsman at second glance. Why does he reek of a villain? He's just like the sworn enemy of the Empire, the Balhames. Why would a Balheim be here? Although it does seem a bit suspicious. When his eyes open, it felt like a significant incident was bound to happen. Then, Sizelry, who had somehow risen from sitting on the floor, clicked her tongue. Ah, Sarah. It's wrong to have prejudices based on appearances. Didn't you just say he smells like a villain, princess? That's why I shall verify it myself. What? Caught by surprise for a moment, Sizelry suddenly leaped through the railings with her small frame. Princess! As Sarah cried out without thinking, Sizelry slid down a groove attached to the front of the railing. It was as if she was sliding down a slide. While Sarah was in shock, Sizelry landed on the ground in no time. Now, potential villain. Reveal your identity to this princess. With that, she passed through the crowd with a playful smile on her face. It was during this moment, while she was making her way through the crowd, that Sizelry, who was small and frail, collided with the shoulder of a man who had suddenly appeared. Ah! As she stumbled, her legs tangled, and she was about to fall forward. At the last moment, a protruding arm gently touched her stomach, preventing her fall. Startled, Sizelry looked up, just in time to encounter the half-closed eyes of the boy she had been aiming for. Such a tomboy. Seeing Sizelry, the boy muttered curtly as he steadied her. Be more careful. Then he walked off into the crowd, paying her little heed. Sizelry stood there, mouth agape, tilting her head. Tomboy? The fact that the boy spoke as if he knew her raised questions in her mind. At that moment, Sizelry's body buzzed into the air. It was because Sarah, who had approached without notice, had slipped her hands under Sizelry's arms and lifted her up. Even if you prattle on about the imperial body, I won't let you go. Sarah. Despite Sarah's grumbling, Sizelry kept her gaze fixed straight ahead. It seems an interesting character has shown up at this martial arts tournament. Watching that, Sarah quietly let out a sigh. Do you know how many times I've heard that? This time, it's the real deal. The martial arts tournament was organized under the pretext of gathering students for Rahelan Academy. Maybe, Sizelry thought as she smiled, this tournament might actually be fun. You have some luck too. Running into the fourth princess right after arriving. Crimson Garden seemed to have noticed as well. Crouch scratched his head. Even he didn't expect to run into the fourth princess right after arriving. That tomboy had always been full of erratic actions, often popping up unpredictably. I caught her by reflex when she was about to fall over. The look on Sizelry's face as she looked at him lingered on Crush's mind. She had undoubtedly the expression of someone who had discovered something fun. If I get entangled with that woman, it'd be a hassle. Sizelry, a brainy princess yet hiding her true capabilities. Crush was aware of her future in the Empire. A future that did not seem fitting for such a brilliant mind. And it was a future that only such a brilliant mind could accomplish. Enough of that. For now, he wasn't particularly eager to get involved with any woman. Thus, Crouch first completed his registration for the martial arts tournament. The name he used was Crad, age 14. His origin was Ozijwan, a remote village on the fringes of the empire. Ads by Pub Future. Having quickly noted down his details, Crouch finished the tournament registration and went outside. Fortunately, Sizelry did not follow him out. Now all that's left is to place within the top three to obtain the golden dragon grass. With that thought, Crush set off to find an inn to stay in for the preliminary rounds happening in two days' time. Little did he know the inns were full of spectators and participants until he was told there were no rooms available. Ha, huh, crazy. Crush had always known the empire was crowded but he hadn't expected the capital's inns to be completely full. Taking a seat in a corner, he let out a sigh, as there was not a single space to step foot in due to the onlookers and contestants. At this rate, he would have to sleep rough just for tonight. And it won't be just for tonight. He'd need a place to stay not only for tomorrow but until after the finals as well. 
Hey, kid. Amid his thoughts, Crouch heard someone calling to him. He looked up to find an old woman. Do you not have a place to stay tonight? With a look of concern, the old woman asked. I don't. Goodness, you're all alone too? I've been watching you from the store in front of this park where I work and noticed you've been sitting by yourself pondering. The old woman worked at the store in front of the park where Crouch had been sitting. That's why she had seen Crouch sitting alone, brooding the whole time. Did you come here alone to participate in the martial arts tournament? Oh dear, so pitiful. If you've nowhere to stay, would you like to come to my house? There was no deceit in her expression. She genuinely felt sorry and was offering Crouch a place to stay. The appearance of a child seemed to have its uses in this way. Eliciting pity from kind-hearted adults seemed to be enough. Thank you so much. I am indebted to you. So, Crouch readily accepted her offer. Didn't you ever hear not to follow strangers when you were a kid? Crimson Garden teased him, but Crouch had no intention of sleeping on the bare ground. Especially since he's had enough of that from dealing with world erosion. The house the old woman led him to was slightly removed from the center of the capital. Given that the city center was excessively pricey, this was only natural. Her house wasn't big, a modest size. But it was more than sufficient for living in. There's just one empty room left. Lucky you. Are you hungry? I'll whip up some food in a jiffy. Thank you. Go ahead, up to the room at the very end of the second floor. It should be comfortable enough for you. The old woman treated Crouch with kindness, as if he were her own grandchild. So, Crouch didn't say much and followed her instructions. Fortunate, indeed. Never would he have expected to find a room this way. As Crouch climbed the stairs and walked through the second floor wooden hallway, one of the room doors creaked open. Thinking it might be the old woman's family, Crouch turned his head, only to freeze at the sight of the person he encountered. Oh, it's you! As if by some coincidence, the blue-haired girl pointed at him and cried out. The friend who helped me during the day. And then, Crouch felt a faint headache. With her doll-like pretty face adorned with blue hair. She was none other than the fourth princess, Sizel Riafania. Her face was not known outside the imperial palace. Thus she thought no one would recognize her and freely roamed around like that. The rot. And then Crouch realized. Somehow, she had led him here, even though he didn't know how she did it. Why she employed her brilliant mind in such a way was beyond him. Crouch took a moment to look at her before turning around and entering the room as directed by the old woman. Hmm, are you shy? Ignoring the words that came from outside, he closed his ears and dismissed them. And so, the short cohabitation between Starlin's pride, the Balheim, and the Empire's most powerful princess began. Knock, knock, knock. The next morning. Since today was the last day of registration and the preliminaries were the following day, Crouch was enjoying a sound sleep in bed for the first time in a while. Knock, knock, knock. But with the insistence as if someone didn't want him to enjoy his sleep, the door was knocked upon once more. Crouch turned the pillow over his ears to silence the sound. Creak. But when there was no response to the knocking, this time the door actually opened. He was certain he had locked the door the night before. Hearing the door open, Crouch sat up in bed and the first thing that caught his eye was the blue hair. Of course, it was Sizel Riafania. Shamelessly, she held a tiny wire in her hand, her tool for picking locks. Really, what princess carries a wire to unlock doors? An early riser catches the prey. Sleeping in late won't get you anything. That doesn't mean you should be picking other people's locks because they're sleeping in. Then what am I supposed to do? It's so obvious you're avoiding me. She deliberately concealed her royal manner of speaking and approached him in a natural way. Why are you avoiding me? As she questioned him, Crouch got up from bed, straightening the sheets. It wasn't good to converse with her. Through experience, Crouch knew her mind was dangerously sharp. If he engaged in conversation, it was almost guaranteed something would slip out. You're just not my type. So he decided to respond with an unexpected answer. 
and that surely hit the target. Sizelry's big eyes whitened before she soon laughed as if flabbergasted. I've only ever been called pretty or cute in my life. How shameless. But just like her words, Sizelry's appearance was not that of a criminal. Plenty are prettier than you. Oh? Who are they? Sizelry asked with sparkling eyes. Watching her, Crouch momentarily thought of Bianca before shaking off the thought. I'm not telling you. You have a lot of secrets. Your face is as obscure as your words. Thanks for the compliment. You should be grateful. After all, it's a compliment from someone of significance. Ignoring her, Crouch stepped out into the hallway, and Sizelry quickly followed after him with light steps. Where are you going? Don't follow me. Why? To become your type, we should get to know each other better. I'm making such an effort, being this gorgeous next to you. It was annoying. Crouch honestly felt that way. He was almost overwhelmed by the urge to deliver a flick to her forehead. The issue was that if he did flick her, Sarah, her ever-present attendant, would surely appear. If I fight with the mad sword, I'm as good as dead. After all, she was a master-level expert. Even now, the presence of watchful eyes somewhere was pricking at his sixth sense, making him feel edgy. How about now? Am I your type yet? You're making it worse. That's curious. As if it were the first time she received such treatment, Sizelry's eyes rounded in amazement. How can you act like that even though you know I'm the princess? At her continued words, Crouch tensed up. That damned woman. What she just said wasn't thrown out randomly. She had noticed that Crouch was aware of her identity. She had become certain of it overnight. Those eyes of hers, shining with a golden light, seemed to already see through everything. Just like they encompassed all wisdom, Sizelry's eyes appeared to have pierced through it all. What nonsense are you talking about? Why would you be a princess? Crouch acted nonchalant. But Sizelry merely smiled faintly. It's a joke. A joke? How could I possibly be a princess? With that, she extended her hand with a laugh. I'm Sizelry, nice to meet you. Crad from Starlon. Damn. Crouch barely held back a curse. Not only had she blatantly revealed her name, but she had also realized where he was from. Not pleased at all. Crouch did not reciprocate the handshake and turned away. Watching him walk away, Sizelry retracted her hand, uneasily placing it on her waist. Princess. In that moment, Sarah discreetly appeared beside her. Is that boy really from Starlon? Yes, the Empire and Starlon use the same language, but in Starlon, when syllables with plosive sounds come out, they come out slightly stronger. That boy, even with a mix of the Empire's style, has that essence which can't be changed, it was apparent. Only the fourth princess could notice such a thing. Sarah shook her head at the peculiar way in which her lady discerned his origins. What does it mean when you say he knows your identity? It's just as I say. The way he approaches me, there are actions that only make sense if he has already recognized who I am. Could you give a simple example? The actions he showed when he first met the old woman compared to the actions when he first saw me were different. Sarah blinked. Isn't that just the difference between how one treats adults and children? What you need to pay attention to is that it was their first time. People's treatment differs when meeting someone for the first time, but familiarity is clearly different from a first encounter. I'm quite lost here. It's a matter of observational skills. I absorb much more information much faster than others. Her brain worked differently from the average person. Especially in terms of observation, her intellect showed overwhelming efficiency. An average person's brain would simply register the information with the eyes and move on, but her brain remembered all of it and turned it into valuable data. That's why she saw more. The rate at which she absorbed information was of such a degree that calling it a supernatural ability wouldn't be too far off. That's why Sizelry was even more puzzled. But I'm seeing that child for the first time. How could someone who isn't in her memory behave towards her as if familiar? 
was he feigning familiarity on purpose? However, unless he was a con man of historic proportion, there was no way to pull the wool over her eyes. As she considered various possibilities, she soon let out a sly chuckle. It'd be better if he were a con artist. Ironically, that was the most plausible explanation. Should I capture him? If he's from Starlon, then he's hiding his identity and participating in the martial arts tournament under false pretenses. Sarah quietly asked, and Sizelry responded by raising her hand and slapping Sarah's thigh lightly. With such an amusing thing happening, why create a disturbance? Leave it be. Sarah, having her thigh slapped for no reason, could only grimace silently. More importantly, Sarah, have you found out a bit about my sister's matter? Upon her question, Sarah, who had been rubbing her thigh, turned to look at Sizelry. Yes, I inquired as you directed. If we focus on the points you mentioned, it's clear that Lady Sigrid is indeed a different person than before. The Empire's third princess, Sigrid Ifania. Armed with a talent for the sword, she was Sizelry's older sister, expected to become a shining sword of the Empire. Sizelry had already noticed that her sister had changed strangely starting a year ago. Hmm, something's happening in the Imperial Palace, hmm? Sizelry clicked her tongue lightly and moved on. Should we do something about it? When Sarah asked, Sizelry shook her head. That's enough. Matters of the palace should be resolved within the palace itself. Why should I get involved? She had intentionally distanced herself from the palace's affairs. Her inquiries about Sigrid's change were out of personal curiosity alone. There was no other reason. Still, she couldn't help but think that the first and second princes were a bit at risk. But now I've found something far more interesting. Sizelry's eyes sparkled with curiosity for the first time in a while. She simply hoped whatever she had discovered would satisfy her interest. The next day, the day of the martial arts tournament preliminary round. Crouch, more fatigued than usual, wiped his face. I'm really being hammered here. Unable to even respond to the giggling derision from Crimson Garden beside him. It had started from the previous day and continued until this morning. Because he had been relentlessly harried by Sizelry. This is why I hate geniuses. Especially if it's regarding brains. Sapped of energy from verbal sparring, as she seized any information with whatever he said. He wanted to finish the martial arts tournament swiftly and leave now. If he stayed any longer, he might risk exposing his Balheim identity. Now's my chance. At that moment, he heard a voice and a boy wielding a club attacked him from behind. Shouting while attempting a surprise attack, this one was too immature. Crouch, without drawing his sword, raised his hand and smacked the chin of the leaping applicant. Arg! The boy screamed and rolled on the ground. Without mercy, Crouch stomped on the boy's abdomen, and his eyes rolled back, unresponsive. Wow, how many makes that now, anyway? That guy's a slit-eyed monster. What's the deal with that crow? It doesn't fall off even when he moves like that. Heads turned at Crush's voice, and those who made eye contact with him scuttled back, looking terrified. He's scary. Definitely comes from the underworld. Seeing the way he finishes them off. Better not get any blowback. The place where Crush was stationed was none other than the preliminary arena. This preliminary was characterized by melee combat. 100 participants per group were divided, and only the top four of each would qualify for the next rounds. Crouch had such an easy time that he could afford to let his mind wander. He proved his efforts had paid off, he reigned as a strong contender here. Ads by Pub Future Calling someone strong among 15-year-olds, how strong could they really be? There weren't many peers who could measure up to Crouch. Especially since those who would enter Rahalan Academy were all absent. It's like a fox dominating in the absence of a tiger. Crouch, harboring no arrogance, made that assessment of himself. Having seen real geniuses, he was the most self-aware. Ha 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 ha. Why are you standing there dumbfounded? You idiots. You're all going to die. Aok. Run away. It's a monster. Of course, there were some with real skill among them. 
Take, for example, the muscle pig currently charging crazily around like a buffalo. It was impossible for someone with such a massive size to be under the age of 15, and just by charging, he was unstoppable. But that wasn't all there was. The aura wrapped around his body was also moving with precision. I remember him. He was one of the guys who entered Rahelan Academy through the martial arts tournament. Regrettably, the name eluded Crouch. Regardless of being treated insignificantly, he was a Balheim. There was little need for him to clash with commoners. Ha 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 ha. However, that laughter was somewhat loud. His ears hurt as if even the sound carried aura, and when Crouch looked that way, their eyes met. In that moment, the muscle pig's eyes gleamed wickedly. Oh ho, what are you looking at? And the subsequent words made Crouch's eyebrows twitch. You're staring, piglet. Crouch didn't hold back from the provocation. The muscle pig's forehead creased deeply. Pig? Pig? Who are you calling a pig? Immediately thereafter, the creature began a body slam charge at Crouch. His large frame and charging stance were certainly intimidating. But it was only threatening to a human extent. In world erosion, no matter how big, a person is just a small animal. Proving this, Crouch merely observed as the pig came right up in front of him. Die! The muscle pig thrust his shoulder forward, aiming to blow Crouch away. Whoom! Accompanied by dust kicking up under his feet, the pig was abruptly halted. Merely by Crouch's outstretched hand pressing down on the pig's head. The pig's eyes blinked once. Looking up close at the creature whose eyes at least looked somewhat innocent, Crouch slowly smiled. Are you good at fighting with strength? And the moment Crush's fist tightened. Wham! The pig's face crumpled beneath the force of Crush's punch. Thud! Crash! He soared sky high and then rolled pitifully along the ground. His face smashed in, the big man lay there losing consciousness, his front teeth knocked out and eyes flipped back. Since Crush gave him a blow even to the village, consciousness had completely taken flight. Swoosh. The arena was enveloped in a brief silence at the spectacle. The children looked on with eyes wide open at Crouch and the muscle pig, alternating their gaze. They couldn't believe what they'd seen, the much smaller Crouch had blasted away the brute. Then Crouch crinkled his face under the children's stare. Done spectating? With that, the children began brawling amongst themselves again. From that moment, not a single one among the children dared to challenge Crouch. To them, provoking him would mean instant dismissal from the competition. Puhahahat, a masterpiece. In the meantime, a voice burst into a peal of roaring laughter behind Crouch. There stood a man with his face wrapped in black bandages. He was quite tall, possibly hitting a growth spurt, and smiled with his eyes at Crouch from between the bandages. Why are you laughing? Crouch, ever gruff to anyone not a favorite of his, asked peevishly. Even after witnessing Crouch's recent feat, the bandaged man appeared not the slightest bit intimidated. Well, I have to laugh when an interesting friend shows up, right? You, aren't you the one sent by the infamous Night Crow assassin family? And Crouch couldn't make head nor tail of what seemed nonsensical babbling. The Night Crow? That's the most dangerous group operating behind the Empire. Had they sent someone to participate in this martial arts tournament? Even Crouch couldn't know every inside detail of the Empire. But I've never heard about the Night Crow at Rahelan Academy? Would the Empire be mad enough to admit members of the Night Crow? However, Crouch was aware of an unpredictability factor in the Empire. Sigrid Ifania. That damn third princess who must have inherited the same batch of memories as himself. He felt a bad premonition. It was as if the woman was doing something behind the scenes of the Empire. The Empire's downfall was not without influence from those shadows. I don't know what misunderstanding you're having. Don't play innocent. That crow on your shoulder is proof enough. The crow is proof? Crouch glanced at Crimson Garden. It seemed he'd drawn unwarranted misconceptions because of her. Besides, the dubious aura emanating from you screams underworld to anyone seeing it. Apparently, his suspicious appearance had been compounded due to Darling's transformation potion. 
Don't worry. I've got no intention of checking on your lot. Given who's backing you, I guess there aren't many left who would dare. The bandaged man chuckled and grinned. Let's get along, considering we hail from the same underworld. With that, having said his part, he waved his hand and left. Crush watched him go before sinking into deep thought by himself. An expert emerging from the night crow, eh. Whoever it might be was unclear. But I surely feel that an unpleasant variable is about to arise. And certainly not in a direction he was comfortable with. I suppose I'll have to check it out. After the preliminaries ended, Crouch had confidently remained one of the top four in his group. Not a single soul dared to challenge him after he demolished the muscle pig. That meant Crouch had practically conserved all his energy. Crouch was currently on the tail of someone. Who might that someone be? It was none other than the bandaged man who had spoken to him earlier. He must be involved with the underworld. Crouch had never visited the Empire's underworld. He had only heard a few stories, he didn't know exactly how those figures operated. Crouch, not an imperial citizen, couldn't possibly know everything about the Empire's affairs. So Crouch decided to tail the bandaged man to learn about the Empire's underworld. Do you really need to go to such lengths? As Crouch closely followed through the back alleys, Crimson Garden suddenly spoke up. Go to such lengths? Stalking someone, that sort of thing. Crouch blinked, his expression questioning as if asking, then what other way is there? Tisk, TSK, you only know how to learn from me, not how to use what you've learned. What a poor pupil. In that moment, Crimson Garden spread her wings and soared upward. She quickly flew overhead and landed neatly in front of the bandaged man. Eh, a crow? The bandaged man, walking down the alley, stopped in surprise at the sight of Crimson Garden. The bandaged man's shoulders jerked in a rough reaction. As Crouch approached belatedly, the bandaged man simply stood there bewildered. What did you do? It was a light brainwashing spell. In this state, he'll answer anything you ask. Crouch was aware of Crimson Garden's versatility, but he hadn't known she could do this as well. Certainly, if this method were available, there was no need to tail anyone. Hey, bandaged man. Crouch called out to him, and the bandaged man looked over blankly. Gazing at him, Crouch quickly posed his question. What happened with the Night Crow? Night Crow was recently almost annihilated. The man's lips conveyed the news of the Night Crow's near destruction. Annihilated? But the Night Crow participated in the martial arts tournament. It was by the decree of the new master who annihilated and took them under his control. Hearing mention of the Night Crow's master, Crouch responded with curiosity but also sought confirmation. Is that Sigridophania? She was the only one capable of such a feat. No. However, the reply was different. Not Sigrid? Yes, it was the second prince who annihilated and claimed the Night Crow. Crush's eyebrows furrowed. The second prince claimed the Night Crow? Crush's gaze was filled with even greater doubt. The second prince had long been devoured by the first prince and was known just for inflating the latter's power base. It didn't make sense that he had gotten his hands on the Night Crow. And moreover, Crouch knew the secrets of the Night Crow and their true backing was from the Imperial family. Night Crow, jestingly referred to as the Assassin's House of Fame. Despite originating from the Empire's underworld, they were so renowned for their assassination skills that they were referred to as a family. What does it mean for them to be outstanding in assassination? They took on the Empire's dirty tasks. Their forte was assassination. Thus, they were an organization that undertook high-priced assassination missions from various places. Their characteristic was one thing, they all possessed something related to a crow. The rumor of their involvement became so widespread that there was even talk of carrying a crow emblem for safety when walking down back alleys. And the Imperial family made use of that. The Empire's Imperial family kept tabs on which nobles were using the Night Crow, and who was checking whom, all through the Night Crow. Cleverly, the Imperial family had naturally adjusted the balance of power among the nobles by utilizing the Night Crow. It was a fact that remained undisclosed until the Empire's downfall. 
Within the empire, only the imperial family was privy to this knowledge. So the notion that the second prince had suddenly become the master of the Night Crow was simply nonsensical. After all, the original master of Night Crow was the imperial family itself. But even before that, there was a more inconceivable story. Even if the Night Crow's annihilation is true, how is it that some random back alley thug knows about the imperial family's involvement? There were too many peculiarities. Wait. Something flashed across Krush's mind. Sigrid, that girl's doing. Krush's face contorted in thought. She's scheming to crush the second prince ahead of time to lessen the first prince's power base. These are deliberately spread rumors. Krush's mind spun rapidly. To him, the rumors indeed seemed deliberately spread. Creating a narrative as if the second prince had swallowed the night crow and was plotting something. The second prince fell into Sigrid's trap. Sigrid deliberately laid the trap, making it possible for the second prince to swallow the night crow, and the prince, still eyeing the throne, hastily gulped down the poison that was night crow. Thinking the revelation of controlling night crow would bolster his forces, he likely blabbed carelessly. And Sigrid would have encouraged the rumors from the shadows. Enough for this bandaged man here to know about it. Having come to that conclusion, Krosh became lost in thought. I get that Sigrid set a trap for the second prince. By making him swallow the night crow, what's she planning to do? The night crow's specialty is assassination. Then it means the second prince is going to use night crow to assassinate someone. Doesn't Sigrid know the first prince well? He wasn't someone easy to deal with. No matter how much the second prince pulls strings from behind, using Night Crow to assassinate the first prince would be impossible. Then it means that the second prince is being manipulated to assassinate someone else. But who would that target be? After spending a moment in deep thought, Krosh slowly lifted his head. Damn it! Krosh's eyes crumpled with rage. He had realized who Sigrid intended the second prince to assassinate through the Night Crow. Sizalri Athania. The fourth imperial princess. Sizalri Athania. Just as the first prince was about to perish by Sigrid's hand and she nearly placed Arthur upon the throne, Sizalri concealed the white dragon jade seal, the symbol of imperial authority of the emperor, in a place no one could find and then took her own life. According to an unspoken rule long held, no one without the white dragon jade seal could ascend the throne. Consequently, unable to seize the white dragon jade seal, Sigrid and Arthur failed to unite the empire under one banner. They may have ascended the throne in the end, but only as figureheads, ultimately unable to quell the internal strife within the empire, all due to one incident orchestrated by Sizalri. She's trying to get rid of that meddler in advance. Sizalri's mind worked differently from others. Even the most renowned geniuses would often have to concede before her. Therefore, it was clear that Sigrid had judged, even if by chance, she were to seize the white dragon jade seal first, Sizalri would interfere in some way. Sizalri would never idly accept Arthur ascending the throne. Utilize the night crow to kill Sizalri and pin the blame on the second prince, who holds the night crow, ending both at the same time. Krosh felt all the pieces of the puzzle clicking into place. It's not my place to judge, considering I murdered my half-brother with my own hands. It was apparent how little regard Sigrid had for family ties. What are you pondering so long for? Crimson Garden, perched atop the bandaged man's head, tilted her head and asked. Upon hearing that, Krausch let out a long breath. He had a rough understanding of the situation. And why the Night Crow had participated in this martial arts tournament. The second prince must have wanted to spread the word that he had taken control of the Night Crow far and wide and the martial arts tournament would have been a perfect target for such rumors. He would have been hoping for the Night Crow to achieve first place in this martial arts tournament. All without realizing it was all part of Sigrid's scheme. And then, Sigrid's blade would simultaneously strike down Sizalri and the second prince. C-R-I-M. I believe I told you not to call me that. Crimson Garden tried to peck at him with her beak, but Krosh lightly dodged it. I want to ask for a bit more help. To think I'm already raising you as my disciple, and still you ask for more help. Aren't you lacking a sense of shame? Shame or whatever, this relates to me getting stronger. 
Crush had grasped Sigrid's goal. Ads by Pub Future. She wanted to bring down the first and second prince before she headed off to Rahelan Academy. That way, when the current emperor succumbs to illness at her academy graduation, Arthur could smoothly succeed the throne. She was aiming for the position of Empress of the Empire. And Crouch had no intention of letting Arthur ascend as Emperor of the Empire. The Black Hood fundamentally creates the dial based on the target's self-esteem. The higher one's self-esteem, the more solid the dial becomes, not easily opened. Conversely, the more depleted self-esteem becomes, the looser the dial. This was only natural. To heighten the worth of what one possesses, one must believe in their own value. That's why I can't let Sigrid achieve her goal. For the future, he had to pilfer the skills she possessed. So, for that purpose alone, he couldn't allow her to ascend the throne. And if that damn woman rises to the throne, the empire will likely fall to ruin. Though Sigrid has innate talent with the sword, her intelligence falls short of an emperor's capacity. Just looking at how hastily she wants to prop Arthur onto the throne, doesn't the answer become clear? The fall of the empire ushers in world erosion. Krosh was resolute in preventing Sigrid from becoming empress. I need to wreck the plans of someone whose skill I want to steal. Crimson Garden clicked her tongue at Krosh's intentions. As usual, regressors move based on their paltry knowledge of the future. Regrettably, the real regressor resided elsewhere but I've agreed to help you. Very well. This time, I'll aid you. Fortunately, Crimson Garden readily agreed to assist him. What are you going to do about this fellow? As Crimson Garden prodded the bandaged man with her beak and asked, Crouch turned away. Leave him. He's not particularly needed anymore. The situation was fully assessed. As much as Crush knew Sigrid, no one better understood the circumstances than he did. Huh, since it's come to this, let's at least imprint him as a servant. With that, Crimson Garden stamped her foot on the bandaged man's head. After a moment, a black star was imprinted between the bandages. Leave. Crimson Garden commanded, and the bandaged man immediately turned around and walked away with heavy steps. So, what's the plan? Crimson Garden asked as she followed Crouch with a steady pace, having sent the bandaged man off. It's simple. We have to find the Night Crow hiding in the main competition. For that, action had to be taken to draw out the Night Crow. And it just so happened to be perfect timing. Crim, I'll need to use you in this appearance. Let's see who can bet on the real crow. Sizelry was also having a delightful day. The reason for her recent joy was thanks to a single individual. The boy from Starlon who was aware of her identity. Crad. Sizelry found it hilarious every time she behaved erratically and he became frustrated. It was, after all, expected. Up until now, everyone else merely responded awkwardly to her tomboyish impulses. She was an imperial princess of the empire. The most that could be said against her antics was from, at most, her attendant Sarah. Conversely, if she hid her identity and played pranks, she knew it was only because her identity was concealed. Therefore, to Sizelry, Crad was an interesting subject. He definitely knew her real identity. Yet, on such a premise, he had never once treated her as a princess. This was deeply intriguing to her. How could such an amusing fellow exist, she wondered. The spark occasionally visible between his narrowly opened eyes made him seem anything but a 14-year-old boy. In fact, Sizelry had deduced that he was hiding his true age. And that part was fun as well. An old soul like him, wasn't he quite similar to her? Sizelry concluded that he was even disguising his outward appearance. It was curious how he managed to disguise himself without her knowing, but her overwhelming observational ability allowed her to see through it. Certainly, his name too must be an alias. But it didn't matter. She had noticed that he had little concern beyond the martial arts tournament. Does that boy catch your fancy that much? Sarah asked Sizelry, who was looking out the window. Hearing the question, Sizelry gave a wry smile. Are you asking if I'm interested in him romantically? It's natural for the fourth princess to be drawn to males of her age. 
Sizel retoyed with her chin. Biologically speaking, it's natural for males and females to be attracted to each other. For the preservation of the species, hormone levels would be highest around this age. Especially someone as physically weak as I might be desperate to leave offspring. Don't beat around the bush. I'm not particularly interested in that aspect. If he were the same sex, I would have reacted exactly the same. Sizelry declared. I am Sizelry Athania, the Empire's fourth princess. Even if such feelings were to arise, they are not for me to hold on to. Sizelry said so and slowly smiled. That is what it means to be the fourth princess. Watching Sizelry, Sarah felt a sense of sorrow. For her, being a princess was nothing more than shackles. What use was there for a brilliant mind? God had handed her a weak body and the position of the fourth princess, Iphania. She had no other way to live her life except as a perpetual tomboy. Or perhaps there was another way. However, the moment she chose that method, Sizelry would have to use her intellect to harm everyone around her. Disliking that, she remained in her place, choosing to always live the life of a tomboy. Oh, you've come. At that moment, Sizelry spotted Crouch walking in from outside. You made quite the splash in the preliminaries, didn't you? Let's go lavish you with praise. With an excited expression, Sizelry headed down to the first floor. Sarah could only hide her presence naturally as she watched her. Bounding down the stairs, Sizelry came to a stop right before the door. Her plan was to tease Crouch the moment he walked in. And just as the door creaked open, Sizelry's voice suddenly halted. Because she read a different shade of emotion on Crouch's face looking at her. What's the matter? Perhaps that's why her usual tone of voice burst out unintentionally. Why are you looking at me with such an expression all of a sudden? Sizelry asked. After all, it made sense. Sympathy and emotion that had abruptly nestled in the eyes of Crouch, who'd only been irritable since morning. That sentiment, often seen with Sarah, wasn't something expected from him. Honestly, it was upsetting. Though it was questionable how he had come to know about her, she was certainly not one to be pitted by him. Just. Crouch simply said, walking inside. I just happen to think you lead quite a hard life, that's all. His words made Sizel retrack him visually as he entered. What happened? Take care of your body. Remember that much. Left pondering his cryptic parting words, Sizelry stood there dumbfounded. Sarah. Yes. At her call, Sarah immediately appeared. Sizelry's eyes were colder and more composed than ever before. It was a look she often showed when displaying the responsibilities of a princess, so Sarah immediately assumed a posture of deference. You are the one providing information from the imperial family. She spoke and turned to look at Sarah. Are you truly reliable? No matter how sharp her intellect, Sizelry still needed to hear with her ears to obtain information. She wasn't free within the imperial family. Thus, the question to Sarah, who had so far been her informant about the internal affairs of the imperial family, prompted Sarah to bow her head. I will double-check. I would appreciate that. Sizelry said as she looked again toward the room into which Crouch had entered. Truly, from where did that boy learn his information? Could he see even what she was blind to? She wasn't quite sure, but this martial arts tournament might bring significant upheaval. The day the preliminaries of the martial arts tournament ended and the finals approached, there was a peculiar rumor circulating. It stated that the Night Crow, steeped in mystery, had participated in the youth division of this martial arts tournament. People who heard the news exhibited uniform curiosity. The Night Crow was, as ever, one of those topics that people delighted in gossiping about. Mankind reveled in embroidery when it came to organizations shrouded in secrecy. As a result, the spectators who came to watch the finals were immensely curious about the veiled whispers regarding the Night Crow. Wondering if the rumors could be true. As the final rounds progressed, there was a particularly high concentration of people in the youth division, but the event fell short of expectations. Regardless of their agility or strength, they were no more than under 15. The reality was that the children's level of skill was far from that of the adults. 
Even those who made it to the finals were prone to mistakes and had many flaws. It could have been amusing for someone, but to most, it lacked the excitement of the adult division. Just as people were beginning to think that the Night Crow may just be a rumor after all. 32nd Round, Contestant Crad A boy walked out. The first thing that caught everyone's eye was the crow perched on his shoulder. Seeing the crow, they couldn't help but collectively recall the Night Crow. After all, a crow was the symbol of the Night Crow. Moreover, the boy's appearance also evoked an unusual atmosphere. His all-black attire gave him the vibe of someone from the Empire's underworld. And especially the slit-like narrowness of his eyes, locking away any insight, made him even more suspicious. Could it be real? It seems so. Look at that scheming face, it has to be. In the minds of the spectators, a consensus was reached in an instant. That's the boy. That boy is the real Night Crow. 32nd Round, Contestant Garda. When everyone's attention was at its peak, his opponent walked out. With a well-trained physique and carrying a large sword, he looked at Crush with a formidable gaze. Crow, are you that famous Night Crow? Hearing Garda's question, Crouch gave a shrug of his shoulders. Neither affirming nor denying. This ambiguous attitude further fueled suspicions about his existence. This is interesting. If I defeat the crow claiming to be the lord of the empire's underworld, I'm sure to receive high praise. Garda swung his greatsword with what seemed to be considerable confidence in his skills. Both contestants, ready, start. In the midst of those exchanges, the announcer shouted the start of the battle. Holding his stance with the greatsword, Garda kicked off the ground and rushed in for a surprise attack. His robe fluttered, fully revealing his figure for all to see. People then belatedly realized his identity. Is he a child of the warrior tribe, Freer? His deep green irises and the distinctive tattoos drawn across his body gave him away. The Freer, a minority tribe living in the most rugged mountains of the empire by the same name, known for being a warrior people who inherently possessed superb martial prowess. Garda was a child of that very tribe, Freer. The Freer Mountains were rumored to be the most treacherous region affected by world erosion. Growing up there, the Freer was naturally exceptional in martial prowess and were hence called a warrior people. Wouldn't a child of such a tribe be able to defeat even the Night Crow? That thought briefly crossed their minds. However, that thought soon changed as Crouch dodged all the strikes from Garda's greatsword. He's just avoiding the blows. Doesn't he have a chance to counterattack? While it looked like Crush was preoccupied with evading, over time, that perception began to change. Garda's attacks were vicious. Yet no matter how fierce, if none of those attacks hit, it was a different story. Crush didn't get hit by a single one of Garda's strikes. It was as though he had almost premonitory skills to dodge all of Garda's assaults. No, that's not it. It's on purpose. He's avoiding them on purpose. The onlookers showed shock at this revelation. It seemed that Crouch was toying with his opponent, which would only be possible if there were no real skill difference. How can he move so agilely? Isn't he the Night Crow? Isn't the term noted assassin family not for nothing? Ads by Pub Future. To hold the title of a noble family while living in the underworld and to be scoffed at. Who would have thought he'd be at this level? The child of Freer can't do anything against him. People could not help but marvel. The Night Crow, even if just a ruse, was called the noted family of assassins. Perhaps due to this reason, Crush's darting moves made people even more convinced that he was truly the Night Crow. Damn, like a rat. Garda, facing off against Crouch, couldn't help but show signs of anxiety. No matter how much he was a child of the warrior tribe Freer, he was still just a 15-year-old boy. Due to his lack of psychological maturity, the movement of Crouch and the judgmental eyes of the audience made him increasingly shrink back. Crap! Therefore, out of a desire to shake off his constrained state, he inadvertently swung his greatsword broadly. Whoosh! In the space where the greatsword had passed, Garda's eyes widened in shock. Because Crouch, who had been in sight moments before, had vanished. You're too impatient. Right then, a voice came from behind him. Slap. 
The punch that Crouch had swung connected precisely across his back. With the execution of the AccuPoint strike, an additional force wreaked havoc on Garda's insides. Cough. Unable to withstand the shock, Garda tumbled to the floor. No amount of physical training could defend against the AccuPoint strike. Exhausted by the vigorous exertion and blow of the AccuPoint strike, Garda lost consciousness where he lay. The referee, witnessing the scene firsthand, promptly raised his hand in favor of Crouch. The winner is Crad. Wow wow. An immense cheer erupted from the stands at that moment. It was a natural response after catching a glimpse of the veiled prowess of the Night Crow. Although I'm not actually the Night Crow. Crouch secretly smiled inwardly, having actively exploited the rumors spread by Sigrid. By now, the real Night Crow must be incredibly flustered. And he will approach. There's no way he would leave a fake Night Crow be. Crouch glimpsed Garda for a moment. He felt sorry for him. Under normal circumstances, he would have been a candidate for champion. After all, since another from Freer has already secured admission to Rahelan Academy, this wouldn't matter to them. He was referring to another child from Freer, belonging to the Sky Generation. With those thoughts, Crouch moved along. In that instant, he caught the eye of someone in the audience. It was Sizelry, smiling faintly at him. Despite his warning, her presence at the martial arts competition meant that she too had probably caught wind of Sigrid's plan. She was smart, after Sizelry Aphania. So playing the Night Crow, a very fancy identity indeed. Though her voice wasn't heard, Crouch read her lips. She was teasing him, knowing full well he was not actually the Night Crow. Crouch left her be and made his way to the waiting room for the contestants. I've scattered the bait. Now, all there was to do was wait for the one who took that bait to show up. Clack, clack. While Crouch walked down the corridor, footsteps echoed from the opposite end. Sensing that it was a contestant, Crouch looked up. A man stood there. Tall, with long limbs, the figure sported dull black hair that hung long and ungroomed. With lifeless eyes, the man looked at Crouch and then slightly curled the corners of his mouth. Is it fun to impersonate the Night Crow? Just as that thought crossed Crouch's mind, a white blade surged from below, halting just shy of Crouch's throat. Crouch had grabbed his wrist in time. Wow, I didn't expect you to fall for it right away. Crouch looked up at him, snickering incredulously. Was it good luck or bad luck? The real Night Crow had come to discipline Crouch. Since ancient times, crows were considered ominous creatures that scavenge on the dead. They are the beings closest to death, lingering besides the dying. Such was the night crow bearing the name of these crows. One of the assassins was now right in front of Crouch's eyes. Yet, as Crouch viewed the member of the night crow before him, he tilted his head in curiosity. Ha! Huh? A voice tinged with doubt briefly escaped his lips. In that instant, another sword flew towards Crouch from the opposite direction of the arm he had caught. Crouch leisurely dodged the sword aimed at his head and then pushed the assailant back by kicking him in the stomach. The man who was kicked took a few steps back but showed no signs of pain. Observing this, Crouch became even more certain of the identity of the person before him. This I did not know. Crouch wasn't deeply knowledgeable about the Night Crow. The most significant reason was that they had disappeared during his time studying at the Rahalan Academy. The rumors had spread widely, there'd been a great deal of chaos among the Imperial children about the Night Crow being wiped out. Afterwards, aside from learning that the Night Crow was a secret weapon of the Imperial family, he hadn't heard any news about them. To think that the identity of the Night Crow was actually this person. Was he taken in by Arthur? Indeed, as befits a regressor. Having known all this in advance, they must have acted accordingly. And that's why they disappeared during my time at the academy. And now it looked like Sigrid was using the Night Crow before Arthur had the chance. Since she had been with Arthur, she must have already known their true identity. Quite skilled, aren't you? In the meantime, the man twisted his neck, drawing his sword in a bizarre posture with a flourish. So, you have some skills since you've impersonated the Night Crow? While saying so, he flashed a relaxed smile. And as his smile concluded, he sent another sword flying towards Crouch. 
This time, Crouch unhesitatingly blocked the attack. The man had opted for a rapid assault, but Crouch's foiled sword repelled those blows one after another. The man realized he could not catch up to Crouch in terms of swordsmanship. As he made that assessment, his mouth fell agape. Immediately following this, a slim dagger coated with poison sprung from his mouth. Crouch easily turned his head to avoid the dagger and then, another arm burst forth from within his garments. It was an arm made of blackened bone. The arm shot out quickly towards Crouch and made contact with his body. Seeing this, the man's face twisted into a grim smile. He was certain that Crouch was dead. What's going on? Yet, Crouch looked up at the man completely unharmed. What? As the man was caught off guard, Crouch's fist quickly traveled upward, striking him squarely in the jaw. The man tumbled to the ground with his vision shaking violently. Crouch stepped on the fallen man's chest and dusted off his hands. The death arts created through world erosion do not work on me. Thanks to his extreme blood point poison resistance, such types of death arts were thus negated. World erosion's power? What exactly are you? Seeing Crouch use the power of world erosion, the man wore a look of confusion. Crouch, while looking down at him, scratched the back of his head. He had intended to lure the night crow and then use them to turn the tables on Sigrid, helping them escape her clutches. But with things turning out this way, it seemed he needed to make some adjustments to his plans. Ebolask. Crouch called out that name. At the sound of his name, the man's body froze, and Crouch looked at him, questioning. Where are you now? What, uh, what, hey, you? The man seemed flustered as he blurted out his response. Seeing the intense reaction to just five letters of his name, in Korean, Crouch loosened up a bit. Your heart is being held by Sigrid, isn't it? Yikes! He even screamed. It must have been terrifying for him to feel as though Crouch saw right through him. Despite the man's fear, Crouch spoke calmly. Let's make a deal. A deal? I'll help you recover your heart. For the first time, the man's expression changed. While he didn't know how Crouch knew so much about him, what was being offered was too tempting for Ebolask to just ignore. In return, tell me everything about the plan Sigrid has drawn up and what she's ordered you to do. And so, Crouch coaxed Ebolask into betrayal. A world erosion being who had been held captive by the imperial family of the empire for a millennium. A necromancer. Ebolask Benapak. Crouch was talking to her. Crouch first came to meet Ebolask because of Arthur. One day, Arthur brought Ebolask to the quarters where the Sky Generation resided. Ebolask, who couldn't do anything on her own, was intimidated by everyone. Correction. More precisely, she avoided everyone. She never ventured outside the barracks. The Sky Generation didn't treat her well to begin with because she was a world erosion being. They kept her around simply because Arthur had brought her, thinking she might be of use. Initially, Crouch too had little communication with her. He only knew that she was the one and only necromancer in the world. But one day, Crouch also engaged in conversation with her. You are even more cursed than I am? Quite frail, aren't you? That was how Ebolask, with her characteristic pomposity, had started the dialogue. Crouch looked at the man before him. A man whose presence was almost undetectable. He was none other than Ebolask's twelfth corpse. And there, on the chest of the corpse, was a crow tattoo. The family that rules the world behind the empire. In reality, they were just a group made up of corpses. Well, in a way, a necromancer might be the most suited for assassinations. After all, unlike assassins, corpses would yield no information even if they were caught. The name Night Crow was aptly chosen for that reason, then. The crow that scavenges corpses. It was a name that precisely described a necromancer like Ebolask. Such a sense of naming. Huh, what? As number 12 turned around, Crouch waved his hands dismissively, acting as if nothing was the matter. Number 12 moved with a reluctant response. Right now, he was escorting Crouch somewhere. Now that I think about it. Ads by Pub Future. Crouch glanced briefly at Crimson Garden perched on his shoulder. 
Crimson Garden was a world erosion being, just like Ebelask. Perhaps she already knew of Ebelask. Crim, do you know Ebelask? I don't know anyone weaker than me. An arrogant reply came back to him. And Crouch knew that was true. Well, erosion beings aren't exactly colleagues to start with. It made sense not to know. We're here. At that moment, number 12 stopped walking. In front of him was a decrepit door and building. It looked too dilapidated for the world's only necromancer to stay. Then, with a click from within and number 12 opening the door, what unfolded was an excessively adorned space. The interior was completely different from the modest exterior. Crouch clicked his tongue at the sight of the room full of vanity. She won't even come out of a corner of the room anyway. She probably did all this simply because she wanted a nice, big house. Thinking how she really hadn't changed, Crouch continued following Number 12's lead. When they arrived in front of a certain room, Number 12 spoke. Now that I've brought you here, tell me. How are you going to get back my heart? Looking at Ebelask speaking through Number 12, Crouch wore an indifferent expression. Didn't you listen to me properly? You're not a goldfish. Goldfish? I said my skill requires me to meet you directly. Open up before I have to break down the door. Crouch frowned as if to say not to make him repeat himself. Because he realized that she was now not willing to let him in. Such a nasty guy. You act so kindly to the little chick, someone might mistake you for a different person. Ignoring the giggling crimson garden next to him, Crouch remembered he had to be forceful with Ebelask. Being kind would only make her think she was superior and get pompous. He didn't want to see that. He, eep. With a jittery sound from inside, the room door cracked open just a sliver after a moment. Crouch swiftly stuck his hand through the gap and pushed the door open. He detested being kept waiting. Kaya. A woman's scream followed and she tumbled to the floor, only to immediately bury her head amid a blanket sprawled on the ground. Crush glanced at her before pulling a chair close and plopping down onto it. The room was a complete mess. Half-cleared remains of food were scattered about, and the room was brimming with precariously stacked books. Looking at the pitiful state of the room, a stark contrast from the tidy corridor outside, Crush gave a look of disdain. Clean up a little. I it's a mess. Appearing embarrassed for showing her room to someone, she flushed red and jerked her head up. But as she seemed overwhelmed by making eye contact, she soon dropped her gaze again. As she did, her black and crimson hair swung about. Untouched for so long, it was long enough to reach the ground. To top it off, her attire consisted of a shirt with a stretched neck due to an unnecessarily puffy bosom, indeed, a sight too embarrassing to show anyone. Yet, despite all this, she was the sole necromancer in the world. Ebelask Beniporti. And it was her own choice to live in such a reclusive mess. Forget it. Lift your head and look at me. What are you trying to do? Didn't I tell you? I need to see directly to check my skill. Reluctantly, she lifted her head. Their eyes met, hers the color of violets. Looking into his eyes seemed to make her extremely uneasy, as if simply making eye contact with someone was incredibly uncomfortable for her. Then, she seemed to realize something and her eyes widened. It seems like you're not looking because your eyes are small. It appeared to be because of Crush's disguise. Ignoring the unnecessary comment, Crush activated the black hood. The target is the heart. It should originally have been in her possession. At that moment, five dials appeared before Crouch's eyes. Upon seeing them, Crouch was certain. The heart's true owner is Ebelask. Even though the imperial family claimed to possess her heart. The real owner was Ebelask, and therefore the Black Hood had been activated. This meant that unlocking the dials would possibly allow him to obtain Ebelask's heart through the Black Hood. How is it? Ebelask asked with an anxious expression. For a thousand years, she had been held captive by the imperial family. Used at their whim, she always wanted to regain her heart. And the reason she wanted it back was simple. Because she didn't want to work. The empire provided her a room and convenience, 
but she didn't want to work. Her wish was simply to read books and laze around in her room. So Ebelask readily let Crouch in. Thinking that a boy who seemed to see right through her might know something. And if he didn't, she would just turn him into a corpse and place him in her assassination squad. Having a crow on his shoulder was perfect for the job. But doesn't that crow glare too much? Ebelask, whose eyes met the crows, widened her eyes as if she had no intention of being intimidated by a mere bird. Yet when the crow looked back at her and chuckled while spreading its wings, she was startled and turned her head away. She was afraid of that crow. It's possible. Meanwhile, Crouch gave her the answer she wanted. Really? Yes, but I need your consent to transfer the heart to me. There were two ways to unlock the dials. One was the straightforward method, unlocking them according to the dial's conditions. The second was by obtaining permission, if the other party fully consents with their heart and mind, all dials will disappear. But this is more complicated than I thought. Even if the other party verbally consents, if they don't grant full emotional permission, the dials won't disappear. And this psychological aspect was a major stumbling block. People's hearts can't be manipulated at will, after all. How do I consent? I consent. Ebelask hastily shouted out. But her dials were still at five. It might be easy to say the words to transfer her heart, but actually doing it was hard. It has to be more than just words, you need to truly believe it. Huh, really? Yes, truly. Ebelask wore a puzzled look. Seeing this, Crouch clicked his tongue and got up from his seat. Then, he abruptly sat down in front of her, who was still slumped on the floor. As she became flustered by his closeness, Crouch tapped her shoulder. Ebelask, imagine carefully from now on. Ha, huh, um. You don't want to work, right? Of course not. With the most energetic voice she had used yet, Ebelask responded. Typical of her. If you get your heart back, you can loll around in this room every day. Leave all your chores to the corpses. A room at just the right temperature, heaps of books, and eating whatever you want while wasting your days away. Ebelask gulped down her saliva. It was a natural reaction for her, who had always wished for such a future. But if you can't get your heart back, you'll have to assist the Imperial family for the rest of your life. Working day in and day out. Then her complexion soured. Having lived through this for a thousand years, she was certain it would continue to be the same. I feel like throwing up. Just the thought made her feel nauseous. Are you going to continue living a life full of work every day? No, I hate it. I don't want to work anymore. Then you need to transfer your heart to me sincerely. For a life where you don't have to work ever again. As Crouch whispered, Ebelask's eyes wavered. Then she cautiously looked up at Crouch. If she handed over her heart to this boy, she wouldn't have to work ever again. At least not live as she was living now. She no longer wanted to kill at someone else's beck and call. With this in mind, she told Crouch. I will transfer my heart. More firmly. I will transfer my heart. Say it properly, what exactly you want from me. Prompted further by Crouch, she closed her eyes tightly and even bowed her head. Please, take my heart away. That was the moment. All the dials before her eyes unlocked at once. It's done. Is, is it really done? She looked up at him with a surprised expression, and Crouch nodded. Such an easy one. How badly she didn't want to work was shown by how effortlessly she had opened up her heart, which was a process far more demanding than expected. Then give it back to me right now. Why should I? However, Crouch tilted his head, arms crossed in defiance. Ebelask's eyes widened, and Crouch spoke with an incredulous expression. This is a deal. Ebelask, I will restore your heart after everything is done. How shameless to expect a bundle after being pulled out of the water. Work? You're telling me to work again? You demon! How wicked! No! I hate working! Then she started rolling about on the floor. The sight of a fully grown adult woman doing this was truly pathetic. 
and Crouch, having no intention of indulging in such a display for long, thumped the floor with imbued energy. Only then did she stop rolling, glancing around nervously. Keep the whining in check. I fulfill what you want, and you fulfill what I want. That's the end of the deal. You're free. When Crouch glared at her as if to say how could she not understand something so simple, she clenched her fists tightly. What do you want? She seemed to realize something and covered her chest. No. I don't like young ones. Come back when you're older. Keck, such a lewd woman. Crouch looked at her with disgust. That's what you get for reading nothing but sensual novels all day. Ebelask's shoulders tensed up. I, I don't read that kind of stuff. Then hide the title of the novel you are sitting on before you speak. Eek. She frantically stuffed the novel inside the blanket. Crouch, watching her pitiful state, returned to his chair. The deal goes as I said earlier. You tell me what plan Sigrid has instructed you. And I help you thwart that plan. That's it, you get your heart back and your freedom. As if to say not to waste any more time, Crouch directed his words at Ebelask. So tell me what Sigrid has commanded you. Upon hearing Crouch's words, Ebelask hesitated. Sigrid had taken hold of the heart that had been passed down through the imperial family. As such, she couldn't escape from Sigrid's grasp for the rest of her life without retrieving her heart. For Ebelask to break free, she needed Crush's help without a doubt. Sarah Betella. At that moment, the name of Sizelry's attendant burst from her lips. She told me to kill her and then use her corpse to kill Sizelry Aphania. And a plan far more ludicrous than expected came out. Sarah Betella. A masterclass talent and attendant to the fourth princess Sizelry Aphania, she was frowning over the incident that occurred yesterday. The informants they had embedded in the imperial palace had either been bought off or were only gathering incorrect information. What is this? Even under Sarah's stern pressure, the bought informants kept their mouths shut. They just repeated that they had no other choice but to act that way. To think they would do this even when the imperial palace is mentioned directly. Sarah swallowed her frustration. If that's the case, someone even higher up than the fourth princess must have given the order. There weren't many in the empire whose status exceeded that of Sizelry. Sarah frowned as she considered those individuals. Why would they target the fourth princess? Sizelry had deliberately distanced herself from the throne struggle by acting playfully. Her siblings didn't keep her in check because of this, and now Sarah could not fathom why this was happening. Can I protect her all by myself? Sizelry was intelligent. She had only prepared the bare minimum to defend herself, without bothering with other measures. For her, the best defense was not to hold anything of value at all. Thus, Sarah felt a great sense of duty to protect Sizelry. It was no coincidence that her mother had pleaded with the emperor to appoint her, a masterclass talent, as Sizelry's attendant. And now she was being targeted. By the wolves lurking in the tiger's den. To those wolves, Sizelry was nothing more than a defenseless lamb. A lamb that could be torn to shreds at any moment. Sarah was that lamb's horn. The only means of defense, yet all too small compared to the grandeur of the imperial palace. Ha! A long sigh escaped from her. Starting from the second prince absorbing the power of the night crow, to the recent friction between the first and second princes. Ads by Pub Future. And on top of that, Sigrid's strange movements. Every single factor was suspicious. She was better suited to swinging a sword than strategizing. Therefore, she had spoken directly to Sizelry. But Sizelry had been deep in thought, simply telling her not to do anything for now. Only making an absurd remark that she should take care of herself. What are you pondering all by yourself again? It would be helpful if Sizelry would at least confide in Sarah her only retainer. But Sizelry, being intelligent, preferred to subtly direct someone's actions rather than make them understand her own thinking. The problem was that those who became the target of her intentions were often left frustrated. Tap tap. Suddenly, a sound came from the window. As Sarah turned her head, there was a crow. This child is. 
Sarah remembered seeing that crow. It was the crow of the boy whom Sizelry had recently taken an interest in. Night crow. That was Sarah's immediate thought upon seeing the crow, but she shook her head. The boy couldn't be the night crow, Sizelry had made that clear. How would a crow like this know her location? The boy was as enigmatic in his thinking as Sizelry. Creak. So, out of a desire to check, she opened the window. Then, the crow smartly walked into the room and spoke. Sarah Batella. Startled. Sarah's face froze for a moment, as she hadn't expected the crow to talk. Then, a smirk appeared on the crow's beak. She was seeing a crow smile for the first time. I'll share a bit of my immortality in exchange for your vitality. So play dead. The moment Sarah heard those words, she suddenly realized darkness was seeping into her vision. Black. Her sight vanished abruptly, and she inadvertently swallowed her annoyance and slumped onto the floor. Her sense of equilibrium had been shattered by the darkness in an instant. Something had happened to her without any opportunity to react. What on earth? As her tensed body was on high alert, she drew her sword, focusing intently on any perceptible movements through the darkness. When her cold sweat began to trickle down her cheeks, her vision slowly returned. Unbeknownst to her, a black star had formed and disappeared in her eyes. Sarah quickly lifted her head. But the crow that should have been at the window had long vanished. What had she just experienced? A cloud of unanswered questions filled her mind. Crash. Suddenly, the ceiling above her collapsed. As a golden aura shone through the debris, Sarah's body reacted swiftly, slicing her sword towards the ceiling. Scrari ape. Sarah's sword clashed with an adversary's spear, leading to a chaotic aftermath that turned everything around her into a mess. The collision of auras shattered furniture and sent debris scattering, with the window unable to withstand the force and shattering as well. But there was no time to worry about that. Spear after spear jabbed through the dust cloud from the collapsed ceiling. Sarah quickly regrouped and parried with her sword. Yet, the force behind the spear was far beyond her imagination. Ugh! Driven against the wall by the overwhelming assault, Sarah's eyes bulged in disbelief. She had never expected to be overpowered. She had reached the level of master. But now, she was being pushed back by her opponent. It meant that her adversary was also a master-level combatant. Who is this? There are many at the threshold of becoming master class talents. However, even with that consideration, their numbers worldwide did not exceed a thousand. It was impossible for Sarah not to know someone at master level within the Empire. As her eyes pierced through the smokescreen, Sarah gasped in recognition. There stood a young woman in her twenties with black hair. With her thin eyes and long wavy hair, and a distinctly voluptuous figure, she was gazing back at Sarah tranquility. You are. Sarah was profoundly shocked as she recognized the woman's identity. Mary Diana from House Diana, the noble house known as the candidates for the Imperial Lance. She was the one holding a spear aimed at Sarah. But Sarah was shocked for a different reason. It was because her skills far surpassed her own. Barely legal age. A master at that age? Even among the feared adversaries of the Empire in Balheim, she would be considered exceptional. Moreover, the Mary that she knew most definitely was not a talent of this caliber. Was she concealing her abilities? Sarah hastily parried another incoming spear thrust. Each strike of the spear was tremendously powerful. It could even be beyond her own capabilities. The thought crossed her mind, and Sarah's eyes hardened. It didn't matter if she was the daughter of the Diana family. If she didn't give it her all right now, she would die. Sarah, the only sort of sizelry, could not fall here. Boom! As the walls of the room crumbled instantly, Sarah was sent rolling across the floor. Simultaneously, her eyes turned fierce as a red aura enveloped her sword, emanating from her grasp. She was a berserker. The longer the battle raged, the more the aura within her body surpassed her limits and drew out unimaginable strengths. This was the rampage transformation she had mastered. Upon activation, it took a significant toll on her body, but there was no time to worry about that now. 
Swish. Sensing her intent, her adversary commanded a series of rapid thrusts that tore through the wall, aiming to finish her off. The spear, imbued with golden aura, was so forceful that Sarah barely managed to deflect it. But that doesn't mean I can't block it. If that was the case, she'd have to draw upon the rampage transformation, even if it strained her body in the short term. Crack. As the spear collided with her defenses, blood spilled from Sarah's lips. At the same moment, her muscles bulged wildly like a raging beast, shredding through her clothes as her sword surged forward with explosive force toward Mary. Rampage transformation. The insanity blood outburst. That was the moment. Crack. Sarah stood frozen in place, her body rigid. Snap, drip. Blood gushed forth from her mouth in waves. Sarah's eyes shook uncontrollably. Her heart had been impaled by a spear without her even seeing the motion of the thrust. Skill. With blood flowing, she realized the force that had pierced her was a skill. Mary's skill excel. It was an acceleration that drastically increased the body's speed. This powerful. Mary's skill was one she had heard about, but she never imagined it could outpace her own eyes even when rampage transformation was activated. Excel, when wielded by a master-class combatant, exhibited absurd power. She could be certain now. Once she grew more powerful and eventually reached the next level of emperor, no one in the world would be able to withstand her spear. Sarah Badella, take joy in dying for the empire. As her vision blurred and blood rang in her ears, Mary's voice resonated with Sarah. Simultaneously, she recalled the words of the crow from before. Play dead, it said? When she was actually dying. Sarah's consciousness faded to nothing after that. After impaling Sarah's heart and realizing she had ceased breathing, Mary retracted her spear. Then, catching the collapsing body with one hand, Mary sighed. She felt a slight throb in her body from using Excel, but it was bearable. Although she had not reached her peak level, facing a masterclass opponent like this was always going to come with acceptance of such consequences. Has it already been a year since I returned to the past with memory transference? After her memory was transferred back, she had immediately joined Sigrid, her closest ally. Thankfully, Sigrid had also successfully had her memories transferred. The two of them went straight in search of Arthur. Their beloved hero, whom they desperately wanted to find and protect the world alongside. However, somehow, Arthur was nowhere to be found. Even though he had promised to be there when they all awoke after he led the regression that night. Lord Arthur, where have you gone? Mary bit her lip in frustration. Even after waiting days, Arthur did not return, and she scoured the entire empire looking for him, but he was not to be found. Moreover, for some reason, Abella hadn't appeared either. Inquiries at the Red Magic Tower led to the discovery that she had suddenly vanished. What on earth? What was happening? At least Sigrid was being reassuring, saying that if it were Arthur, he would soon come back. Mary had nearly spent her days in despair, thinking Arthur had disappeared. The only thing I can do now is to support Sigrid, the third princess, and become the mightiest spear. And so, she killed Sarah in accordance with Sigrid's instructions. Sigrid was currently away on other business. Thus Mary had to ensure the job was done properly, entrusted by Sigrid who believed in her more than anyone else, for the future of their empire. Thunk, thunk. At that moment, footsteps resounded. When Mary lifted her head, there was a giant man with stitched marks all over his face. He was none other than Ebelask's thirteenth corpse. Holding Sarah's heart now was Mary. As the heart was entrusted to her by Sigrid, Ebelask had no choice but to obey her commands. Following the orders he'd received earlier, he carefully placed Sarah's body inside the sack he had brought. Then, shouldering the sack, he turned to leave. Wait a moment, please. Mary called out to detain corpse number 13. Caught by surprise, number 13 paused in his tracks. Corpses do not have emotions, but the one controlling number 13 was none other than Ebelask. With cold sweat dripping down her brow, Ebelask, watching from beyond the corpse, grew increasingly nervous, fearing she had been found out. I still haven't been informed who among the corpses attended the martial arts tournament. 
One of the Night Crow's corpses had participated in the martial arts tournament. On the surface, it was under the order of the second prince. The second prince intended to expand his influence, making it known that he controlled the Night Crow, his choice of demonstration was the martial arts tournament. Of course, that was a plot designed by Sigrid and Mary in advance. To clearly show the entire empire that the second prince had control of the Night Crow. Thus, after having Sarah kill Sizelry, they planned to frame the act as done by the Night Crow under the second prince's command. Needless to say, they had already constructed a motive for the second prince to kill Sizelry. Now if Sizelry were to die, the second prince would be unable to escape imprisonment. Still, after watching the martial arts tournament, I have a good guess who it might be. So, Mary knew that the Night Crow had been competing in the tournament. The issue was that she had been too busy with other matters to inquire about the identity of that Night Crow member. Is he the boy who goes around with a crow? She asked for confirmation. Yes, that's correct. The reply came promptly from corpse number 13. You have taste. To openly flaunt the identity of the Night Crow by using that crow. Ah, was that Sigrid's command? You wouldn't possess such ingenuity. Though she maintained a facade of elegance, Mary was a sharp-tongued critiquer and smiled wryly at the remark. However, number 13 showed no expression, leaving Mary feeling discontented. You may go now. Number 13 bowed his head and began walking away. Ebel asked, controlling number 13, may have been tense, but Mary did not really suspect her. Since Mary was holding her heart, Ebel asked could not afford to betray her. On that note, Ebel asked had a pretty cute one in tow. Mary remembered the boy named Crad for a moment. Ebel Ask, who typically managed only grotesque corpses, also had such a corpse in her collection. If only it wasn't just a corpse. Mary pondered for a while before shaking the thought from her head. S. It must have been too long since she'd been apart from Arthur for such buried proclivities to resurface. Lord Arthur, please show yourself soon. Wishing for his return, Mary began to walk on. The main event of the Athania Empire's martial arts tournament. Unbeknownst to most, the finals had already ripened to their climax. Surprisingly, instead of the adult division which should have garnered the most attention, it was the boys' division that captured the audience's eyes. The reason was none other than Crad, the protagonist of rumors said to belong to the Night Crow. The boy with a crow perched on his shoulder and his eyes a narrow slit. His power was as intriguing as his appearance, never once drawing the sword at his waist throughout the whole tournament, overpowering everyone with his fists alone. It was to the extent that people began to wonder if the sword was merely for show. With various suspicions gathered, the final match began. The moment you've all been waiting for. Woo-woo. A thunderous cheer erupted, shaking the boys' division stadium. The largest indoor stadium in the empire was packed full, everyone eagerly anticipating the final match. We will now commence the last match of the boys' division for this martial arts tournament. The announcer bellowed as he raised his left arm exuberantly. The first of our two finalists. A boy from a rural village with the ambition to one day stop world erosion and protect world peace. Peely I. As the announcer called out, a boy entered the arena. Approaching with a timid posture, he was a simple-looking boy of fourteen. Pelei, go for it. Hey man, don't lose to some night crow. Several people cheered more than expected because he was like a beacon of hope for the common folk. Unlike the nobility, he was a plain boy from a rural village who had trained with the sword to reach the final round of the martial arts tournament. The commoners were inspired by him and supported him even more vigorously. And his opponent is, the announcer continued, perfectly capturing the crowd's interest with a sly smile, infamous for being associated with the underworld's renowned family, rumored to belong to the Night Crow. Crad. Following the announcer's shout, suddenly a crow took off from the contestant entry tunnel. Ka. The crow's intense call drew the attention of the crowd as it took flight. Crows, a symbol of ominousness, had heightened the anticipation for a moment, and then silence fell. Thud thud. Ads by Pub Future. From the entrance, a boy slowly emerged. Beneath his jet black hair, eyes closed neatly, it was impossible to guess what he was thinking, 
and the aura about him created an odd tension. As he ascended to the stage amidst that atmosphere, the crow in the sky slowly alighted upon his shoulder. Understood. I won't make you do this again. Muttering to himself, as he raised his head, the crowd's cheers surged once more throughout the stadium. Night Crow! I bet on you winning first place. Win! Show them what an assassination house is all about. Cheering emanated from all sides as Crouch looked forward. Pelei came into his view. That ordinary-looking boy he was seeing again. But despite his appearances, Pelei was part of the Sky Generation and had even attended Rahalan Academy. I didn't expect to face him here. Those hopeful eyes were just as vibrant now as they were in the past. Crouch remembered clearly the day that light had faded from Pelei's eyes. Unfortunately, right now, he had other matters to attend to than facing him. Crouch had already achieved his set objective. Crad. At that moment, Pelei suddenly addressed him. Are you really with the Night Crow? Such innocence. Instead of answering, Crouch simply loosened his neck. After all, his end of the competition was essentially complete. The remaining task was to stir things up so that the other side could spring into action on a grand scale. It would be better for you to come out and say it then. Unexpectedly, Pelei blurted out something surprising. The reason for this martial arts tournament is for the Afania royal family to recruit additional students for Rahalan Academy. Since you and I have made it to the finals, we'll surely get the chance to enroll. This information had spread far and wide already. While it wasn't particularly newsworthy anymore, Pelei relayed it as if proud of the fact. Rahalan Academy is an independent institution, immune to interference from any nation. There, you'll be able to escape from the Night Crow. A story filled with dreams and hope followed. Regrettably, Rahalan Academy wasn't quite that resplendent a place. Still relatively new, Rahalan Academy didn't possess significant power. That's why, except for its initial stage, it eventually got tossed about in the power struggles between the Empire and various kingdoms. Looking back now, there were several reasons why Rahalan Academy had been swayed in such a manner. But resolving this wasn't immediate, nor was it of interest to Crouch. Pili I. For the first time in the competition, Crouch drew his sword. As the audience erupted into cheers once again, Crouch pointed his sword at Pili I. Being too full of hope will leave you unable to overcome the despair that crashes down upon you. What? Begin the match. The advice was lost on him as the referee's call announced the start of the fight. Pelei was the one to open the onslaught in combat. He approached with an unusual gait, gliding as if sliding across the ground. This is a unique footwork he developed himself. The place where Pelei grew up was the coldest region in the empire, near the north. A place that saw snow all year round. Having grown up there, Pelei adapted to the slippery ice and snow and, as a result, developed more efficient footwork. He hadn't named it yet, but Crouch knew the name. 10,000 Leaps A footwork that meant you could traverse a thousand li, the world units of length, with only 10 steps. This would certainly startle someone seeing it for the first time. Especially since opponents might assume there's a considerable distance, only to find him closing in quickly. As evidence of this, Pelei had, in just an instant, approached right up to Crush's nose. Pelei was the only commoner to have climbed into the sky generation solely through talent and effort. At this time, he was as formidable as Annex had been. Clang! However, it was bad luck on who he faced. Eh? Pelei, who had aimed for Crush's waist with a feint, was caught off guard as his sword was twisted away by Crush's. His eyes flew wide open as if he couldn't comprehend how his opponent seemed to predict where his weapon would go. I don't think you're in the position to be giving others advice. Provoked by Crouch, Pelei bit his lip and launched into a rapid succession of sword strikes. A sword honed by swinging a thousands times to cut down trees, and a hundred thousand to cleave through rock. The calluses on his hand alone told of how diligently Pelei had trained with his sword. Pelei was indeed shaped by a lifetime of diligent practice. Yet there was something more valuable than that practice. Knowing your opponent. 
someone who, more than anyone else, needed to stay behind the scenes, had the chance to observe the sky generation the most. That person was himself. My sixth sense. An aura surrounding Krausha's body honed a new kind of sensation. As a result, Krausha's sword was already positioned where Pelei's attacks were destined. Feints, true strikes, and any small habits Pelei had, including his finishing moves. Krausch knew them all. It was the only talent he possessed that he himself hadn't realized. A talent to observe and remember every little thing about others, precisely because he owned nothing himself. Certainly, in the past, this talent had been useless. No matter how well he observed others and how quick his intuition was, all he received was a bad reaction. However, at this moment, that talent began to bloom for the first time. Clang! 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 Every sword that Pelei swung turned to knot before Crouch. Even the audience involuntarily lost themselves in the sight. Pelei's sword, which he handled so deftly, moved so fast it was hard to follow with the eye. Even the Imperial Knights would exclaim admiringly at his skill level, hardly believable for his age group. But Crouch was one step ahead. Every chain of consecutive strikes that Pelei continued seemed to play into the palm of Krausch's hand. None of his assaults ever reached Krausch, they were all blocked. Dull sword. Despite moving apparently slower than the opponent, this sword technique arrived first in the opponent's space. Krausch had now completely stepped into this realm. You can't reach me. What's that? As people saw this, they began to fall into silence. Those who were quietly rooting for Pelei gradually started to quiet their voices. It was an overwhelming force. An overwhelming presence that suggested Pelei could do nothing to win against Krausch. Everyone present was experiencing that overwhelming feeling with their own eyes. Ha 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 ha. All of a sudden, the loud laughter of Crimson Garden burst forth in the sky. Yes, my boy. She spread the wings of the crow in the sky as if rejoicing over the current situation. That's your only trick. If you have nothing, then take everything from your opponent. Show them all your greedy moves. Dull sword is a sword technique that takes the opponent's space. The opponent's sword might be headed somewhere, but this technique seizes the space first. Ironically, dull sword suited Crouch better than anyone else. He needed to take everything to rise above. Ugh, irk. Pelei's choked sounds echoed. Surely it was he who was on the offensive. Yet he kept retreating step by step. No matter how vigorously he swung his sword, he couldn't advance forward. Because Krausch's sword had seized all the space he possessed. Krausch was slightly shorter than him. Yet, for some reason, whenever his sword was blocked, his presence seemed to grow larger and larger. Pelei felt the same sensation of swinging against a rock when facing Krausch. Could he ever split this rock? That immense feeling consumed him. Pelei. At that moment, Krausch's voice echoed. As Pelei lifted his head, he suddenly saw that Krausch's sword was already before his throat. Ha, ha. Pelei gasped for air. The sword that Pelei swung advanced only about one centimeter from his throat. Although it was Pelei who swung it. The cold sweat running down Pelei's cheek reached Krausch's sword. They were that close. Grow stronger. And to Pelei, Krausch spoke. So that even if your hope shatters, you'll still leave behind an ember. Leaving behind these enigmatic words, Krausch then drove his fist into Pelei's solar plexus. Inch power. With two resounding impacts, Pelei spit out saliva and collapsed. With that, Krausch turned around. Using dull sword also impacted Krausch, his breath filling his mouth, jabbing his lungs haphazardly, but he maintained his poker face. And at that moment, Wa -wa -a -wa -a. an unprecedented cheer erupted throughout the stadium. It was indeed an overwhelming display of dull sword. Nobody could watch that and not shout. Ah, the winner is. Coming back to his senses belatedly, the announcer raised his hand. Crad. The announcer declared the victory, and another enormous cheer blasted through the stadium. K.R. Ad. 
At that moment, Crouch turned his head toward a voice he heard behind him. He hadn't expected Pelei to regain consciousness so quickly after being hit with inch power. Will we, meet again? Really, it's no wonder you were part of the Sky Generation. Seeing him doggedly hold onto his consciousness, Crouch said. Yeah, if it's the Academy. Go, tee it. With that, Pelei completely lost awareness. They would meet again. Although, it might not be in the same guise next time. Thank you. Crouch, I'll work harder than the curse you took from me. I'll show you I can protect the world. For a brief moment, a memory surfaced. It was what Pelei had said when he returned cursed with world erosion, and Crouch had stolen his curse away. It was a thanks he hadn't heard in a long time. But just a month later, Pelei slowly met death, torn limb by limb by the world's erosion perpetrator. Crouch's fists clenched tight. Don't worry. Pelei. Then, slowly, Crouch's head lifted. This time, it's my turn to protect. Not others, but himself. And for that purpose. Sigrid. He would have to thwart her plans. Amidst the ongoing battle between Pelei and Crouch. Seated in the best viewing spot in the stadium, Prince Siphonophania clapped his hands in enjoyment. Ah, truly well done. That's what we expect from the Night Crow. Believing Crouch to fully be a member of the Night Crow, Siphon was smiling brightly, apparently taking great pleasure in the event. Beside him was Ebelask, whom he had forcibly brought along. Dragged out by the second prince, Ebelask was biting her lip and showing a look of discomfort, not wishing to be among so many people. After all the praise I've lavished on you, you don't even respond? What poor manners! At that moment, Siphon glared at Ebelask with his jiggling belly in disapproval. Ah, that, your highness, I was concentrating on controlling the corpses. I am delighted to have pleased you. Ha, huh, as you should be. A dog of the royal family should know its place. According to Sigrid's plan, Ebelask's heart was in the possession of the second prince. So when she stammered her response, the second prince was pleased. Ha, huh, I should have brought champagne. A joyful occasion like this and no drink makes it incomplete. Siphon chuckled with a greasy smile. If he could leverage the power shown by the Night Crow to win over the nobility, then becoming emperor seemed within his grasp. Just as Siphon was enjoying the moment, suddenly the sound of footsteps echoed near the private room connected to the corridor. What's this? Who dares to intrude here? It's the Black Dragon Knights. Stand aside. There's been an incident. Black, Black Dragon? Panic-stricken voices of maids and servants resonated from outside. What is this racket? Drowsily, Siphon turned his head around. Then, with a bang, the door swung open, revealing knights clad in black uniforms. The Imperial Black Dragon Knights. Unlike the Empire's main three knight divisions, the White Dragon, Heaven Dragon, and Imperial Dragon, the Black Dragon Knights mainly managed incidents and accidents that occurred within the Empire. One reason for their notorious reputation was their policy of never leaving criminals alive. Their appearance here meant there was a criminal present. What's the meaning of this intrusion? Are you not aware of who is present here? The second prince stood up from his chair, visibly enraged. Ads by Pub Future. The audacity of them to barge into a room where royalty was residing was intolerable. Second Prince Siphonifania. At that moment, the person addressing him slowly stepped forward. The only one dressed in something other than the black uniform, her sensual figure drew the eye. Even Siphon's expression softened for a brief moment because of her appearance. She was none other than Mary Diana. For a moment, Siphon was mesmerized by the sight of her, but he quickly regained his composure and spread his irritation. How dare you call the name of the second prince so casually, without any honorifics? Are you out of your mind? You are under arrest for suspicion of conspiring to murder the fourth princess, Sizalri Afania. What? Sizalri? Siphon was flabbergasted by Mary's announcement. Why would he murder Sizalri? Why would he kill that fool, only capable of tomfoolery?
but the black dragon knights were approaching to apprehend him following Mary's command. Seeing their stern expressions, Siphon frowned. What nonsense is this? I haven't killed Sizelry. A direct order to murder the fourth princess by the night crow has been discovered. Madness. That's absurd. I've never written such order. However, the black dragon knights remain silent. Ebel ask. Kill these rascals at once. How dare they attempt to arrest royalty over such baseless accusations? Ah, but, that. Ebelask looked around in confusion, the realization that it was too early for this dawning upon her. Who has been murdered? A scoffing voice interrupted. In the momentary pause of the Black Dragon Knights and Mary. Click clack click clack. The sound of footsteps resonated, and someone emerged from the door through which the knights had entered. The woman, with her flowing blue hair and seductive smile, was none other than Sizel Riafania, who appeared alongside her attendant Sarah Betella. Facing the stern Mary and the Black Dragon Knights, Sizelry showed an astonishing reaction. Am I to understand that I have been murdered? Sizelry felt her arms and body. Then she tilted her head seeing the Black Dragon Knights. How strange. Sarah, have I been murdered? No, your highness. You're perfectly fine. There wasn't even an assassin in sight. Hmm, Sarah says so. Yet somehow I've been killed without either of us knowing. Something's amiss here. She mused so, slowly smiling, then abruptly, her smile ceased. Black Dragon Knight's Deputy Commander Zenkal. As she pinpointed one from the Black Dragon Knights, in an instant, Sarah vanished from her side. Bring him here. Thud. Cough. A rugged punch resounded, and the Deputy Commander collapsed to the ground. Sarah was originally affiliated with the Imperial Dragon Knights, holding the rank of Deputy Commander. Sarah naturally held the upper hand in combat, and given the shock of seeing the supposedly dead Sizelry, he had no chance to react. And he was actually a mole implanted by Mary and Sigrid within the Black Dragon Knights. How can this be? Mary maintained her poker face while inwardly showing astonishment. She couldn't comprehend the current situation at all. Certainly, she had killed Sarah with her own hands. And Ebelask should have slit Sizelry's throat as a corpse. Both Sizelry and Sarah were very much alive and unharmed. The unfathomable circumstances continued. In that moment, the eyes of Sizelry and Mary met. With a slight smirk, Sizelry snorted a contemptuous laugh. Mary realized what it implied. The fourth princess knew it all. She, known for her genius intellect, more so than others. That's why Sigrid had wanted to eliminate Sizelry in advance. If indeed she had anticipated this plan and acted accordingly, she'd become a major stumbling block in the future. Moreover, there was the issue of failing to carry out Sigrid's orders. As a knight serving Sigrid, she was bound to fulfill her liege's commands. I must kill her. Mary's eyes sparked with determination but she couldn't do it herself. In that case. The traitor. No matter how Sarah returned to life, it was clear Ebelask was behind it. Using Ebelask, who dared betray Sigrid. Immediately, she tightly gripped Ebelask's heart from her pocket. Ugh, what? Ebelask clasped her chest where her heart was, her eyes widening. It was because Mary was implanting a command into her heart. Oh no. Ebelask's face went deathly pale. With the tightening pain came cold sweat cascading down her face, and she began to lose control over her body. At the time, Crouch had only prepared the activation for Black Hood but had not used it. If her heart were gone, Mary or Sizelry would have certainly noticed something was amiss. So her heart was still firmly with Mary. Surely, Mary intended to use her to kill Sizelry here and then to eliminate her as well. Hack, hack. K.R. Kra. She struggled to break free from the command. But she couldn't undo the heart etched orders. A ha ha. Rumble rumble. With her scream as a start, the ground shook as if an earthquake hit. As the Black Dragon Knights drew their swords too late and Siphon panicked, bodies began to rise from beneath Ebelask's feet. 
Mary's eyes flashed with realization. This was the end. What is this? Ebel asked. What are you doing? Monster! Kill her! Protect the prince and the princess! The knights of the black dragon shouted as they prepared to clash with the corpses at that instant. Abruptly! Suddenly the surging corpses stopped moving, as though frozen in place. The black dragon knights, who had just been about to swing their swords, froze as well. What? A tone of confusion escaped from Mary's mouth. As she raised her head, she saw Abelask sitting there with tears streaming down her face, her expression relieved at the absence of pain. She had clearly etched the command to kill Sizelry into that heart. But why did it stop? Right when Mary was about to squeeze the heart anew, she realized with shock that her pocket was empty. My heart is gone? The heart she had been holding had vanished without a trace. Unforeseen circumstances had Mary's eyes widened in disbelief. Her thoughts hastened. Failure to kill Sizelry. Failure to depose Siphon. Loss of Ebelask's heart. Those three intersecting failures rattled her mind for an instant. And that led to her bad habit. When the situation turned sour, her habit was to act first. That impulse led her to her first priority, to kill Sizelry. At this instant, Sarah had just taken down the deputy commander, leaving Sizelry all alone. Sarah could not even block Mary, who was intent on taking advantage of Sizelry's vulnerability. Thud! With a stride, her figure blurred. Explosive energy surged out of her, known to be one of the mightiest spears, shattering the ground, darting forward in the blink of an eye. Excel! Her body accelerated once more. With godly speed added to her momentum, the world seemed to slow down around her. Even as Sizel belatedly noticed and tried to dodge, her reaction looked slower than a worm to Mary. Divine Spear True to the title she once bore. Die, Sizel Reifania. The spear, gathering a flash of light, surged towards Sizel neck. Crack! With the following noise, a dust storm erupted like an explosion. In between the swirls of dust, shock registered in Mary's eyes beneath her flying black hair because what she felt was not the sensation of slicing flesh. The sound that resounded was of metal clashing against metal. Mary's eyes quivered once. After all, this was her spear, which even killed her master in the past. Someone had blocked her spear right in front of her. A boy belching black flames from his sword. The narrow-eyed boy was none other than the corpse being controlled by Ebelask. At that moment, the boy's lips slowly parted. Whether in the past or present. He looked at Mary, filling his mouth with a sneer. That simple mind of yours shows no improvement. Despite the boy's composed appearance, his body trembled violently, evidence of the strain from forcefully blocking her spear. Right as a momentarily petrified Mary was about to retract her spear and launch another attack. What are you doing? Seize this woman at once. Sizelry's heated command continued to echo. Sarah, who had already unleashed her fury, charged in swiftly, followed by the Knights of the Black Dragon. In an instant, Mary, pressed into a defensive stance, bit her lip in frustration. A mistake. Even if her plans had been exposed, she should have backed off here. In her panic, she had narrowed her thinking. Considering annihilating them all, she realized there was no madness greater than that. Even if she killed them, the swords of the Empire would come hunting her. If she could face them later, perhaps, but with her current abilities, she would die at their hands. Running away is not an option either. Doing so would prevent her from even entering the Academy. She could find a way out of this situation if she tried, but running would likely prevent her from ever setting foot in the Empire or the Academy. In the end, she gave up the fight and casually dropped her spear. The Black Dragon Knights quickly restrained her. Mistress Sigrid, Master Arthur. With her head slumped, Mary was taken away by the Black Dragon Knights. Along with her grinding her teeth as if enraged. Ebelask, Sizel Reifania. She left with a resolute thought to inevitably kill those two women who had disrupted her plan. Stupid woman. Krosh scoffed as he watched Mary being taken away. 
Surely that woman hadn't noticed his identity and only harbored resentment towards Abelask. Of course. She wouldn't have suspected that Crouch had returned in place of Arthur. She had probably erased his existence from her mind from early on. In her memory, he was nothing more than a tool for stealing or a curse. Are you all right? Just then, Sizelry called out to Crouch. At her expression, Crouch heaved a light sigh. Damn, that hurts. His arms were a total mess right now. That foolish woman used all the power of the extreme poison needle yet still managed to wreck his arms just by blocking it. And his favorite sword was now bent. Truly a divine spear. An apt nickname indeed. If she had targeted him from the beginning, he would have certainly been killed. He still had a long way to go before he could match her. Why on earth would you do such a foolish thing? Sizelry scolded Crouch, attempting to calm herself from the shock. I was wearing a protective amulet from the royal family this entire time. Crouch belatedly noticed the necklace adorning Sizelry's neck. She must have been looking for it while undercover. Always so prepared, isn't she? Even as he thought he shouldn't have bothered interfering, Crouch lowered his arms. It's enough that you survived. Sizelry's eyes widened briefly. Abelask. At that moment, the floor beneath Crouch called out to Abelask. As black liquid began to rise beneath his feet, Sizelry, realizing he was about to leave, hurriedly shouted. Wait, you should at least get some treatment. She knew. Lingering here would not only put Ebelask but also Crouch at risk of being detained for questioning. Yet her mouth moved on its own. Don't worry. Pain is something I'm used to. But suddenly, along with the crow on his shoulder, Crouch disappeared into the black liquid before her eyes. Watching Ebelask vanish in a blink, Sizelry's face briefly contorted with confusion. What kind of nonsense is that? He had left her with words her brilliant mind couldn't comprehend. The least he could have done was say something fitting for a farewell. Sizelry drew a long breath and lifted her head. Beside her stood Sarah, a sorry expression on her face. It was a reaction stemming from her failure to protect Sizelry from Mary Spear as her attendant. Sarah! Sizelry said, looking out the window. It seems necessary to attend Rahalan Academy. I will make the arrangements. Even without Crouch mentioning it, she realized that he was heading for Rahalan Academy, and for the first time in a long while, she allowed herself a genuine smile. Well now, I should at least have provided some treatment for his pain. She murmured, turning away and looking forward to the day she would meet Crouch again. Abelask? What, what just happened? Only Siphon's cry of confusion rang alone, entirely unaware of the situation. Having left the stadium with Ebelask, Crouch massaged his arm. It was swollen but not broken. I'll put some potion on it and it should be better in a few days. Thinking he needed to visit an alchemy store before leaving, Crouch looked to his side. Ebelask was there, looking at him like a puppy that needed to poop. He had almost forgotten about her. Crouch rummaged through his pocket and pulled out her heart. Take it. He casually tossed the heart to Ebelask. Ha! Huh? Surprise washed over Ebelask's face as she caught the heart. She hadn't expected him to give it back so easily. Are you sure about this? She was a carrier of world erosion. A necromancer of immeasurable value, enough for the royal palace to warrant using her directly. When she questioned if it was really okay for him to release her so easily, Crouch simply shrugged. We made a deal, didn't we? Crouch knew Ebelask's personality. She preferred hiding away rather than causing harm to others. To manipulate her using her own heart would only breed more annoying issues. More importantly, did you get what I asked for? Ah, um, the golden dragon grass, right? Ebelask fumbled in her pocket and took out the golden dragon grass. Crouch promptly snatched it up. How much he had toiled to secure this one item. Now, all that's left is to go back. Having no further desire to remain in this detestable empire, Crouch turned to leave. I'm off then. Uh, oh, uh. Ads by Pub Future. In response, Ebelask wore a perplexed expression. 
She looked around in confusion and started following Crouch soon after. Why are you following me? Minutes later, Crouch turned to Ebalask with a disgruntled expression. At first, he thought they happened to be heading in the same direction, but she had followed him all the way to the outskirts of the imperial capital. Well, but, I am now a fugitive of the empire. I have to leave somewhere, don't I? Well, that is true. It was unlikely the royal palace would just let Ebalask be. And if Sigrid is involved, she'd rather blame everything on Ebalask than lose Mary. It'd be claimed Mary was merely exploited. Public opinion might not easily sway, but somehow, she would evade execution. Mary was foolish, but her physical body and capabilities were undeniably real. Even now in such a state, there was none as strong as Mary in dealing with world erosion. Hard-headed with a body like stone. Sigrid wouldn't want to lose such a loyal neat shield. Krosh couldn't stop that from happening either. However, Krosh's eyes gleamed brightly. Through this ordeal, Mary's pride would be utterly demolished. What followed didn't need to be said. The outcome that would end up in Krosh's hands would speak for itself. All right, I can understand that, but you're saying you'll follow me until we're out of the empire. Is that correct? Where will you go? She, already aware that Krausch wasn't from the Empire, questioned him. To that question, Krausch had nothing in particular to hide. Starlon. Starlon? But that's where Balheim is, terribly dangerous. It may be dangerous to you. Why? You're a world erosion carrier too, aren't you? Hearing what she said next, Krausch wore a look of disbelief. You can't underestimate Balheim. They're terrifying. They might swallow our heads whole while we're alive and put them in their stomachs. Krosh wasn't sure how Ebalask perceived Balheim, but right now, that wasn't the issue at hand. Wait, did you just say I'm a world erosion carrier? HM? Isn't that so? You used the power's essence, and it feels like you've deliberately made it weaker. I may not have noticed it when I was number 12, but seeing it up close, I understand. Unless you're a carrier or have experienced handling the power of world erosion directly, it might be unnoticeable. Krausch's expression grew serious. Was the power of world erosion he absorbed through extreme blood toxin making him appear as a fellow to other carriers? This was an aspect Krausch hadn't even imagined, so he turned to look at Crimson Garden. Then she, straightening her feathers with her beak, soon spoke. Didn't you know? I would have thought it was obvious. Eek, D did the crow just speak? Come to think of it, had Crimson Garden ever spoken in front of Ebalask? This is not exactly great news. Krosh crossed his arms and was briefly engrossed in thought. Being felt kin by world erosion carriers might allow him to blend in with them, but the downside was also clear. If Krosh hit among humans, his presence would be distinctly felt by those carriers. A misstep could lead to becoming targeted. World erosion carriers are not comrades but individuals. Now I get why Ebalask so readily believed me. Because we're both carriers. She must have quickly concluded that he would retrieve her heart with a special ability, given that many carriers possess quite bizarre talents. After a moment of contemplation, Krausch decided to dismiss the thoughts. I must absorb world erosion in any form anyway. The risk was there from the start. The silver lining was that ordinary people wouldn't be able to sense the power of world erosion. Crimson Garden, how will the black flame appear to others? It'll seem like an ominous black flame to them. Your black flame is currently purifying any leaking power of world erosion, thanks to Ignis. That was indeed welcome information. Using black flame might present him as ominous, but it wouldn't lead to being misconstrued as a world erosion carrier. After all, not being a carrier of world erosion or one of its kinds, very few beings in this world can distinguish between the power of world erosion itself. It's like they are observing the star marks inscribed by my kind. Krausch nodded in agreement. Previously, only Arthur or a few with unique eyes or senses could identify Crimson Garden species. The majority couldn't even detect the existence of her species. Furthermore, Krausch, you are fundamentally different from us. We are world erosion itself, whereas you've merged it with Aura. 
since the power of world erosion is diluted, most will think you're afflicted by a curse. Certainly, a curse was akin to world erosion. Others might perceive him as using black flame and the power of world erosion as being under a curse. So their eyes will see me as fighting while bearing a curse? Not much different from the past, isn't it? If so, Crouch was somewhat reassured. Being chased down as a world erosion carrier was something he'd rather avoid. During this time, Crimson Garden laughed. And that makes you a half-baked world erosion carrier. Crouch looked at Crimson Garden with an incredulous expression. No standard world erosion carrier would want anything to do with him. In essence, he now stood between the worlds of humanity and world erosion carriers. So absorbing more world erosion won't be noticeable. Is that what you're saying? They will certainly think the curse has either intensified or increased in number. Nodding as if convinced, Crouch acknowledged the logic. He realized this more urgently after tangling once with Mary. No matter how much he practiced, she was on an unreachable level to him. Only when everything was in Crouch's grasp could he surpass her. As for the risk, he had faced that head on long ago. There's nothing left to fear now. A non world erosion carrier, you say? Ha! Huh? Why? Amidst their conversation, Ebelask, listening silently, wore a puzzled look. This triggered her ample upper body to wobble, causing Crimson Garden to look at her disdainfully. Do breasts grow at the brain's nutritional expense? TSK TSK, surviving as a world erosion carrier yet being so idiotic. KR, Crad, she's mean. Why is she so rude? I'm about to get angry here? Watching the bickering between the two, Crouch remembered something he hadn't told Ebelask. Ebelask, my name isn't Crad. Correcting his name, Crouch introduced himself. I am Crouch Balheim. And her face morphed into sheer stupidity. I'm the youngest direct descendant of that Balheim you mentioned. Following that, a woman's piercing scream echoed throughout the corners of the Empire City. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. In the Empire's underground prison. Inside the Iron Prison, which holds only those sentenced to death. You foolish, how many times did I tell you to correct that personality? A woman in a white uniform with blue hair was yelling. As if missing both rabbits wasn't bad enough, what's this now? Assassination of royalty? Are you in your right mind? How many times did I tell you? Don't think. You only need to listen to my orders and Lord Arthur's. Her identity was none other than the third princess, Sigrid Ifania. True to her nickname, the Flower of the Empire, she had a beautiful face. But now, it was red as a beet, burning with rage. Why, 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 of all times, did you have to think and create this mess? When I said don't think, I meant don't do anything if variables arise. Before her, kneeling silently and listening, was none other than Mary Diana. Shackles, large and black, were fitted on her outstretched hands, and both her clothes and body were a mess. The result of being tossed about during the interrogation about the imperial assassination. No matter how well regarded the Diana family was within the empire, attempting royal murder was a grave sin. Even she could not escape the rigorous interrogation. As a result, there were bruises and scars all over her pale skin, and her clothes were almost completely torn, nearly exposing her entire body. It was fortunate she wasn't stripped bare. Iron Prison's procedure involved taking off all the prisoners' clothes, but they had turned a blind eye considering her age and status. I tried to clear the way, make it slightly easier for Lord Arthur before finding him. But you've ruined everything. Sigrid stomped on the floor as though she could not contain her anger. Mary was in no position to say anything in response. The only reason why we let you in was because of Lord Arthur's request. You might not know anything else, but your skills with the spear are exceptional. Within the Sky Generation, you're the one who stood at the forefront, and even at the last moments, you did not die, showing a willpower I must acknowledge. Mary Diana's nickname was the Divine Spear, and her other moniker was Indomitable. Unyielding and indomitable. In Crouch's eyes, she might be a woman like a buffalo, stubbornly charging into danger she should avoid. 
But ironically, at times, that stubbornness would become the unyielding spirit that kept the Sky Generation from falling apart and raised morale. Her valiant charge against world erosion, refusing to give up even in desperate situations, was acknowledged by all. Thus, Mary Diana was always at the forefront. She swung her spear at the very front lines, and even bloodied, she would rise to thrust her spear into her master's throat. Truly, the number of times she had single-handedly stopped world erosion were innumerable. This achievement was something even Sigrid had to admit. The body she was born with, the heavenly martial body, was beyond human physicality, a perfected form in and of itself. No wonder the wounds from her recent interrogation were already healing naturally. In terms of her physical body, she was the world's best. That's why she was called the Divine Spear. But that was a story limited to the world erosion. Now was a time when politics took precedence over the military might needed in world erosion. Her short-sightedness wasn't suited for politics at all. Why, God, why get just one thing, Sigrid sighed in despair. She wanted to immediately dismiss Mary, who could be executed at any moment for such an act, but she was too valuable to lose. Her monstrously strong body had to serve as the most reliable meat shield against world erosion. Hadn't Arthur said so? That she, who could control Mary, was the most beautiful. Sigrid looked back at Mary. Just seeing her, Sigrid's annoyance surged, accompanied by an almost physical pain. But she tried her best to suppress it. Mary might not realize it, but Sigrid was not so foolish. Even if she was not as cunning as Sizelry, at least Sigrid could see how the situation was playing out. This plan was supposed to have almost no variables. At worst, it would just be Sizelry somehow discovering something unseen by Sigrid herself and suspecting something. Sizelry was destined to die no matter what. She wouldn't have figured that Sarah would end up a corpse, about to kill herself. That's why Sigrid trusted the task to Mary. Once given her orders, Mary would faithfully execute them. Mary, you said you definitely killed Sarah. Yes, I definitely killed her with my own hands. Mary doesn't lie. Rather, to put it accurately, she can't lie. Especially not in front of Sigrid, she never harbors any falsehoods. If she said she killed someone, it means she really did. Sarah was no match for Mary's spear. Then she really must have killed her. But why was she still alive? According to Mary, Ebelask had betrayed them. That idiot committed betrayal? Sigrid snorted in derision. Ebelask was not that sort of conniving person. The woman who trembled and hid under blankets just from making eye contact, the one who cried while holding her heart in front of her, it was laughable to think she had committed betrayal. There must be something else. Sigrid's eyes narrowed slightly. This incident involved an unknown variable she was unaware of. The heart in the pocket suddenly disappeared, you said. I was holding it securely until then. I even gave the order. Sigrid stroked her slender chin and turned her head before turning her body as if she had come to an understanding. All right. Just stay there. Ha! Huh? Sig, Sigrid, do you mean continue staying in the prison? Isn't that obvious? You attempted royal murder. It'd be strange if you weren't executed immediately. Do you even realize I somehow prevented your execution? Mary's face went pale. You directly challenged the authority of the royal family right in front of them. With a bit of maneuvering on my part in framing it as Ebelask's unilateral actions, we barely managed. I wish. If you hadn't been switched to collaborating with Ebelask and the deputy of the Black Dragon Knights due to manipulation and threats, it would have been immediate execution for you both. She clicked her tongue and shook her head. Luckily, it was framed as the unfortunate case of a young lady and the second prince being misled by a world erosion carrier. Otherwise, it was to be an expedited execution for an attack on royal authority. The second prince was not without suspicion for Sizelry's murder. After all, he had openly been spreading rumors about holding the night crow. Thanks to that, he too was actively claiming he was merely used by Ebelask, and it was all her fault. Sigrid was powerfully supporting his claims, roping Mary into it as well. They had just managed to prevent an immediate execution with that angle. 
If anything had gone even slightly wrong, Mary wouldn't be here right now. The sharp minds of the empire would notice the inconsistencies in these claims and the current situation's loopholes, but these neutral parties will ultimately close their eyes. They too understand this is essentially a struggle for imperial succession, not an affront to royal authority. Unless the emperor directly intervenes, they will let the situation be as it unfolds. Of course, Sigrid must also accept the losses from this incident. The first prince knew Mary was on Sigrid's side and would surely attack wherever he could. Ha, huh, just how much am I going to lose because of this? The execution is avoided, barely, but what comes next is the problem. The first prince wouldn't attack openly since it wasn't a direct threat to him. But instead, he would be diligently devouring the second prince's power. To the first prince, the current situation was an unprecedented opportunity to absorb the second prince's faction, now virtually void of any right of succession. The helpless Sigrid was frustrated to near madness by this prospect. Moreover, Mary's situation was also difficult. The title of the strongest spear was now out of reach, and any imperial benefits she had were cut off. The Diana family was even considering disowning her, that's how dire the situation was. If the Diana household harbored an idiot challenging royal authority, they risked their entire lineage's ruin. So Sigrid was pulling out all the stops to prevent this and to downplay what Mary did as something short of challenging imperial authority. As a result, Mary was now being treated like a discarded daughter, not just by the empire, but by her own family too. Gently stirring public sympathy might allow Mary to stay within the empire somehow, but a difficult life ahead was inevitable. Well, not getting executed is fortunate enough. Sizelry was lucky to be from a forgotten line with weak claims to the throne and royal power. Had it been the first prince or even the second prince who had been targeted directly, it would have resulted in an immediate execution, no question. Sigrid looked at Mary with a mix of disbelief and pity. Then Mary cowered, her shoulders shrinking. I'll try to change the situation to avoid lifelong imprisonment. Wait there. Sigrid, then the... Academy. Mary, on the verge of tears, asked about Rahelan Academy. If she could go to the Academy, she would meet Arthur. It was the lone thought that had kept her going. She desperately wanted to enter Rahelan Academy, to see Arthur, feel his gentle smile, and the touch of his hand caressing her. Ha! Sigrid laughed in disbelief while looking at Mary. She had not expected Rahelan Academy to come out of Mary's mouth. This year is impossible. There's no way you'll be out of prison in time. Not sure about next year either, you might not be released until I, or Arthur, ascend to the throne. It's, it's impossible? I really want to go to the academy. Please, Sigrid, I'm sorry. It's all my fault, I'm begging you, just the academy. Mary. When Sigrid called her name again, Mary lay prostrate on the ground, tears streaming down her face. Sigrid, faced with that sight, grimaced in disgust. She wanted to kick that head and trample upon it immediately, but this was Arthur's chosen woman. She couldn't do such disgraceful acts to his lady, she wanted to remain cultured, at least in front of Arthur. I'll try to get you exiled to the academy. After all, you're just 16, a young girl misled by a world erosion carrier. They claim it's too harsh, so why not put that talent to use and benefit the empire by exiling you? If we spin the public narrative like this, it might just work. She couldn't promise anything, though. But perhaps giving Mary a shred of hope would be better than letting her simply collapse. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Sigrid. Really, thank you. Mary clung to the bars, tears scattering as she spoke. Though the prison bars were steel, heavier and harder than iron, they seemed to bend slightly under her touch, and Sigrid sensed that shocking strength once more. Yes, she endured because of that one physical aspect. You won't make it this year. There's no way you'll be out of prison in time. I don't know what will happen next year, so until then, don't do anything and just behave. Sigrid turned away from her, still crying and affirming her understanding, her mind continually churning about what unexpected variable had arisen this time. Rattle rattle. Inside the resonating carriage, Crouch was massaging his healed arm. It felt like it was no longer an issue. 
He had managed to acquire a suitable sword, so combat shouldn't be problematic either. Such an idiotic brute. Crosh cursed Mary as he lifted his head, and up front, he could see the coachman known as number 15, driving the horses. Crosh was currently inside a carriage. And not just any carriage, but one made of bone. Snore snore. Beside Crouch, Ebelask was snoring away in sleep. She was, in fact, the owner of this carriage. Pushing away her head, which kept trying to lean against him, Crouch gazed outside. Ever since they became fugitives of the Empire, Ebelask had no choice but to head to another kingdom. Hence, after much deliberation, she decided to follow Crouch. Reminding him that he took her out and thus should take responsibility, Ebelask had been insistent until Crouch knocked some sense into her and clicked his tongue. The carriage was a smooth ride, yet he had no particular wish to keep Ebelask at his side. How troublesome, this girl. Knowing her personality too well, the type to strut the moment given an inch, Crouch was contemplating whether to drop her off somewhere when suddenly, the crow sleeping on his knee shot up. When Crimson Garden possessed another species, her crow form tended to fall asleep like this. It seemed that Crimson Garden had returned. Child. I'm here. Responding to Crouch, Crimson Garden turned her head, and her crow form displayed a rather displeased expression. It seems some trouble has arisen. What kind of trouble? The kind that concerns your fiancé. Suspicion dawned in Crouch's eyes. His fiancé could only be Bianca. Ads by Pub Future. Explain in detail. A man called the Butcher has snuck into Harden Hearts. Crouch's body tensed up. Berkman, the Butcher, a madman who committed massacres in the Empire and escaped. Although Crouch knew he was hiding in Starlon, the mention of Harden Hearts had him springing to his feet. Bianca? That's where the problem is. She went missing after entering the mountain where the Butcher was rumored to have hidden. Ebelask? Huh, eh? Crouch yanked on Ebelask's clothes alongside him, forcefully waking her up. Drooling in her sleep, Ebelask was bewildered as Crouch shouted at her. Turn the carriage towards Hardenhearts now. That day marked the first time in a while since Crouch had raised his voice since returning to the past. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. The day Bianca returned to Hardenhearts seeking the the white snow hot young spore at Crouch's request. Bianca received a cold reception as expected. It was a familiar treatment. She was the cursed daughter. The most worthless daughter in hardened hearts. Whispers and hushed conversations from servants and maids about her were part of her daily life. Being the youngest daughter of hardened hearts was more like a curse to her. It's been a while. She hadn't felt it when staying at the Ballheim Pine Song residence. Now that she was experiencing it again, Bianca realized how comfortably she had lived at the Green Pine residence. There, Maid Ellie and Butler Ailey had treated her without whispering anything about her curse. They cared for her meticulously, never concerned about her being cursed. Of course, that makes sense. More than her own treatment, it was Crouch who received worse treatment. In Balheim, it was not the curse but a lack of talent that dragged him into the abyss. Bianca lifted her head to look out of the window. Who would have thought she would find the confines of Green Pine residence more welcoming than her own home? Life was truly unpredictable. I want to go back quickly. She began to miss Crouch. Click clack click clack. At that moment, footsteps were heard approaching. The sound was familiar to her because it belonged to someone in the family who despised her the most. A woman three years her senior and now sixteen years of age. Jenica Hardenhearts. She was none other than Bianca's sister. The instant she saw Bianca, Jenica contorted her snow-white eyebrows. As if she had seen something unpleasant. Why did you come back? Jenica's venomous words echoed at the same time. Seeing this, Bianca finally understood why she had felt more at ease with Crouch. I was the same as Crouch. A sense of kinship was there. The treatment Jenica gave her was strikingly similar to how Crouch was treated by his siblings. To Jenica, Bianca was a child born after causing the death of their mother during childbirth. Despite that, possessing a curse that left her unaware of sorrow, 
she would just look at Jenica's accumulated hatred and anger with her unpleasantly expressionless face. Therefore, Jenica despised her. The girl, who doubted whether she was even human due to her lack of emotions, might just be the curse her mother left behind after all. Now that she had returned, there was no way Jenica would leave her be. Ah, I see. You were abandoned by that half-witted fellow from Balheim, weren't you? Of course, how would someone as unsettling as you be accepted? As was her habit, Jenica spat out her venom. However, to Jenica's surprise, the usually silent Bianca turned to face her for the first time. He is no half-wit. The words uttered by Bianca were completely unexpected. What? Crouch is not a half-wit. And I will be returning soon. Jenica looked at Bianca incredulously, as if she were talking nonsense. But Bianca was as expressionlessly indifferent as always. That fact only aggravated Jenica more. Ah, is that so? Then go right now. This isn't a place where you should be. I can't go yet. Hearing her outburst, Bianca objected. I will go once I find the the white snow hot young spore. The white snow hot young spore? Why do you want to find that? Jenica stared at her in disbelief. The mushroom, used for raising body temperature, was a natural ingredient of a miracle elixir that could fill one's body with heat for an entire month after just one bite. Why would she need such a thing? A moment of consideration allowed Jenica to catch on to one possibility. You need it for that half-wit, don't you? For some reason, Bianca was helping Krausch Balheim's youngest. Although the purpose was unknown, everything Bianca did was distasteful to Jenica. Ah, look for it if you must. With that, Jenica snorted and spun around, leaving. The malicious smile on her face was something the emotionless Bianca could not quite comprehend. And so, Bianca looked everywhere for the the white snow hot young spore that Krausch had asked her to find. But no matter how much she searched, she could not purchase it. The reason was simple. Firstly, the the white snow hot young spore itself was so rare that very few had collected it. Secondly, it was none other than the sabotage of Jenica. Unlike Bianca, Jenica, with her eldest brother, was set to lead Hardenhearts. Her influence within Hardenhearts could be said to be the strongest. Which is why she instructed the merchants to never sell the the white snow hot young spore to Bianca. It was a truly spiteful act. I'm sorry, Miss Bianca. We don't have any of the white snow hot young spore in stock. Therefore, Bianca blinked in surprise as she was turned away from the final merchant. The two servants following her exchanged uncomfortable glances, knowing all too well what Jenica had done. For that reason, the two servants who followed Bianca had been instructed by Jenica herself to report everything Bianca was doing. Is it not available here either? Bianca was just as troubled. She had promised Crouch to bring the white snow hot yang spore, but now it looked like she would return empty-handed. Having returned to the mansion, she sunk into deep thought. It seems like Jenica might have interfered. It was a mistake to have mentioned the white snow hot yang spore to her. Hoping that Jenica would rather help find it to hasten her departure, it turned out she might have hated Bianca more than expected. In that case, Bianca started scouring the books of Hardenhearts. After pulling out several volumes and learning about the white snow hot yang spore, she nodded to herself. Hardenhearts is the oldest family in the north. As such, even the detailed distribution areas of the white snow hot yang spore were documented. Perhaps the merchants didn't disclose the exact location to maintain the price, fearing that the value would drop if everyone knew where to find it. It might be easier to find than I thought. With that in mind, Bianca quickly gathered her clothes and belongings. If no one around her would help, she would simply have to do it herself. Such a decision was undeniably naive, characteristic of a child. No matter how mature she was reputed to be due to her scarce range of emotions, she was still only 13 years old. Her thought process was inclined towards the simplest solution. I'll find it quickly and come back. With such fearless determination, she embarked on the mountain hike alone. Jenica, upon hearing about her actions, wore an incredulous expression. Is she an idiot? To take the mountains of Hardenhearts so lightly. 
she found it incomprehensible. It's unavoidable for someone born in Harden Hearts to be familiar with the mountains and snow. However, the mountains of Harden Hearts were not easy places where a 13 year old child could wander around. Especially the location where the white snow hot yang spore was said to exist, deep in the mountain woods. It was not a place she could reach on her own. At this rate, the likelihood of her getting stranded was almost certain. Ha! Jenica sighed long and heavily. She wasn't sure why Bianca, who had only ever been interested in reading, was so determined about this. As much as Jenica disliked her, if Bianca were to become stranded and die, it would be none the less problematic for Jenica. She was the fiancé of Balheim. Should Bianca die, causing ties with Balheim to falter, it would be a huge problem. TCH, I'll just go and fetch her. Assign some nights to me. Yes, understood. Ultimately, Jenica stood up to go after Bianca, albeit annoyed by the thought of such a troublesome sister. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. In the mountain ranges of Hardenhearts, the Loka Mountain Range. Bianca was making her way above the snow-covered mountains. It's quite all right. She nodded, looking at the shoes she was wearing which comfortably allowed her to walk over the snow, thanks to being an artifact. Bianca, with her bag tightly secured, continued moving deeper into the mountain woods. She intended to find the white snow hot young spore before dusk. Hey! Suddenly, she heard a sharp shout. Turning her head, Bianca saw Jenica and two knights standing there. It seemed that Jenica had followed eagerly, as she was exhaling long breaths with a tired expression. It was because Bianca moved quicker than expected with her short legs. Due to this, Jenica had to wipe the sweat on her forehead despite the cold winter, breathing heavily. Are you stupid? You came into the woods by yourself to find the white snow hot young spore because it's not available? She scolded Bianca, visibly annoyed. But the real surprise was for Bianca. You stopped the sales, didn't you? Bianca came into the woods precisely because Jenica had obstructed the distribution of the white snow hot young spore. It was hard enough to find, to begin with. With Jenica blocking it, there was nowhere in Harden Hearts to acquire the white snow hot yang spore. She had come to find it herself, yet now Jenica was getting worked up over it. Ah, do you think I came here out of care for you? If you, the fiancé of Balheim, get stranded and die, it would sever the ties between Balheim and Hardenhearts. Bianca realized this upon hearing those words. Indeed, in a sense, she was an important figure within Hardenhearts. A token of the trade between the families. Bianca herself had not thought that far. Follow me. I'll give you what you want and send you back promptly. With that, Bianca turned around as well. She had no intention of taking unnecessary risks, provided she could get the white snow hot yang spore. However, there was one thing she wanted to ask. Jenica, why did you come here yourself? What? Jenica wore a confused expression. Just by looking at her ragged attire and the sound of her heavy breathing, it was clear she had hurriedly come. To find Bianca, it would have been sufficient for the mountain savvy knights to form a search party. Hence, there was no reason for her to climb the mountain herself. You say you came for the family, but you're not usually so concerned about family matters. You could have sent just a search party. Even if she was residing in Harden Hearts, it made no difference, Jenica was still just the second child. Due to the characteristics of male-centric Harden Hearts, the eldest son could worry about the family affairs. If her eldest brother had come searching for her, Bianca wouldn't have found it strange but it was Jenica who came, the second child. To Bianca, it was odd that Jenica, who seemed to despise her so much, had come in person. Since Bianca was devoid of emotions, she had struck precisely at the place where Jenica had intruded. Jenica pursed her lips, momentarily troubled by the jab. Then her face twisted in anger. What does it matter? That's just what I felt like doing. But somewhere deep within Jenica, something stung sharply in contrast to that angry face. People grow and mature with age. And they are always duplicitous. Someone who tormented others ruthlessly in childhood can, over time, be burdened with guilt for those very actions. 
Conversely, not wanting to acknowledge that sense of guilt may even lead to more pronounced displays of temper. Jenica was 16 this year. The world may call it the age of maturity, even suitable for marriage, but she was immature. Therefore, she did not fully understand her own feelings. During the year Bianca was absent, a year where mistreating Bianca had been part of her routine, Jenica too began to change gradually. Just as love fades with distance, so can hatred. Jenica, who harbored only a vague sense of hatred for Bianca, a leftover pain from their mother passing away while laboring under a curse, found herself without direction when she no longer had Bianca to direct those feelings towards. The hatred that lost its target soon turned into emptiness and, before long, self-disgust. Now was the age for her to step away from her parents' shadows. Rather than vaguely detesting Bianca, it was time for Jenica to reflect on the circumstances she faced. After rethinking the hurtful acts she had inflicted on Bianca one by one, Jenica realized how pitiful she had been, how she had cornered Bianca under the excuse of her lack of emotion. In the process of maturing, the immature Jenica had begun to recognize her own faults. Then, suddenly, Bianca returned. Jenica, yet to enter the realm of maturity, blurted out thoughtlessly toward her. Why did you come back? After all, this was how Jenica had always treated Bianca. Even if she recognized having wronged Bianca, it was impossible for Jenica to suddenly start speaking kindly. Ah, uh, I see. You were abandoned by that half-wit from Balheim, weren't you? Of course, how could someone as off-putting as you be accepted? Thus, Jenica showed her wicked disposition toward Bianca. Despite blatantly knowing her wrongdoing, she couldn't stop herself. So once again, she repeated the same pattern as before, deep down harboring a profound self-loathing for her behavior. She was still passing through her immature phase. I'm going to look for the the white snow hot yang spore. Upon hearing the words left by Bianca, Jenica tried to ignore it, but it bothered her. The white snow hot yang spore had long been used as a scamming tool. Because it looked almost identical to the fake Bequasol spore, even many merchants couldn't tell them apart. Ads by Pub Future. It was unlikely that Bianca would be able to discern the difference. It seems she'll buy something strange. No matter how she thought about it, agitation crept over Jenica, so she sought out the merchants. As a result of seeking out the the white snow hot young spore before Bianca could, Jenica managed to find a legitimate one. The problem was there was only one. The rest that the merchants claimed to be the white snow hot young spore were all the fake Bequasol spore. Tell all the merchants not to sell the the white snow hot young spore to Bianca. They'll know what it means if you say so. Thus, Jenica instructed the servants to warn the merchants. She was willing to implicitly condone them selling the fakes to others but ordered that they not sell to Bianca. However, Jenica's typically sharp demeanor was misconstrued by her words. Seeing Jenica warning the merchants, everyone assumed she was once again getting in Bianca's way. After all, that was Jenica's usual way. In truth, not wanting to reveal that she had acquired the the white snow hot young spore for Bianca, Jenica had only brought along one closely trusted butler, so the servants had no way of knowing. And Bianca, naturally, misinterpreted the merchant's refusal to sell to her, thinking it was yet another of Jenica's deeds. What should I do now? However, Jenica herself, having acquired the the white snow hot yang spore, was deep in thought, holding it in her hands. Why was she even going through such lengths for Bianca? After considerable contemplation, she concluded it was Bianca's current status that mattered. Bianca was none other than the fiancé of Balheim. Balheim's half-wit. No, she said he's not a half-wit. It must be the youngest one from Balheim who needs it. That must be it. She nodded to herself, convinced by her line of reasoning. Although she could not admit it, the guilt for her past actions towards Bianca was a driving force, which she resolutely ignored. Just hand it to her and be done with it. Thinking thus, she was about to seek out Bianca when a commotion arose. Miss Jenica. She tilted her head, observing a servant hastily approaching. What is it? Did something happen? Miss Bianca went to the mountain alone. What? Jenica's eyes rounded in shock. She belatedly understood why Bianca had gone mountain-bound. 
she must have gone to find the white snow hot yang spore herself. With an exasperated look, she forced down her anxiety and hastily summoned some knights. If Bianca dies, the connection with Balheim will falter. Muttering such justifications to herself, she began climbing the mountain as quickly as possible to find Bianca. Fortunately, Bianca wasn't too far away. Seeing her confidently prepared for the mountains, Jenica felt exasperated. You stopped the sails, didn't you? And she understood why Bianca had decided to climb the mountain. She was about to exclaim that's not it, but restrained herself, knowing too well that her sharp demeanor and past actions were to blame. If only she had told Bianca from the start that she had the the white snow hot young spore, all this trouble would have been avoided. Nonetheless, what again flowed from her mouth was harshness. Ah, do you think I came here just because I like you? If you, as Balheim's fiancé, were to get stranded and die, it would put an end to the relationship between Balheim and Hardenhearts. The words burst out sharply from her mouth. Her tongue knew very little of kindness. Why did you come here, Jenica? But the next question left her speechless. You don't typically care so much about family matters. It would have been fine to send just a search party. At that, she found herself unable to respond. As Bianca said, it truly would have been alright with just sending a search party. The justification she had made pulled up the feelings of guilt that had been lurking in her heart, thumping steadily within. Before her, she bit her lip tightly and twisted her embarrassed face as if angry. What does it matter, that's just what I felt like doing. Hearing these words, Bianca looked at her with a baffled expression. For the emotionless Bianca, Jenica's changes were incomprehensible. Emotions are not lopsided but diverse. Yet, that diversity was something beyond the understanding of emotionless Bianca. Therefore, she could only recognize the feelings of anger and resentment in Jenica. Come on, follow me. I don't even want to look at your face anymore, so I'll hand over the white snow hot young spore and then send you back. Pierced at her core, Jenica could only show a sharp response to Bianca. It was a defensive stance stemming from the embarrassment of being caught out. Is that so? The two then started descending the mountain without another word. Jenica felt uncomfortable with the silence. She wanted to speak up but couldn't bring herself to talk. And she thought Bianca probably didn't wish to converse with her either. Yes, in the end, this is our relationship. After everything that had transpired, what now? She looked up, feeling contemptible, as they had climbed quite high and would likely reach the bottom by twilight. It would all end once she handed Bianca the white snow hot young spore and told her to go back. That's when it happened. Can I come along too? A voice echoed behind the knight and the two women. Just as the knight sensed something was amiss and was about to draw his sword. Thwack! An axe flew in and split the knight's head in two. For a brief moment, utter silence followed. The man who had smashed the knight's head in one swift motion looked at the three with a sly grin as he pulled out his axe. His head bore a peculiar resemblance, not to a human, but to a dog. With a jet black snout sticking out in teeth revealed between it. Yet having human ears, he appeared to be a monstrous figure. A carrier of world erosion who had massacred several people in the empire, and now escaped. It was Berkman the Butcher. Hello, beauties. It was a phenomenon that appeared when contracting with a world eroder. Ladies, run away immediately. One knight urgently shouted, drawing his sword and charging in. Clang. What the, what? As swords and axe clashed, sending a ringing metallic sound through the air, Jenica, who had never witnessed such sudden murder, fell into a state of panic. She had been raised sheltered from world erosion, untouched by harm or death, a common occurrence for soldiers and knights but something she had never seen before, and so her panic was an expected reaction. Thump! At that moment, faster than anyone, a young girl grabbed her hand. It was none other than Bianca. Similar to Jenica, Bianca grew up sheltered, yet she did not possess a fear that would lead her to panic. Thus, she made a rational decision to grasp Jenica's hand and run at this critical moment. Run! She also did not forget to shout, to awaken Jenica's senses. Stirred by Bianca's cry, Jenica regained her composure and started to run. 
she did not understand what was happening. However, she could tell that the situation was incredibly dangerous. Still, her mind was not fully clear even though she had temporarily composed herself. Just focus on running. With those words, Bianca led Jenica. Jenica bit her lip, realizing that Bianca, significantly younger, was guiding her. No matter what, she was the elder. Jenica began to run on her own power, not wanting to be dragged by Bianca. We'll be caught if we continue like this. Though it was a surprise attack, the man who single-handedly killed a knight was capable. The fact that the other knight had told them to run away indicated that he was too much to handle alone. If that were the case, after dealing with that knight, capturing the two unarmed ladies would surely be a quick task. Do you have a plan? Bianca was not very familiar with the geography of the Loka mountain range. So when she asked Jenica if there was another way, Jenica started looking around. This way. She turned and began running in that direction, with Bianca quickly following. Loka mountain range has lots of crevasses hidden under the snow due to the ice forming over natural cave openings. She spoke as if understanding the geographic location well while sprinting through the forest. You and I are wearing artifacts that let us run over the snow, so we're fine, but it's different for him. The ice would collapse under an adult's weight instantly, dropping him below. So, if they continued running down that direction, the pursuer would have a hard time following. There's a path that, although longer, has many of these crevasses. Let's go that way. There was no other choice. Thus, Jenica and Bianca started running in that direction. Thud. 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 Suddenly, footsteps began to be heard from behind them. If snow wasn't falling, footsteps would leave clear marks. Therefore, he was quickly tracking the two after killing the knight. As the footsteps grew closer, a wave of anxiety hit Jenica. What would happen if they were caught? Would she end up dead like the knight? All sorts of thoughts fought for control in her mind. Meanwhile, they were running over a snow field full of crevasses. Crunch! Suddenly, the sound of breaking ice followed by cascading snow came from behind. Hearing this, Jenica almost smiled with relief. Thud! But then, the footsteps resumed, closer than ever, as if he was jumping over the crevasses knowingly. Jenica's face turned pale. He could freely emerge from a crevasse he'd fallen into and pinpoint their positions. At this rate, they had merely gone the long way for nothing. Because of me. This way. As Jenica realized her mistake and tightly closed her eyes, Bianca spoke with the same authoritative voice as before. Jenica reflexively changed direction following Bianca. Wait, if we go this way. It's okay. This is the right way. This direction was the complete opposite from Harden Hearts. But it was too late to turn back. The followers' footsteps were already too close behind them. Ladies, I just wanted to have a word, didn't I ask nicely? Don't you listen? That makes me want to get angry. At that moment, a loud voice rang out. As Jenica went deathly pale, Bianca slowed her pace. We're almost there. Almost there? Where, here? Right after hearing Bianca, Jenica's eyes widened. Because before them was nothing but the edge of a cliff. What are you? Jenica yelled as she turned to face Bianca. Thump. Behind them, footsteps resonated, along with a voice. Running on snow isn't my thing. It was none other than the butcher Berkman. But I must say, I'm lucky. To be here with such pretty girls. Indeed, as he had said, he was fortunate. Having fled the empire and hidden in the Hardened Hearts Mountains, he had stumbled upon the voices of the two girls. Upon closer listening, they turned out to be daughters of Hardened Hearts, and one was even the fiancé of Balheim, an ideal situation for hostages. Come here, it's dangerous over there. As he approached, Bianca and Jenica began stepping backward cautiously. But there was nowhere to run, as behind them lay only the cliff. Jenica couldn't understand Bianca's thinking. It was beyond her why they had seemingly intentionally run here. Get ready. For what? Ready to jump. 
Jenica's eyes bulged in disbelief. This had to be nonsense. Was she suggesting they commit suicide? But Bianca and Jenica had already arrived at the cliff's edge. Wait, you're not seriously considering jumping, are you? Berkman, taken aback, tried to dissuade them. But it was too late. Bianca drew her back leg, and Jenica was gripped by her arm. Ah uh, ah. Uh. In an instant, they screamed and plunged down the cliff. Ah, uh, damn. Berkman cursed loudly as he leaped. The two women were valuable hostages. He had no intention of letting them die and meant to catch hold of them. But as he leaped from the cliff, he found himself having to widen his eyes in shock. Because beneath the cliff from which he had jumped, the two had not fallen. Instead, Bianca and Jenica stood on a small outcrop at the very edge of the cliff. Jenica's face turned ghostly white and her legs trembled, while Bianca was staring straight at him. Ha! Huh? Is this what they saw when they jumped? Why had they come here? Incredulous, he spun his axe around. The kids were quite clever, but still. You underestimate me too much. His axe swept fiercely across the opposite side. The axe cleaved through the air, changing his trajectory with the wind it generated. Even Berkman couldn't avoid falling in this state. However, he could catch hold of one of them. As a smirk painted his face at the thought, Bianca's arm whipped through the air. Crack! At that moment, a lump of snow hit his eyes. Ugh! One hand was outstretched, the other still holding the axe. Even with his trained body, he had no time frame to dodge the surprise snowball. But at most, it only obscured his sight. As he reached with his already extended hand, he felt something hard hit his head. When he finally opened his eyes amidst the falling snow, there was Bianca, who had used him as a stepping stone to leap away. Oh! Bianca! Berkman and Jenica's shouts crossed paths as Bianca and Berkman both plummeted down that moment. As Berkman and Bianca fell, the goddess of fortune favored Bianca this time. The place where she landed was covered with thick layers of snow that had slid down the cliff. On the other hand, Berkman's landing was on a slippery downhill slope of frozen snow. Whoa! Already struggling to keep his balance from falling off the cliff, Berkman slid down the slope. Meanwhile, Bianca raised her head from the snow with a plop. Ugh! She grimaced with a sharp pain in her ankle. Considering the height she had fallen from, it was fortunate it wasn't worse, but it hurt nonetheless. Bianca lifted her head to look up the cliff, a dauntingly high wall. Jenica was nowhere to be seen, indicating the extent of the distance. What should I do? Bianca was not well-versed in mountain climbing. With night already falling, moving recklessly with this injury would only increase the chances of getting lost. Yet, she couldn't just stay put. Berkman would be grinding his teeth, furious at being outwitted by a young girl like her, and would search for her tenaciously. I need to hide first. Dragging her slowly swelling leg, Bianca began to walk through the woods. Her breaths formed white puffs in the cold air, evidence that her body temperature was dropping. Despite being dressed thoroughly, she had rolled in the snow. Her wet clothes were heavy and stealing her warmth. Without action, hypothermia would come first. She needed to find a way to warm up her clothes and body. What came to her mind then was the the white snow hot yang spore. Carrying the spore alone maintained body heat. Her eyes busily scanned the forest's interior. Bianca knew the conditions for the white snow hot young spores to thrive. Firstly, they would be on top of snow where sunlight hit. Secondly, there would be presence of old trees, over a hundred years in age, for nutrients. Ads by Pub Future. The large trees were easy to spot due to their size. She started looking for a place to hide in the white snow hot young spores simultaneously. Not long after, she fortuitously found a massive old tree. Bianca's breathing quickened. The pain and hypothermia were causing her eyelids to droop heavily. She had reached her limit. I have to find it. With her lips tightly bitten, she arrived at the old tree and let out a sigh of relief. For there, attached to the tree, were the white snow hot yang spores. Mushrooms bathed in white, soaking up the sunlight. 
Just being near them provided warmth, a characteristic of the white snow hot yang spores. She was truly lucky. Bianca took a small knife from her waistband and cut the base of the spore. Hugging it close, she felt a warmth envelop her body as if bathed in sunlight. It's warm. Having resolved the issue of hypothermia, Bianca headed for a cave she had noticed earlier. It was a cave without signs of wild animals, likely a sufficient shelter. On her way to the cave, she spotted red mountain berries and quickly collected them, arriving safely at her destination. Huff, ha! She then flopped onto the ground. Bianca took heavy breaths and checked the inside of her shoes. There she saw her injured leg, swollen and red. She took off the shoes and removed her overclothes to use them as a blanket. Holding on to the white snow hot yang spore, the warmth would quickly dry the clothes. Afterward, she used snow that had entered the cave to soothe the wound and fastened a sturdy branch to her leg as a splint. Luckily, she had brought along emergency bandages. Efficiently finishing the first aid, Bianca used the shoes to elevate her foot above heart level and then lay down. It was first aid based on actively utilized knowledge from a book. But emergency treatment was not enough, proper medical care was needed. I don't know about that. Her knowledge ended there. She noticed her eyelids getting heavier and heavier. She had stabilized herself. Just in case, she had covered the entrance of the cave with snow to erase her footprints, and the only thing left was to recover her strength. Crouch. Somehow, she found herself longing for Crouch. Thinking of him petting her head gently, Bianca drifted off to sleep. Time passed since she had become stranded. Below Hardenheart's Mountain, a massive avalanche created difficulties for the rescue effort, delaying the search for Bianca even further. Isolated, Bianca managed to survive by eating mountain berries and herbs she had read about in books. She had even found herbs good for sprains and ground them with a stone to insert into her bandages, but that was all she could do. Even so, the pain only slightly lessened, her ankle showed no signs of recovery. It's either fractured or broken. Neither option spoke to a good prognosis. The real trouble began when she spotted footprints which likely belonged to Berkman while picking berries. He's close. He was tracking her. From the moment she realized this, Bianca reduced her range of activity even further. Getting caught by him would spell the end. Ideally, the rescue party would reach her before he did. But Bianca was skeptical about that. Because of Berkman, she was hiding which made it very likely that the rescue party would have difficulty finding her. Moreover, she could feel her body weakening as the days passed. Despite having the white snow hot yang spore, she was only 13. Enduring outdoor winter life with insufficient nutrients was not easy. I dozed off again. Recently becoming more prone to sleep, Bianca rubbed her eyes. Sleeping on the cold stone floor hardly rejuvenated her, only emphasizing her tiredness. It was bad. She felt that if she were to fall asleep again, she might never wake up. It was then, while contemplating movement, that she heard it. Russell. Amidst the bushes outside the cave, footsteps echoed. Bianca's face hardened. Those were the footsteps of an adult male, far from belonging to a rescue team. I've found you. Her heart dropped at the softly whispered words, prompting Bianca to sprint with all her might. Immediately, footsteps pursued her from behind. Bianca used routes she had observed before to sprint the shortest distances. Intentionally running through densely wooded areas difficult for larger people to pass through, she evaded pursuit. However, her injured leg kept holding her back, slowing her down due to the pain. Crack! Behind her, the sound of tumbling trees filled the air. Ugh! Hearing this, Bianca instantly changed direction but her ankle's pain curtailed her escape. Rumble rumble rumble. A fallen tree rolled down and struck Bianca's frail body. The impact sent her rolling across the snow. Sob, H. Ha. A weak whimper escaped her, pain radiating from her entire body, rendering even her fingers immobile. Blood trickling across her forehead dampened her eyes, as if the tearless Bianca was shedding her last bloodied tears. The young lady sure is persistent in fleeing. 
Berkman's low voice reverberated as he landed with a light step on a tree before descending in front of Bianca. He then grabbed Bianca's snow white hair and yanked her up. Arg. Well, aren't you a tough one, not even changing your expression. Quite the stubborn lady, aren't you? Bianca couldn't resist as Berkman pulled her up. The accumulated fatigue and the recent pain had drained all her strength. It's too bad you're causing me this much trouble. Before I use you as a hostage, you need to be taught a lesson. Berkman rose to his feet, maintaining his grip on her. Consequently, Bianca felt the agony of having her hair nearly ripped out. Simultaneously, Berkman ripped out her hairpin, intending to sell it as it seemed valuable. As Bianca watched the hairpin with her fading consciousness, she began to close her eyes slowly. She had given it her all. There was no strength left to carry on. With her eyes closing, Crouch seemed to appear before her. Him, who had completely changed one day. Crouch, initially suspected to be suicidal due to depression, whom she began following around. However, that became a part of her routine. He never felt uncomfortable around her, even though she was cursed. Though he sometimes looked apologetically, fundamentally, he saw her and others differently. Was that the reason? Over the past year, she had felt more at ease by Crush's side than at Hardenheart's. Him training and her reading next to him, a simple daily life but undoubtedly pleasurable days. Pleasant, you say. She never expected to consider her own experiences as pleasant. Pleasure certainly must be an emotion. For the first time, Bianca questioned whether she indeed lacked emotions. One thing was certain, she found it regrettable that she did not possess emotions. Had she been able to feel, she could have better grasped the comfort and joy of those times. And she might have shared more with Crouch. Bianca realized that he had become quite significant to her. So Bianca spoke out, one last time. K.R. Crouch. It was a whisper that could not reach him. That's when it happened. The sound of someone dashing through the snow resonated. Ha! Huh? Catching Berkman off guard, the next instant unfolded. Thump! The fist of a young boy struck Berkman's ribs with all his might. Arg! Caught off guard, Berkman suppressed a cry of pain as a secondary shockwave spread inside his body. But it was too late. Crash thud thump! A succession of blows caused his body to buckle in an instant, releasing Bianca as he rolled across the ground. In the midst of rolling, Bianca felt a warmth embrace her. Bianca opened her blurry eyes to find the face she had longed to see before her. Upon seeing that face, she felt a profound sense of relief wash over her. Bianca. A voice called her name from lips parted with careful deliberateness, tinged with frustration and a medley of emotions. Hearing it, Bianca slowly lifted her hand and cradled his cheek. Crouch, I'm okay. Her hand gently caressed his cheek before her eyes slowly closed. The sounds of her ragged breathing filled the air. Feeling relieved, she had reached her limit, and her consciousness faded away. Watching this, Crouch gathered her up in his arms and began to walk slowly. He leaned her against a tree comfortably, and a crow perched itself before her. Will you be able to win? The crow spoke, posing the question. The opponent was Berkman, the butcher, a figure already renowned for his significant capabilities. Even as a fugitive from the Empire, having met a worldly rotor, his strength had increased further. Frankly, Berkman was a clearly stronger opponent than Crouch. And Ebelask cannot assist. Crimson Garden's kin were not present in Hardened Hearts. Their only kin here was this crow. Though they could use magic, it was limited to low-level spells. Even with the Crimson Garden's prowess, they could not face the enemy with such limited power. On the other hand, Ebelask was restrained by the unspoken rules among the world eroders. The rule, if you don't wish for war, don't interfere with another's kin. Recklessly provoking could lead to war with Berkman's master, the world eroder, as a consequence for breaking this rule. Ebelask would naturally not want to carelessly choose such risk. Although some deal existed between Crouch and Abelask, there was no reason for her to help Crouch to the extent of accepting such peril. Thus, Crouch had to face Berkman alone. Crouch, well aware of this fact, drew his sword from his waist. 
his blue eyes shone with an unmistakable determination. I will win. His words were full of unwavering sincerity. Berkman, the butcher. His demeanor always bore the hallmark of madness, his actions whimsical and movements seemingly haphazard. This often led to minor blunders, especially when he was toying with someone weaker than himself, his casual ruthlessness all the more highlighted. Yet, his true strength lay in overcoming such flaws. Escaping from the Empire's Black Dragon Knights and surviving was a feat managed by only a rare few, excluding outliers like Sinchang and Mary Diana. It was in the midst of such a moment that Crouch raised his hand. Following a spell activated from his hand, Bianca's hairpin, once stolen by Berkman, returned to him via the Black Hood technique. Crouch meticulously secured the hairpin in his pocket. Upon raising his head, there stood Berkman, annoyed and rising from the snow after having been knocked down, yet unharmed by the blow. Had Bianca not been his captive, Crouch would have inflicted instant death with his aura wrapped sword. Berkman was a formidable enemy regardless. To kill him, it would require injecting the maximum amount of aura, and Berkman would have promptly detected and defended against it. Surprise attacks were only effective amongst equals. It was far too risky to gamble in Bianca's captured state. Hence Crouch was forced to choose the short power technique, effective yet non-lethal, a surefire way to separate Bianca from Berkman without detection. Though missing the opportunity to strike lethally was disappointing, knowing that Bianca was safe was all that mattered. Who are you? Why do you interfere with my affairs? Berkman spat out harshly, his words twisting with dissatisfaction. Enough chatter. Right now, all Crouch wanted was to take Bianca and return to Hardenhearts. He longed to treat her wounds as soon as possible. Here and now, he was the only one capable of aiding her. Crimson Garden's crow couldn't transport Bianca, and Ebelask was bound by the unspoken laws of the world eroders. Therefore, showing his back to Berkman while fleeing could lead to dangerous consequences. So, Crouch decided that he must defeat Berkman then and there. After striking someone down, the youth today are truly savage. At that moment, as Berkman spoke, his shadow scattered. You're making me lose my temper. Suddenly, Berkman's axe came whirling and slashing towards Crouch with bending force. Clang! Ads by Pub Future. In a fleeting instant, Crouch's sword filled the void, blocking Berkman's axe. So fast. His intuition barely kept pace with the attack. Furthermore, judging by the sheer aura alone, Berkman was undoubtedly at the pinnacle of expert level. Becoming a kin of a world eroder, he had surpassed his own limits. Crouch had only recently matured to an expert of the mid-rank. The difference in level was unmistakably apparent. Ah, you blocked it. Clang, clang, clang. Berkman's axe was swung several more times in rapid succession. Each time, Crouch's sword quickly filled the space, parrying the blow. It was a blunt sword. Still, a blunt sword's merit lays in its ability to withstand the opponent's full strength. Being outweighed in pure strength, Crouch had to keep retreating, unable to take advantage of the sword's spatial control. Keep blocking. Just try and stop me. Berkman's characteristic taunting remarks burst forth in a light and dismissive tone, befitting a street thug rather than a warrior. However, contrary to his lightness, the axe's blows were enormously heavy. Kang. Another clash sent Crush's blade flying open from the impact. Berkman's eyes flashed, grasping the opportunity. With one hand freed from the axe, Berkman's fist hurtled straight at Crouch. Crack. The distinct sound of impact resounded. However, there was an unexpected turn of events. Ugh. The grunt came from Berkman, the one who had unleashed the punch. The explanation was straightforward. Anticipating Berkman's action through intuition, Crouch too had swung his own fist towards the initiating punch. Short power. The technique's effect was confirmed as it pierced the exterior to deliver an internal shock, creating fractures in the bones of Berkman's fingers. Crouch's left fist also suffered from the impact, despite the successful execution of short power. Without it, Crouch's fist alone would have been broken. Arg! Berkman's scream echoed as his bones cracked. Crouch was not free from pain either. He too had endured the impact, 
experiencing a bone-cracking sensation just as painful. Yet Crouch instantaneously channeled strength into his sword, revealing his advantage in this aspect. Swoosh! His sword sliced through the air, grazing Berkman's side. Though aiming to pierce his gut, Berkman reacted just in time to avoid a fatal wound. Between the spurts of blood, Crouch's blue eyes gleamed sharply. He was accustomed to pain. He had endured far worse than this minor discomfort. A simple fracture in his hand could not inhibit his movements. I'm getting a hold of the rhythm. His thinking accelerated, and Crouch's concentration peaked. Successive punches followed by the sword strikes had Berkman wobbling. Humans tended to shrink when feeling pain, including Berkman. So, Crouch seized the moment, explosively surging his aura. The energy seeped between the muscles in his arm and surfaced along the sword, painting it a vibrant blue. Ignis. At his beckoning, the blue aura transformed into blazing flames. Whoosh. The flaming sword surged towards Berkman, the sudden wall of fire catching him off guard. And Crouch meticulously exploited that opening, intent on wounding Berkman at least a little. Damn it, irritating as hell. Yet, had Berkman been solely reliant on such tactics, he would never have stood against Charlotte prior to his regression. Bark. A sharp, brief bark emanated. Crouch recognized it as a sign. The sounds echoed, and the surroundings began to change color. Where once there was a snow-filled mountain range, now it was being painted over in hues of red. Dusk set in, and from all around, the sounds of barking resonated. Crouch's vision was engulfed in red. His senses then started to reel uncontrollably. Illusionary Bind Differing from Berkman, who saw the environment clearly, Crouch was trapped in an illusionary bind, the world around him becoming distorted. This technique layered aura over his opponent's senses with sound, entangling them within. Once caught in Berkman's illusionary bind, Crouch would be rendered oblivious until the bitter end, a dreadful method indeed. Feel like dying now that you're trapped? As Crouch remained motionless, ensnared in the illusionary effect post-assault, Berkman let out a taunting laugh. However, the laugh didn't match the panting of Berkman, who slowly gripped his axe. He had realized that he was in more peril than anticipated when Crouch had pressed the attack. A young child's appearance, not matching his phenomenal strength and aura. Having underestimated his opponent as a weakling to be easily subdued, Berkman now found himself with fractures in his left hand and a sword wound on his right side. Given the situation, Hardenheart's search parties were likely soon to arrive. It seemed prudent to end this quickly. Bark. He let out another bark, and his own senses subtly shifted. The pain from his hand and the wound from the sword dissipated. By casting illusions on himself, he removed the pains that could hinder him in the immediate fight. Thus, he stepped forward methodically, gripping his axe with deliberate caution akin to a hunting hound. Having resorted to illusionary bind, Berkman now considered Crouch to be a serious threat, warranting his full attention, and no longer underestimated him. The epithet of Butcher rang true as Berkman began his real hunt. That movement, following my axe since a while ago, is no ordinary movement. Even amid the illusionary bind, Crouch might still be able to counter. Therefore, Berkman swung his axe in a wide arc, his target surprising, a tree trunk. Crunch! The tree fell instantly towards Crouch, and Berkman kicked off the ground, heading straight for Bianca. That was the moment. Crack! Crouch split the falling tree and swiftly launched an assault. Berkman, barely avoiding the sword approaching his face, glared at Crouch with bulging eyes. In Crouch's eyes, red waves rippled, a certain sign of being affected by illusionary bind. But Crouch had intuition. He possessed a countermeasure against Berkman's illusionary technique. Berkman let out a half-defeated, half-mocking laugh. Ha, ah, you little dog. It was the first time in a while that Berkman had felt a shiver of genuine fear. Crouch had been waiting patiently, his fangs hidden, until just before he struck. He was baiting my overconfidence all along. Crouch's gaze settled on Berkman. His bearing as he looked straight at him seemed unbothered by the illusionary bind, almost as if he was outside its influence. Now it was clear. This man was not mere prey. 
He was a formidable opponent entitled to a fierce battle, an equal menace, a predator in a struggle for dominance. Clang! The sound of the axe clashing with the sword resounded fiercely throughout the forest. Kaga Kong! The fight for power between the axe and the sword kicked up sparks. Observing this, Berkman leaned in aggressively, opening his snout. If you don't stop me, I will gouge out that girl's eyes, cut off her fingers and legs, and stuff them into her mouth. Those were Berkman's provoking words, meant to unsettle Crouch. Yet Crouch remained unflinching, his expression unchanged even in the face of such taunting. Seeing this, Berkman became certain. This guy, he seems unaffected by the illusionary bind. Even if he didn't know how Crouch penetrated the illusion, his senses were certainly not fully normal. If that was the case, the advantage would tip towards him. Crouch had the handicap of the lingering effects of the illusionary bind and had something to protect. In contrast, Berkman needed only to attack. With the advantage on his side, Berkman's axe became a storm from every direction. Crush's sword narrowly parried each strike of Berkman's axe, but with each blow, Crush's body began to give way. And that wasn't all. The illusions of Berkman's axe began to mingle in the fray. Welcoming War Axe The true onslaught began, a myriad of illusory axes rained down upon Crouch. Though Crouch had perfectly counteracted the illusionary bind with his intuition, he couldn't fully negate the aftermath. As evidence, the injuries continued to multiply across Crouch's body. Arg, you. Ebel Ask, watching from a distance, bit her lip tightly. She hesitated as she watched the two engage in combat. Crouch was the benefactor who had returned her heart. Trade or no trade, even she had a code of honor. She did not want to watch Crouch die just like that. Should I step in? But if I do, that man will target me. No, not just me, he'll decide Crouch is complicit and target him too. Behind Berkman, who had become a kin of the butcher, was the worldly rotor mad dog. Should he start targeting both her and Crouch, it would be a situation without escape. Mad Dog was among the strongest of the world eroders. And true to his name, he was relentless. Once he sets his sights on a target, he won't let go until they're torn to shreds. Thus, she helplessly paced back and forth, unable to intervene. Boom! In that moment, Crouch took a heavy hit from Berkman and tumbled to the ground. Though he got up quickly, the assault left him covered in more wounds. Upon seeing this, Ebelask jumped to her feet. No, it can't be. Even if it means death later, dying here would render everything meaningless. Do not intervene. The voice resonated in her mind. It was none other than Crimson Garden speaking. Ebelask was perplexed. Do not intervene? Does she not see Crouch dying? Just watch. Crimson Garden's voice came through once more, filled with certainty. The boy said he will win on his own. It was Crouch's own declaration. Thus, as his mentor, she must trust him and watch over him. Trust in the boy who returned your heart. He is a stubborn one, acknowledged by me. With the last message, Ebelask slowly took a seat on the ground. Really, if he dies, I'll just resurrect him as a corpse. She muttered, hoping that such a measure would not become necessary. Breaths rushed from Crouch's mouth. Blood from his nose trickled down, wetting his cheeks. His face was taut with strained blood vessels, a testament to the excessive use of his intuition. Bark, bark, bark. The sound of barking around him was disorienting, echoing inside his head. The world, tainted red, provoked a bitter feeling. It was his first time harnessing his intuition to such an extent. He did not have much longer. At this rate, his intuition would be severed. The limit was slowly pressing down on him. But Crouch gnashed his teeth against it. Suffer through it. He had felt his limits keenly since early evening. Weak and talentless, that was his self-assessment. Thus, overwhelming opponents with sheer strength, like a genius would, was impossible. Berkman was stronger than him. Hence, Crouch had to hide his strength tenaciously until the very moment Berkman was certain of his complete victory. Clang! Finally, the limitations of his intuition revealed themselves. 
In that instant, when Crush's sword, mistakenly splitting an illusion, faltered, Berkman's eyes flashed, sensing victory. His axe's presence dissolved. The aura flooded axe of his boasted a presence grander than ever before. As if pulling the very air into its grasp, Berkman's axe tore through the atmosphere, swinging down towards Crouch with a chilling howl. In Berkman's mind, the only sight was Crouch's head soaring off. And then that moment. Crack. A blaze erupted within Crouch, surging through his body. Ignis had ignited the world-devouring power that lay dormant within him. Ads by Pub Future. Combustion was akin to the driving force behind power. The same held true for the world-devouring power. A violent combustion of that power began with Ignis's ignition. Crack crack crack. The force generated from burning the world-devouring power infused directly into Crush's body. The fierce storm of strength momentarily broke through his limits with such intensity that it deformed his muscles and altered his bones. His breathing changed. The demeanor of his body transformed. All information flooding his sight in that split second led to accelerated thoughts. In that instant, Crouch, enveloped in accelerated contemplation, felt as if time had stopped. The expanded perception even sensed delicate snowflakes slowly falling from a distant tree. The surging heat from within him then reached the illusionary bind. Crash! The sound of breaking glass reverberated strongly. Though the illusionary bind dissipated in the burning heat, Crouch's eyes still reddened from the blaze. Tears of blood and nosebleeds burst forth simultaneously. This was the backlash of harnessing the world-devouring power to surpass his limits. A combination of ignis and extreme blood poison, it was Crouch's original ultimate technique. Annihilation Erosion Three seconds He realized by sensation. With his current capabilities, he could sustain annihilation erosion for no more than three seconds. End it within that time frame. In that moment, a black flame surged upon his blade. With newfound strength infused into his faltering sword, Crouch surged upwards, defying Berkman's axe. Crouch was faster than the axe could reach. Like a hunting hound tearing at the neck of its prey, Crouch's sword rushed towards Berkman's throat. Up until the sword neared his neck, Berkman seemed oblivious to its presence. Crouch's blade was that swift. In the interim, Berkman's mouth, resembling a dog's snout, inadvertently opened. A purely reflexive action, where the body responded before the brain registered the threat. Only then did Berkman's eyes belatedly recognize Crouch's sword. When did he? I'm going to die. I'm dying. Under normal circumstances, it would have meant death by now, but in this split second, his reflex action created an opportunity. Dash. Welcoming sound. An inaudible explosion of sound shattered Crush's eardrums in the next instant. One reflexive action spawned a lifeline, a variable that was crucial for Berkman. The ringing in his ears was followed by a disorienting sensation, twisting his vision. Crash crash crash. The aftershocks of the impact turned the fight on its head. Due to the ruptured eardrums, Crush's sword, disoriented, sliced through Berkman's right shoulder instead. While the scorching blade wielded dreadful power. The sword embedded in his shoulder was meant for Berkman's neck. It was Berkman's reflex that had turned the situation upside down in an instant. At the same time, the flames encasing Crouch were slowly extinguishing. The effects of annihilation erosion were fading. What followed could only be an extended retirement. The scales of fortune and misfortune swapped places between Berkman and Crouch. A situation reversed in an instant. As Crouch swung his sword, he felt the ebb of strength due to the annihilation erosion's toll. With a shoulder cleaved by the axe and a shattered left hand, binding the axe was impossible. Impossible? It surely was. But that was a tale of the sword. He still had another move up his sleeve. Crouch released his right hand from the grip. With that very movement, the remaining flames from the dwindling annihilation erosion ferociously indwelled his right hand. So fiercely infused were they that the muscles and skin tore as the flames surged upward. Crouch swung his arm with no hesitation towards Berkman's axe. Crack! The moment they collided, 
the axe's blade lodged into Crush's right arm. Despite being reinforced by annihilation erosion, the muscles and bones were cleaved by the axe. Ultimately, the axe would bisect Crush's right arm, then carry on to slice his neck. Yet, in that moment, the arm impaled by the axe bought a few crucial seconds. Crush's eyes blazed a brilliant blue. In this extreme situation, his spirit dived into the realm of oneness in a flash. His mental fortitude was such that even Crimson Garden would marvel. Drip. A droplet from his spiritual strength fell into the lake of his mind, rippling outward through his entire body. The rising dragon from the mental lake scaled his arm and eventually reached his sword. In that moment, the sword plunged into Berkman's shoulder became one with Crouch. Witnessing this, Berkman bore a look of resignation. Despite the lucky factor of his reflex, Crouch had tenaciously seized the moment until the very end. His doggedness was such that it could have left even Berkman, the so-called butcher, disgusted. I've lost. Realizing that every move he'd played had culminated in defeat, Berkman closed his eyes. And then. One sword. Crunch. Along with the sound of Crouch's remaining left hand bones shattering, his sword cleaved Berkman from shoulder to end. Crash 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 crash. The forest echoed with the sound of the aftermath from that one strike. Bisection at the hands of Crush's strike, Berkman's body, now cleaved in half, tilted past Crouch. Seeing the life ebb from him, Crouch let go of his sword. His left hand had failed to withstand the force and shattered. Snap, click. But the real concern lay elsewhere. Crush's right arm, previously impaled by the axe, was hollow. His right arm lay some distance away, rolling in a snowdrift. Thanks to the annihilation erosion, his right arm seemed to bid farewell as it smoldered away. Amidst the drip drop of blood, Crush gasped for breath as he turned around. Crimson Garden silently watched Crush's actions. Understanding that he sacrificed his own arm, she could not attempt to stop him. The strong prevail without wounds. But the weak can only win covered in scars. It was Crush's only possible form of victory. Are you satisfied? Although that victory was rightly won. Crimson Garden's sigh escaped her lips. She knew the wretchedness of Crouch, who had no choice but to choose a victory marred only with wounds. But he had won. For the first time, Crouch had defeated a real powerhouse, the kind he thought himself incapable of ever beating. Damn, so much for satisfaction. Twisted with irony, a smile hovered over Crush's lips. Crimson Garden just shook her head, chuckling at his stubborn nature. Just then, Crush's body crumbled. It was the end of the line for his mental tenacity. Crouch. Ebelask quickly emerged to support Crush's failing form. Seeing him with an amputated right arm and a shattered left hand, Ebelask bit her lip. The smile that faintly lingered around his mouth left her speechless, even as she wondered if such victory was worth the immense damage sustained. What kind of life has he been living? How could Crush still manage a smile amidst such a disastrous victory? Let's go back. Crimson Garden spread her wings and took flight with lightness. Ebelask, seeing this, stood, cradling both Bianca and Crush's bodies in her arms. It was time to take care of the aftermath. Through the slowly clearing haze, Crouch saw an unfamiliar ceiling. He gazed at it vacantly for a while before feeling pain throughout his body. It hurts. When was the last time he had felt such pain? Even though he was accustomed to pain due to a curse, there was little he could do about injuries this severe. He noticed the absence of sensation in his right arm. No doubt due to it being severed. But it was fine. He could manage without a right arm, after all, it wasn't the first time he'd lost a part of his body. He slowly lifted himself up. Worry for the little chick with white hair came to mind. In the midst of that thought, he spotted Snow White hair beside his bed. Seeing her laying on top of his bed, he couldn't help but be flabbergasted. She was weakened and wounded from her ordeal. Yet there she was. Crouch lifted his bandaged left hand. Fortunately, the pain wasn't too severe, likely due to good medicine applied. With that hand, Crouch gave Bianca a gentle thump on her head. Ah! 
With a short exclamation, Bianca's head shot up. Her sapphire-like eyes met his. By her expression, she seemed to be all right. If you're going to sleep, go to your own bed. Hearing Krausch's words, the perplexed Bianca slowly looked at his now empty right arm socket. Krausch turned aside, thinking she would blame herself. Does it hurt? Bianca asked in the moment he moved. Her emotionless face, caused by the snowdoll curse, was as impassive as ever. Not much. Krausch replied curtly, signaling her not to worry, and Bianca clutched the blanket tightly. She then opened and shut her mouth, seemingly struggling to find the words she wanted to say. But Bianca couldn't spit them out after a long moment since she did not know what to say. Seeing this, Krausch spoke for her. Why did you go into the mountains? Local mountains were treacherous terrain. Especially in Hardenarts, where there was perpetual snow, entering such a mountain was akin to madness. At Krausch's words, Bianca seemed to remember something and reached to the floor. She then lifted a bottle which contained the white snow hot young spores. Krausch realized it then. The reason Bianca ventured into the mountain was to find the white snow hot yang spores. This fool. A quiet sigh escaped Krausch's mouth. Should he scold her, or should he praise her for the effort? Though unsure why she had personally sought out the white snow hot young spores, he was aware that there must have been some circumstance compelling her in hardened hearts. That story could wait for another time. Therefore, Krausch rummaged through his pocket. Fortunately, Bianca's snowflake pin was still safely inside. Krausch took it out with his left hand. Attempting to pin it to Bianca's hair, he ended up grimacing. Sorry, I can't seem to pin it. At those words, Bianca reached out to take Krausch's hand away from her hair. Then, maneuvering his hand herself, she properly affixed the pin to her hair. Watching this, Krausch then patted her head lightly. Well done. Thanks to you, we can complete the elixir. After receiving Krausch's compliment, Bianca quietly fell into silence. Seeing her like this, Krausch withdrew his hand, only for Bianca to catch it again. Krausch, sir. Hearing her call him, Krausch looked at Bianca. Despite her still impassive face, Krausch for some reason felt she looked sadder that day. I can't feel any emotions. Bianca looked at his empty right arm socket. She felt a sense of responsibility there. However, it wasn't anger or sorrow, it was mere guilt. Nothing more than guilt. I can't make faces, can't cry, can't even blush. I feel neither happiness, anger, nor sadness for you saving me in such a state. For the first time, Bianca painfully realized her curse. That's what curses are intended for. To torment those burdened by them. And torment, Bianca felt, bitterly and gravely, for not being able to express any emotion to Krausch who had tried so hard for her. Krausch silently looked at her. He remembered a past conversation with her. I envy you. For being you. The voice of her, expressionless, looking at her own face, lingered in his memory. If you pour out your emotions that way, perhaps the world wouldn't look so gray. At the betrothal dissolution, brought about by the incident in Hardened Hearts, she had looked at him and said so. Krausch, hearing those words at the time, couldn't help but feel how absurd they were. What the hell are you talking about? Better to be without such emotions. Do you even realize how screwed up that would be if you had them? What's the use of being able to freely express emotions? Other than cursing this damned world, I see no other use. Is that so? Is that so my foot? Krausch clicked his tongue. And he looked at Bianca with a look of displeasure. Aren't you the comfortable one? This betrothal dissolution is so unfair, even from my view. The incident in your family had nothing to do with you. If I were you, I would have died of anger. The recent event in Hardenhearts. It was the incident where Douglick and Hardenhearts, the lord of Hardenhearts, went mad. Suddenly crazed, he had beaten the household members to death with a club, including his own firstborn and second child, Jenica. There was only one survivor, Bianca. She had survived because her sister Jenica had hidden her underground and then drawn his attention away. After experiencing such an ordeal, 
Bianca was then faced with the betrothal dissolution. For the Balhames, there was no reason to take in Bianca from the now ruined Harden Hearts. Damn noble families. They pretend they have the entire world at their beck and call with engagements and relationships, and when things go south, this is what happens. The event annoyed Crouch too. The fact that Duglican had gone mad had many dubious aspects to it. Even knowing this, the Balhames cut off Bianca immediately after Harden Hearts fell apart. Bianca gently fiddled with a teacup filled with hot tea. Drink it if you want to. Hearing this, Bianca slowly shook her head. I can't drink anything hot. I have a cat's tongue, you see. Is that so? Crouch, never really caring much about Bianca to begin with, nodded resignedly. Ads by Pub Future. Well, how about this? If I were to regain my emotions and experience them firsthand, maybe I could figure out which is more painful. At that moment, it was Bianca who made the eccentric suggestion. It was a ridiculous proposal. If you regained your emotions, you'd die of sheer anger, biting your tongue. With that, Crouch warned her, frowning slightly. It wasn't that he had a particular fondness for her, but it was a minimum warning from an ex-fiancé. But Bianca tilted her head. Mr. Crouch, you don't care whether I live or die, do you? We're now strangers. The irritation surged in him instantly, knowing she had deliberately provoked him. I am simply curious. Which is more painful? Despite her words, Bianca's face remained expressionless. T-S-C-H. Hearing this, Crouch raised his hand. If you're so intent on finding out, then feel free. Experience it. She was the one who said she wanted to experience it directly, right? Crouch, with the black hood, stole the Snowdoll curse from Bianca. Since she had offered, he could easily steal her curse without any need for a dial. But in Crouch's case, the Snowdoll curse he received was nullified by his other curses. A mid to lower tier curse like that was simply devoured by the many highest tier curses Crouch possessed. How does it feel? Crouch still vividly remembered that day. And he also recalled that he should have clung to her then. The world is a cruel place. After all, that day was when she became the White Ghost. Three years after becoming the White Ghost, she killed one of the ten strongest in the world, the Poison King. The news spread across the world, and belatedly, the whole story of the Harden Hearts incident came to light. It was an imperial plan to annihilate Harden Hearts. Ha, this foolish girl. Upon hearing this news, Crouch covered his face. The reason was simple. A piece of information divulged by Prince Siphonophania, who had sought asylum in Harden Hearts, was critical enough to shake the foundation of the empire. As a result, the empire quickly dispatched an individual to silence both Harden Hearts and the second prince. A person who could handle any poison. One of the ten strongest. The Poison King. The poison that the Poison King had developed and administered to Dudlick and Harden Hearts made him see his servants and family members as monsters. Frightened by the monster he saw, Dudlikin killed all his family and servants except for Bianca with his own hands. And when the effect of the poison neatly ended, he couldn't endure the crime he had committed and hung himself to death. That was the tragic full story behind the incident at Harden Hearts. After the truth came out later, the relationship between the Empire and Starlon reached its worst. It eventually led to war due to the outrage at the Empire's tyranny, and in that process, many died. In such a war. Naturally, Crouch too was caught up in it. Because the Sky Generation moved to put an end to the war between the Empire and Starlon. The Sky Generation wasn't on the side of the Empire or Starlon. Thus, in order to suppress the two sides, the Sky Generation started to use force and conflict ensued. The Sky Generation, who were supposed to be opposing global erosion, were using violence against people. It was truly an absurd situation. And, of course, the Sky Generation too could not remain safe in the war. Damn fools! At the very least, won't there be someone to guard the rear supplies? Crouch, now in charge of supplies for the Sky Generation, yelled as he raced through the snow-covered forest, passing by the scorched remains of Harden Hearts. Harden Hearts had been the front line since it was closest to the Empire. 
especially since the Poison King had been killed at the hands of Bianca. After killing the Poison King, Bianca stayed in the main house of Hardenhearts, the Northern Sea Ice Palace. Because of that, the Empire was relentless in attacking not only Starlon but the Northern Sea Ice Palace as well. Northern Sea Ice Palace In Krausha's view, the half-collapsed Northern Sea Ice Palace came into sight. There he is. That one is also a member of the Sky Generation. Don't let your guard down, kill him. At that moment, the voices of the Empire's knights pursuing him echoed loudly. Krosh grit his teeth and dashed toward the Northern Sea Ice Palace. Reaching the heavily frozen gates of the Northern Sea Ice Palace, he pounded on the door with his raw hands. Hey! Bianca! Are you in there? No answer came to Krosh's shouting. Damn it, what sort of shameless deed is this, showing up now? Krosh clenched his fist and was about to turn away when the knights caught up quickly. They had drawn close to Krosh's back without him noticing. Their eyes visibly poisoned, they seemed unable to contain their killing intent. Indistinguishable, who here is human and who is an eroder? Krosh clicked his tongue and rolled up his sleeves. There was no choice. He would have to use a curse to escape this predicament. He could leave the rest to the saintess somehow. It was at that moment. Creek. As the door to the Northern Sea Ice Palace opened, spikes of ice shot forth from behind Crouch. B B B B B B B R R R K K K. A A. Cough. Ack. The flying spikes pierced their bodies in an instant. Their aura protection was not enough to stop them. Staring blankly at the scene, Krosh saw the open door of the Northern Sea Ice Palace. He stepped inside and quickly shut the door behind him. Then, looking around, he saw the interior of the Northern Sea Ice Palace, everything frozen solid. Krosh felt the chill seeping into his body as he moved forward. Bianca. He called her name, but no voice replied. With no other choice, Krosh moved further inside. After searching around the Northern Sea Ice Palace for a while, he stopped in front of a room. The door had been broken down. Inside was a woman with a sword embedded through her heart, her two legs frozen. Drip. A single drop of blood slid down the blade. Witnessing this, Krosh's eyes slowly widened. Bianca. It was none other than Bianca. It's been a while, Mr. Krausch. At that moment, Bianca's weak voice reached his ears. Hearing the lack of strength in her voice, Krausch realized that she didn't have much longer. Why have you ended up like this after running wild until now? The sword stuck in her chest was familiar to Krausch. The toxin, heavy and potent on the blade. That was the poison of the Poison Phoenix, the daughter of the Poison King. To avenge her father, it seemed she had come from the Empire all the way here and it was clear the sword had been stuck there for quite some time. The poison had spread deep throughout her body, to the point where not even a saintess could reverse it now. That's true. Why am I in this state? Despite regaining her emotions, her face was exceedingly expressionless. As if she had forgotten how to make expressions. Krausch bit his lip as he looked at her. Krausch learned of Bianca's circumstances a while after their engagement was annulled. That's why he felt a sense of frustration and blurted out to her without thinking. You should have just said so. That it was the Empire and the Poison King's doing, that your family was innocent. Bianca clearly knew that it was the work of the Empire and the Poison King even during their disengagement. However, she did not convey that truth to Krausch. I wonder if anything would have changed if I had said anything. And at that, Krausch found no words to say. Speaking out would not have changed anything. After all, he was nothing more than a leech clinging to the Sky Generation, stealing curses at best. Krosh lacked any power to change Bianca's life. Bianca slowly let out a chuckle. Then her eyes began to reminisce about the past. Now that I think about it, we discussed whether it was more painful to be without emotions or with them. Bianca brought up the conversation they had three years ago when they were engaged, even as blood trickled from her mouth. Krausch could feel her vitality almost completely drained. How about it? Would you like to hear my opinion this time? This was the end. This would likely be the last conversation he could have with her. 
Go ahead. Bianca had once saved his life. Listening to her opinion was the least difficult thing he could do. Thank you. With those words of gratitude, Bianca managed to slowly part her lips. Having regained her emotions over the past three years, Bianca had come to know both suffering and pain. Yet, it was only now that she realized her entire past was riddled with agony. A cursed child, born from the death of her mother. Because of that, Bianca was ostracized in hardened hearts and eventually used as a tool for a political marriage. Her childhood was tainted with nothing but misery. I didn't know when I was without emotions, but those were indeed painful experiences. That's why I didn't really care about the family. I didn't care if such a family, which only gave me pain, was ruined. As she spoke, the corners of her lips slowly lifted. But then, the words my sister said while hiding me that day caught hold of me. Blood trickled from Bianca's lips as she spoke. Crouch hesitated but she continued speaking, despite the dripping blood, as if there was no one else to hear this story. That day, I didn't understand what my sister meant. She said she hated me yet did not hate me, that she hated herself for hating me. She said I wasn't someone who deserved to be hated. It was an expression of emotions that were beyond comprehension. Like human beings that couldn't be defined by just one attribute, emotions couldn't be defined simply either. Emotions were always a tangle of contradictions. You could hate someone with all your might, yet somewhere inside, you still hold them close. Emotions couldn't be expressed in just one way. Until I regained my emotions, I didn't understand the meaning of her words. Neither did I understand how difficult it was to divide emotions into simple binaries. My sister must have felt the same. Jenica hated Bianca. But she also loathed herself for not being able to help hating her. Jenica had lost her mother at a young age, and the only target for her misdirected emotions was Bianca. Even knowing Bianca was blameless, Jenica couldn't erase that vague resentment. Thus, she loathed herself terribly. That's why she confessed the truth to Bianca at the end. I hate you yet I do not. The one I hate is myself for hating you. You do not deserve to be hated. And with those contradicting feelings, she had Bianca that day and took her own place in death. Ads by Pub Future. Emotions definitely meant pain for me. A world full of agony. Yet, this world was not the grey she had once seen when she was devoid of emotions. Painful it may have been, yet for the first time, her life found a driving force to move forward. Perhaps that was the combustion of the emotion known as vengeance. But still, worse than such pain was the curse. Tears flowed down, tracing the curve of her lips. Mr. Crouch. Crouch looked at her. Right now, I feel freer than when I was cursed. Crouch couldn't fully understand her words. After all, he hadn't lived the same life as she had. The Snowdoll curse which had afflicted Bianca was long since devoured by Crush's other curses. Therefore, he couldn't comprehend what it meant to be without emotions. So, I wonder. If I had understood emotions a little earlier, would I have spoken more with Jenica? Would I have mourned our mother's death, which I never saw together with my brother and father, and tried to move past the grief? Bianca was unaware of her emotions. Thus, she defined Jenica's complex emotions towards her as simple hatred. It's all unknown. Truly, I have no idea. Back then, I was akin to a suppressed doll. Yet, maybe the mere fact that such thoughts occur to me now is because I possess emotions. Inside her crumbling smile. Yet, no matter what else. She slowly closed her eyes. Being engaged to you Mr. Crouch, Maybe I could have, um, been better, sometime, maybe. Those were Bianca's last words. Tears streamed down along with her final breath, and her eyes slowly closed. Crouch, watching this, spoke out. Bianca. There was no response. That was Bianca's end. Down her closed eyes, tears slowly trickled, reaching her frozen legs. Crouch slowly approached. And then he pulled a small dagger from his pocket. Crack, crunch. Crouch broke the ice encasing her with the dagger. His hand numb with frostbite and pain, but he didn't care. 
When Bianca collapsed into his arms after a while of breaking the ice, Crouch carried her. He placed her body upon the bed. Silence filled the room. As he collapsed in front of it, Crouch closed his eyes quietly. Damn it! Realizing anew just how rotten the world could be. The Bianca of his memories was no more. Note, switch to present time. Instead, the current Bianca was there before him. The Bianca of that day, whom he could still make happy. That's why Crouch kept her beside him. He once owed her his life. Hence, Crouch did the things he couldn't do for her before. Just as she had wished in her last words to engage more fully as her betrothed, Crouch stayed with Bianca. And undoubtedly, the nature of his relationship with Bianca was different now. As she had said, Crouch thought they got along pretty well. At home, emotions were always deemed unnecessary. Bianca's voice quietly echoed. Compared to then, it was still young and naive. But when I'm by your side, Mr. Crouch, it's different. By Crouch's side, Bianca gradually changed. Being near him, she became curious about emotions and felt at peace. Where no one hated her, and where someone treated her warmly. That was what home was supposed to be. A place where she didn't fear tomorrow and could sleep in peace. For Bianca, that place was right by Crouch's side. When I'm by your side, Mr. Crouch, I find it painful that my face and heart don't move. She wanted to smile with him when he laughed. Cry with him when he was sad. Get angry with him when he was angry. But she couldn't do any of that. Her curse wouldn't allow her to feel emotions. With others, I thought it was better not to have any emotions. Emotions that brought nothing but pain were happy or gone. But in front of you, Mr. Crouch, I wish to feel. However, with just one person. In front of him, it was different. I want to get angry, cry, and laugh for you. And yet, she helplessly shook her head. But I don't want you to lose your emotions, Mr. Crouch. I don't want to see you become like me. If you don't laugh, then I don't want to, either. Contradictory thoughts. But Bianca could speak no other way. Therefore, holding on to Crush's hand, she slowly bowed her head. She knew all too well that her contradiction was an unsolvable problem. Don't worry. At that moment, startled by Crush's voice, Bianca's shoulder twitched. A curse doesn't backfire on those who aren't its target. Even if I take on your curse, my emotions won't disappear. I'm an expert when it comes to curses. You can trust me. After all, he would not be affected by a mere snow doll curse. He had withstood and even handled far worse curses. With Crouch's words, Bianca slowly raised her head. She felt an unbearable urge to burst with the emotions her expressionless face was concealing. Even if selfish, it was fine. For Crouch was the sort of person who would accept even that selfish part of her. So then. Mr. Crouch, please. This moment. At least for this moment. May her expressionless facade vanish. To thank him for saving her with a smile. To be angry at how hurt he got because of her. To cry for the trouble she caused. The snow doll. Assuredly it was a curse that negated emotions. But in fact, the curse of the snow doll was closer to suppressing them than erasing them. It was a curse that almost completely repressed one's ability to feel. That's why people thought Bianca was devoid of emotions. But in this moment her emotions were overflowing to a degree that even the snow doll couldn't suppress them. Please, bring back my emotions. With that, Bianca's words ceased. Having heard it all, Crouch lifted the hand that Bianca had held. You don't even need to ask. In front of Crush's eyes, Bianca came into view. The girl with snow-white hair, forever expressionless. Despite her young age, her exquisite looks made her impassive face all the more prominent. Those younger days came flooding back. Crush thought even he would think she was pretty if the girl would just smile. But in the end, he never saw Bianca smile. Only witnessed her meeting the end amidst deep sorrow. What if gaining emotions and experiencing them firsthand would let me know which is more painful? He remembered Bianca, who wanted to know the severity of suffering through emotions. 
but she was no longer here. Only. Now there was Bianca, who yearned for happiness through emotions. This was the future he had changed through his return. A future that Crush could offer her, now that she understood the contradictions of emotions. Crush's black hood revealed Bianca's dial. It was always my intention. To become Bianca's most important person. The final dial. Conditional target. Crush Ballheim. Click. The dial was already open. Crack, thud. And then, teardrops began streaking down Bianca's eyes. These weren't tears from something in her eyes but from sorrow welling up. The tears kept flowing unrestrainedly, like a broken faucet. Bianca's face slowly transitioned into a sobbing expression. Having lived her life without expression, it seemed awkward for her, but one thing became clear. Hick, sob, Mr. Crouch, I'm sorry. I'm sorry it's because of me. My apologies. What about your arm, what to do? For a distant future where she wouldn't have to cry. So that she could shed all the tears she might have during her lifetime, today. Cry all the tears you couldn't cry in your lifetime, right here. Bianca buried her face in Crouch's modest embrace. Quietly, Crouch cradled her head gently. That warmth was the most comfortable thing Bianca had ever felt. On that day, the girl cried her very first tears in this world. A cry that should have been ushered in under everyone's blessings. Resounded within the warmth of a single person. Thanks for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe for the next part.